Good. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Bokertov. Jendobre. Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. A guten or guten? A guten Morgen or guten Morgen? A guten Morgen. Um, my name is Francois Guenet. I'm teaching modern Jewish history at University College London, uh, and it is my pleasure to chair this first panel uh, uh, on the second day, or third day, actually, of the conference. We have a fantastic lineup. Uh, we will start uh, not with the first paper, because the first paper has called in sick. Maria Ferenc is unable to deliver her lecture, not only because she has been unable to come to Warsaw, but also because uh, in the place where she currently re resides, in the United States, it's three o'clock in the morning, and she also has fallen ill, as her whole family has. So we give her a break. Uh, and we will s therefore start uh, the session on writing the Polish Jewish self uh, with a presentation from Jaron Neil Freisager. Uh, Jaron has uh, completed a PhD on, uh, on Josef Zelkovich uh, with Amos Goldberg uh, at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He is a research fellow uh, at the Institute for Contemporary Jewry, and his uh, talk is entitled Josef Zelkovich and the Circle of Intellectuals in the Lodge Ghetto. And before, you st before I hand over uh, uh, to you, Jaron, I suggest that we take questions after each, after each presentation. So, Jaron, the floor is yours. Thank you, Francois. Um, writing a dissertation, a PhD dissertation, is kind of a journey in which I remember one special moment about four or five years ago, I came here to the Zich looking for uh, short stories. Joseph Zelkovich, who was a, a Polish Jewish writer from Lodz, wrote for the uh, daily newspaper in Yiddish. Uh, after some frustrating days uh, finding no story, I found the first one. And I remember that moment it was in the building next to us, in a very, very quiet room. And I was so happy finding this story, I think I yelled or screamed, great! And people were looking at me like I'm crazy or something like that. And I remember that moment. Since then, I've found about uh, 100 more stories, uh, short stories, articles, other things that Selkovich wrote, which enabled me to uh, complete my uh, dissertation and come here and speak to you. Uh, so I owe thanks to uh, De Gire that they didn't throw me away at that moment five years ago and uh, invite me to come to this important uh, conference. Joseph Selkovich and the Circle of Intellectual in the Lodge Ghetto. Okay. The research deals with the question whether the period when the Jews were enclosed in the Lodge Ghetto stands by itself, as opposed to previous life, and whether the Jewish literary creativity in the ghetto was merely a unique expression of the extreme circumstances. The time spent in the ghetto is usually considered as a period in itself, detached from the sequence of life, a sort of time capsule. I argue that the manner in which the ghetto inhabitants perceived the period was a direct continuity of the pre-war existence. In my research, I examined the processes of continuity and change in Zelkovich's writing from the pre-war period between the two world wars until the days of the ghetto. My research deals with Joseph Zelkovich and the group of intellectual in the Lodge ghetto. The question is, what happened to the perceptions of a Jewish intellectuals in the Lodge Ghetto? The question is, sorry, in the, in the Lodge Ghetto. What continued and what changed? The focus is not this or that event, but the process he went through. The assumption is that one cannot understand the extensive work of a gifted writer without understanding his work in the days before the war. 
I would like now to develop this argument. Joseph Zelkovich lived in Lodz, published short stories in the local Yiddish press, and was one of the founders of the Evo branch in the city. During the war, he worked for the Ghetto Archive, a semi-official archive established by the Jewish leadership. He continued to write extensively, including a diary of more than 700 pages, written throughout his life in the ghetto. He was co-author of the Chronicle of the Lodge Ghetto and the Encyclopedia of the Lodge Ghetto, a lexicon of basic ghetto concepts for the future reader. He also wrote reports on the many factories in the ghetto, short stories and more. Zelkovich was a prolific writer. When the ghetto was liquidated, he was sent to Auschwitz, where he was apparently murdered. The researchers of the Lodge Ghetto were attracted to the short stories Zelkovich wrote about the ghetto's apartments. The stories were perceived as evidence of a deep shock Zelkovich experienced from the harsh reality of life in the ghetto. In course of my research, I found some stories written by Zelkovich between the two world wars. It's what I told you about uh, great just uh, some years ago. These stories were not familiar to researchers. Among others, I found a collection of pre-war stories that also dealt with houses in the same geographic area, location, the Balut Quarter in Lodge. From the standpoint of living conditions, the city of Lodz was the worst among the large Polish cities, especially its poor parts. The Balut Quarter in Polish Bauti was overcrowded and the living conditions were harsh. In the 1930s, the place was still not electrified. There was no proper sewage system in the area. Many of the Jews of Lodz lived in the Balut Quarter and the image of deep Polish Jewish poverty stuck to it. The question I want to examine is how does the perception of Jewish living space in Lodz change from the pre-war years to the life in the ghetto? I will relate to some of the main parameters that are dominant in his stories. The house, death, and the power of space over the individual. Space is a place that affects human experience, social relationships, emotions, and thoughts. The space I will focus on is the Balut district, during the war, Balut became the ghetto. In West, the first parameter, the house. In Western culture, a house means more than a place to rest your head. The house highlights the relationships between place, space, and identity, and provokes strong feelings. An important aspect of the role of the house vis-a-vis -vis the outside environment. The house separates between the private and the public between the world outside and the world inside. Zelkovich's stories dealt with the relationships between the house and the environment. In Zelkovich's stories from the ghetto, the house was perceived as a place of neglect and radical malice. For example, filth, poverty, desolation, mold. People dwell in this gloom. A description of a tenant a face that shriveled, yellowed, and covered with green spots, repulsive. The semi-demolished houses were permanent, while the tenants were transitory, houses that have led generations of residents to their graves. The apartments do not belong to the tenants, but vice versa. The house is a platform for Zelkovich, a laboratory of sorts, a defined literary arena in which he recounts what happened to people when the reality around them collapsed? How does the space of Balut appear in the pre-war stories? One of the stories is about a sick grandmother living in a molded dark house with a small window the size of a prayer book, Tsena Orena. The smell of garbage is in the air, cats and mice everywhere. A garbage container conceals the small window and therefore the house is in permanent darkness. The grandmother is lying in bed and she is almost blind. The place is not suitable for humans. My argument is that the house as an arena for his writings was determined before the war and later was transferred to the ghetto. The house is a part of a terrible urban space called Balut. 
Zelkovich house was easily penetrable from the outside world and did not provide any protection. There was no separation between external surroundings and the person living in the house. This was Zelkovich's way of showing the deep crisis that the resident of Balut had, had encountered. The breaking of the principle, my house is my castle, conveyed a clear message regarding the situation of these people. The stories from the ghetto days indicate that the house was an enemy, the servant of the ghetto master. The second parameter, death. Balut was more than a place of distress. It was a death arena even before the war. One of the titles of Zelkovich's pre-war stories was Two Who Died, about two lovers who died together. In other stories, death was part of Balut's atmosphere. For example, a description of a night in which headless bodies hover over the houses of the neighborhood, or a story that opens in a series of deaths in one family. First the grandfather, who was a baker, died from hard work. Later on, the father, a Hebrew teacher, also died. Death is a central motif, which is present in stories, penetrates every home, and becomes an inseparable part of space. Zelkovich created an early equation between Balut and death. Balut was a murderous place. It is important to note that the ghetto stories were written before the deportations began, when mass mortality was caused by the harsh living conditions. Death wiped out another, uh, entire families. The story of the first apartment is a chronicle of death in one family. Zlata died, Favel died, Zenvil died, and Mendel passed away. Fega, her grave, was not yet covered. It is worth to notice, to notice that death appeared in Zelkovich's stories even before the war. Though we continue to deal with death during the war, there is a significant difference in Zelkovich's writings. The intensity of death in the ghetto is different. In the early stories before the war, it was the death of one family member. In the ghetto stories, the, the scope of death is wider. Before the war, death was the result of events in the story. While in the ghetto, death was the starting point. The house before the war was the corridor to death, the place where the inevitable decline was. In the ghetto, the house is a death arena. House and death created a dominant motif during the ghetto period, where the house became a grave. The consistent preoccupation with death in his stories demonstrates that it is a central component of Zelkovich's spatial perception a component that underwent a significant change while moving to the ghetto. The third parameter, the power of space, Balut, over the individual. An evidence of Balut's strength was depicted in Zelkovich's rare reflection before the war as appear in the following sentences. Taking into account the fact that those sentences were written before the war, one can only imagine what an emotional overload Zelkovich carried upon himself. Balut was the essence, something beyond the neighborhood, more than a group of houses. In the stories before the war, Zelkovich attributed to Balut unchanging character characteristics. A generation goes and generation comes, Balut remains Balut. In Yiddish, Balut bleibt Balut. It is more than a private case of one person or another. Zelkovich explained that when God gives poverty and residence in Balut neighborhood, one becomes unlucky. Balut determined the continuation of person's life. During the war, Balut and the ghetto interwined. From a ghetto story, the ghetto exists for those reasons. It exists so that poverty, hunger, and disease can reign in it unchallenged. The ghetto was a tool in the hands of the masters of the, of the world hunger, poverty, and disease. According to Zelkovich, the ghetto was an almost natural continuation of the pre-war Balut. For him, the ghetto was more than a place as terrible as it was. Just as Balut is perceived as a space with the power to shape or terminate life, so does the ghetto, but with more cruelty. There is a clear depersonalization of the characters in his attitude. No matter what they are or who they are, 
the neighborhood has always more power. The perception is that space, the Balut quarter, is not only space. Balut is power. It is interesting that there is no call for rebellion and there is no horizon of change in the stories before the war. These stories have no progress. There is no social mobility or a, or a possibility of escaping the distress that the space dictates. Like the previous parameter, death and the house, which continued to the ghetto stories from Balut, with no significant change, space remains static as well. One can observe it clearly in a story from the ghetto period that remained in the archive and was not published. The name of the story in Yiddish is Mequiem Gevorne Chaloimes, The Dreams That Came True. In the above mentioned story, there seems to be a key to understanding Balut's relationship with the ghetto. Balut still partially covers itself. While, the ghetto, while in the ghetto, naked reality comes without any mediation, and as every cruel animal is very frightening and disgusting. Both series of stories are related as in a bubble, almost completely detached from any external environment. In the pre-war Balut stories, in Balut stories, there is no reference to what was happening outside the neighborhood. The Polish neighbors, even events in the life of the Jewish community, a Jewish life outside Balut, none of these are mentioned in Zel by Zelkovich. This is highly unusual in relation to a city where the life of Jews, Poles, and Germans before the war were so interwined. In the stories of the ghetto, the bubble concept continues. And so there is almost no mention of the Poles living on the other side of the ghetto fence. Zelkovich builds a literary Jewish world. In the pre-war period, this involves some disregard of reality, since Balut was not detached from the city. However, during the war, the ghetto was indeed cut off from the city. In other words, now the stories imitate reality. Balut was a place that shaped the fate of those who lived in the neighborhood regardless of personal wishes. Life destined to be miserable. Zelkovich used the unique character of Balut to explain what the ghetto was. For him, the ghetto was more than a terrible place. Just as he described Balut as a place with power to shape or cut off life, so does the ghetto, but with much more cruelty. Zelkovich saw the ghetto as an essence by itself and perfected his attitude to Balut before the war. The two series of stories were the focus of my lecture. For the writer, the house was more than, a four, wall, more than four walls. Balut's pre-war stories and the ghetto stories focused on the question of whether one can manage to rise above the existential survival. In both stories, the Balut tenants degrade to a sub-existence level. The content of the ghetto stories was based on many patterns and motifs that Zelkovich already created before the war. So there was nothing new. The reality, the reality of the ghetto did not create new poetic frameworks, but mainly refined and radicalized the existing ones. Zelkovich continued to write short stories about Balut, with a permanent structure and the, sa the same way he wrote before the war. During his stay in the ghetto, Zelkovich continued to write to his reader, the reader of the non-existent Yiddish daily, to a no longer existent reader. Zelkovich wrote a lot in the ghetto, but in his writing, the stories of the apartments stood out. It was the first time in the ghetto and the last known in which he wrote a series of so many, 28, stories. The line of continuity that emerged make it possible to claim that Zelkovich relied on the Balut's pre-war stories, which were published for the first time as series of stories in a local magazine. The main contents, the relationship between space and man, the house, death, and the predetermined fate attest to continuity rather than a cessation. In a sense, Zelkovich saw the ghetto as a continuation of Balut's radicalization under the new conditions created by the Germans. Most of the existing research on the Lodge ghetto makes use of Zelkovich's stories from the ghetto period as direct testimony. In many studies, lengthy quotation of what he wrote 
have been published as direct and reliable testimony to life in the ghetto. A study examining his literary work before the war and its continuation during the ghetto period leads to a crucial question. Where to place his writings on the, continuation, on the continuum between literature and history and between imagination and testimony? The implications arising from this research are broad. The striking continuity between days, the days preceding the war and the days when the writer was enclosed in the ghetto is testimony to the way in which Jewish intellectual dealt with the trauma. Here we have a writer who chose to process what he saw through patterns he had formulated before the war. An examination of his earlier stories shed further light on his late, later writings. Researchers of the Lodge Ghetto claimed that Zelkovich was severely censored. This argument cannot be dismissed out of hand, but examining his writings before the war offers another possibility. The writer created a well-defined environment that did not exceed the boundaries of Balut. In my opinion, additional meanings arise from the lines of continuity and discontinuity in his writings uh, before and during the war, which await additional research. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Yaron, uh, for this close reading of, of uh, Josef Zelkovich. I found this uh, truly inspiring. Um, a few remarks, as we have established as a, as a uh, procedure for this conference from myself. Um, uh, one question is, uh, uh, because you really focus on Zelkovich, uh, if you uh, in the Q&A uh, would be able to expand on the literary context of Zelkovich. Um, the, I mean, in the interwar period, Yiddish authors like Israel Rabon, like uh, Dvor Vogel, uh, had a, uh, a strong inclination to be... To, I mean, dark motives pl play a quite quite important role uh, in in the interwar period in in Yiddish writing, uh, and and um, I would like to know how you would how we, you would place Zelkovich in in the broader context of Yiddish writing, and perhaps also Polish Jewish I mean Jewish writings of Polish of Jews in Poland writing in Polish, or in uh, in Hebrew. Um, uh, what I find interesting in this context is that he also wrote as a journalist, uh, and and obviously literary journalism or journalism verging on on literary uh, on belles lettres on literary writing is is also a very uh, interesting perspective for for this context. What your main argument is about the continuity from the. Uh, darkness of Zerkovich's writing uh, into the darkness of of the uh, this discussion of the ghetto. I find it extremely convincing, and it reminds me of uh, of uh, a book I've recently read by Anna Haikova about the ghetto about ghetto Theresienstadt, a major scholarly achievement to think about uh, Theresienstadt in a new way. Uh, namely to think about Theresienstadt not as uh, the exceptional space, as the space which, which is ex created ex nihilo, but as a space which continues Jewish existence in a new context, and, and that uh, the extreme relation, power relationships and hierarchies, stratification which existed in ghetto Theresienstadt is actually developing the potential of Jewish society, uh, of the Jewish community as it existed before the war. And I wonder whether you would like to uh, comment on, on that, that it's, it's uh, because the Zerkovich so much focuses on, on the Jewish encounter and does not take into account the non-Jewish encounter, uh, whether whether this reading Zelkovich uh, could function in a, in a in a similar way that he reflects on the Jewish community as such as a as a as a community with with stratifications with power relations etc. And whoever has been to Lodz knows that Baute 
always was a dark place. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's still a dark place. I mean, uh, it's not where Praga was or Praga is now, but it, it, it probably will become a bit like Praga, hipster, hipster uh, territory. Uh, final observation: um, uh, You mentioned crisis. I, I think I think it was uh, Glenn who yesterday said that uh, we shouldn't invoke crisis too too much because obviously the next crisis is never far away if you look at Eastern European Jewish uh, history and and. And um, uh, it is it loses its its heuristic power. We don't really can explain so much with uh, the idea of crisis because uh, situations were uh, difficult uh, for for a very long uh, for a very long period. But in in your perspective, in your very careful uh, and let's call it intimate reading of Zerkovich, what what comes what strikes me is that uh, the focus on the play on the place on the community as as a continuation of this parochial character of polish jewry i mean that it is my home which is really interesting to me and nothing else exists only in a very dark and skeptical reading uh, of zelkovic uh, and and i wonder what whether you would argue, would would agree that this is something which is a very strong and prominent feature. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I I agree. The Zel Zelkovich is part of an atmosphere in uh, in Poland in uh, Jewish Poland the uh, the times, and he imitates and uh, work over the same lines that uh, other literature or. Uh, he follows you, Lamed Peretz, that uh, goes to the small town and try to see what happened to the Yudia uh, Pashut, the the, uh, the small man in uh, in that uh, in that city. And Zelkovich does the same. He goes to Balut. He goes to other places around the lodge to see what what is going on with the Jewish community and with the simple people. Uh, Israel Rabon, that uh, wrote about the same time that Zelkovich wrote his book, uh, The Street, about Lodge, and his second uh, book, uh, Balut, uh, written about the same geographical areas and about the same uh, social problems. Uh, and you can see many similar uh, lines, uh, for example, the darkness that you were talking about, a, a real dark atmosphere in, in the stories. Uh, but also some uh, some differences. Uh, for example, uh, Rabon leaves a, a room for a change, an opportunity for the people to get out of the uh, bad situation they are in it, uh, at least for some time. Uh, in Zelkovich stories, there is no no uh, no room for change. The, the the person who was born in Balut, men or women is destined to poor life and to death in, in the stories. So he's more, uh, he, he, do, he doesn't leave any opportunity for change. And that's different uh, from, uh, from Rabon. Uh, also, he's very focused on the Jewish world, uh, on the Jewish community, and uh, almost uh, doesn't deal with the Polish uh, environment around. Uh, there are some uh, some stories that he does, but in most of his stories, he doesn't. Uh, and this is different from other Jewish writers that uh, uh, did deal with the, uh, with the Polish neighbor, with the German neighbors in, uh, in, in Lodz. Uh, writing literature to a newspaper is, uh, is uh, kind of a genre. Uh, I think that uh, if we could ask a Jewish mother 70, 80 years ago, uh, if, he, if she wants her son to be a writer, she would say no. But uh, if we ask to, if he can be a writer in a newspaper, she would say yes, because it's kind of a, a regular job that uh, gets salary. Uh, but still, uh, the writer is under pressure of the, of the manager of the newspaper who needs readers. Uh, and it's a very, very, very special uh, uh, genre of writing, uh, which Zelkovich was part of it. 
And in the ghetto, although the situation is different and there is no, uh, no manager of the newspaper, he continued to write about the same, uh, the same format he, he was used to before, before the war. Roche uh, Leuerbach wrote that, and I don't quote uh, exactly, that uh, for many writers, the, the war was uh, uh, their great time. The, and also Zelkovich, he wrote much more than he used to, used to write, uh, at least the writings we have. And we know that many of his writings were perished. But the ones we have, and you see how, how he wrote every day, how much he wrote every day, it's, it's very impressing. And some of his writings uh, are... Liter liter from the literature point of view, and it's my point of view, uh, much better than those he wrote uh, before the war. So something in the situation of the ghetto uh, ma made him even better and more correct than he was before the war. Uh, during the life uh, between the world wars, there, was, there were many crises. Uh, as far as I look at uh, Zelkovich's writing, he doesn't, see the, he doesn't see it as a series of crises, as kind of situation, a complicated situation. And many times before the war and in the ghetto, he's not interested in, um, in the physical crisis, you know, hunger, uh, uh, poor, uh, poor place to live, or, and so on, but on identity, on the uh, danger to the Jewish identity in Lodge in the 20s and the 30s, uh, not, not only him, uh, but uh, a, a big group of intellectuals that uh, deal with the way how to uh, make the Jewish identity stronger in, uh, against the challenges it faces. Thank you. Agnieszka Żukiewska, uh, thank you for your very moving interpretation of uh, Zelkowicz uh, stories. Um, I, could you tell us um, more about his uh, uh, ghetto activity uh, concerning uh, his work as a, a head uh, and editor of Ghetto Zeitung? It's very interesting, but People, and especially researchers, don't like to uh, deal with this topic. Thank you. Uh, Zelkovich was very active in the ghetto, not only in uh, writing. Uh, he managed uh, Yiddish courses for uh, teachers. Uh, he wrote reports. He uh, collected the materials from everywhere in, in the ghetto. He collected stories that uh, his friends wrote. Uh, he participated in a circle of uh, uh, poets and writers meeting at Miriam Mulinover, the poet in her apartment uh, uh, ghetto. Uh, but the ghetto Zeitung, Zeitung uh, was not something that Zelkovich was part of it. Uh, he, wasn't, he, he did many, many things, but he wasn't part of the, of the ghetto Zeitung. Uh, I don't know, I haven't read uh, nothing he wrote about the Ghetto Zeitung, but I guess that like his friends, it was kind of a red line that he didn't want to cross. The Ghetto Zeitung was, uh, uh, was a newspaper uh, ca coming out of the Jewish uh, uh, leadership of the ghetto, especially Romkowski, and was wasn't it was kind of newspaper that uh, delivered the messages that the uh, the Jewish community wanted to deliver, and Zelkovich and his friends didn't like uh, didn't like this kind of uh, writing. Thank you. I, I see a deep skeptical look from your side, but uh, maybe you can engage uh, after after the panel. I think we may have to move on. So thank you so much, Jaron, for a wonderful talk. 
Um, and we move to the next speaker, Lilia zessin -Jurek. Lilia zessin -Jurek did her PhD with the European University Institute in Florence, very distinguished institution, and uh, is now a research fellow at the Masaryk Institute of the Czech Academy of Sciences. Uh, she is the editor, co-editor, or editor uh, in 2020 of Siberiada i Żydów Polskich, uh, the Siberian exile of Polish Jews, and uh, now works on a project on Poland as a country of refuge in the short 20th century, uh, obviously a topic which has gained unexpected uh, urgency in, in recent weeks. Uh, her talk today I understand how there is a little shift in the focus. Uh, the title in the program is Three Times a Refugee, Exile as a Leading Motive in the Memoirs of Polish Jews, but I believe that Lilia will zoom in on 1939 and we look forward to her talk. The floor is yours. Um, and I'm coming originally from this dark place, which, <laughs> so there is really a connection between uh, the two of us here. Um, so, um, in thinking about uh, the talk I wanted to give at this conference, which is framed by ruptures and, and continuities, I began by considering exile, and it should be added refugeedom, uh, which is arguably an important element of that exile, as one of the leading motives in the written memoirs of Polish Jews. In the course of working uh, on this talk, another uh, related, in, in my view, much more important argument emerged and ultimately uh, dominated. And finally, it became the proposition on which uh, I will base today's presentation. And this is what you can see <coughs> in the title, in the subtitle of my presentation. So um, it's um, the role and uh, portrayal of the wartime exile of Polish Jews. And I would like to ask whether we are sure everything is correct there in what we are thinking about Polish uh, Jewish uh, fugitives. Um, but let's start from, uh, from the beginning. Just like many of you here, I assume, uh, I have listened to and read dozens of stories um, of uh, Jewish refugees and their families. Uh, some of them I have collected myself. Uh, here, one of my dear interlocutors, the, the baby boy on the pic in the picture, Salomon Polaniecki. He was born in Brzesko near Tarnów, uh, from uh, where he fled east with his family in 1939. He was deported to Siberia in 1940, uh, a refugee in Central Asia in 1946, until 1946, and then a repatriate to Poland, then a refugee in Belgium for some years, and finally in the United States, New York, where he's lived to this day. Uh, such multiple uh, cascading refugeedom is, not, is of no surprise to us, of course. It is the subject of, of countless post-war post memoirs and accounts. But this type of uh, a biography uh, was the fate of Polish Jews not only during and after World War II, but even before then, and we know this uh, too, exile and migration were a vital part of the fate of Polish Jews. Uh, here is a free-time refugee, Mayor Landau, and the reason for the title of my presentation today. As a teenager, he fled from uh, the Galician town of Mościska uh, to Vienna during World War I. Uh, then during the Second World War, as the father of a family, and here you can see him with George and, and Henry, his sons, he fled um, from Kraków to Lviv. Uh, with them, uh, and he was deported to Siberia, then again a refugee in Central Asia, Samarkand, Tehran, then India, Australia, and finally uh, a refugee in the USA. And again, this story of recurring refugeedom spanning several decades does not surprise us. So given how many refugee ego sources have been published, how many accounts exist out there, how important and how continuous motive refugeeism is uh, in Polish Jewish memoirs, um, the existence of a large body of literature on this mobility, I would like to ask the question uh, why it seems to be a common perception that in the face of war, Polish Jews failed to flee, behaved passively, didn't strike back in time, or even waited in the shtetls for their own death. 
Um, this is the quotation, of course. And the refugee dome is only now gaining the attention of researchers from neighboring areas of interest, mostly related to deportation to Siberia and the wartime survival uh, in the USSR. And here we have a really a growing literature. Markus Nesselrod, Eliana Adler, Atina Grossman, Katarina Friedla, myself. Up until now, the flight of Polish Jews has hardly been taken seriously as a survival strategy. This means, and I would like to stress this, that the role of refugeedom in saving the majority of Polish Jews who did manage to survive World War II remains not only underappreciated, but also underexplored from this kind of cognitive point of view. By contrast, um, in the history of modern refugee movements, German emigrants, and particularly those of Jewish origin who sought uh, refuge after Hitler's ascent to power, have emerged as one of the more extensively researched examples, perhaps even paradigmatic of the 20th century refugee experience. The efforts of those people who escaped in time are understood as the most logical um, survival strategy. Emigration and its attempts by considerable numbers of German and later also Austrian Jews merged even into a kind of lieu de memoir. The exodus, of, the exodus of several hundred thousand Polish Jews has not received similar treatment, nor um, is it celebrated by their host communities, which uh, would express their appreciation for the contribution of these uh, emigrants for their, to their social fabric. And the reason um, for this does not lie in some startlingly uh, greater anonymity of this refugee group. For amongst the Polish Jews, Jewish refugees, there were also many distinguished representatives of the world of politics, science and culture, uh, well known in Poland, some of them only, and also abroad. Starting from these two observations, one of the ubiquity of the refugee team in the testimonial literature of Polish Jews, and the second of the notable differences in public awareness of the refugee waves of German and Polish Jews, I would like to propose some explanation as to the reasons why lesser importance has been attached to the 1939 flight <coughs> of Polish Jews as a phenomenon deserving of consistent historical reflection and suggest where to find a way out of this situation, and I suggest this would be uh, going to the um, uh, autobiographical narrative sources. So looking for reasons, I arrived at hypothesis, and this is not a statement, it's just like thinking together with you maybe, uh, that I would like to share um, now with you that the post-factual logic known as hindsight bias is the main reason for trivializing the flight of Polish Jews because 90% of this group perished uh, in the Holocaust. So the percentage of German Jews who successfully fled from Nazi Germany is estimated at approximately 50%, and more who stayed behind in Germany survived without leaving the country than those who stayed on Polish land. So this post-factual knowledge, which cannot be escaped, has a strong influence on historical research, and it prevents us from seeing Polish Jews as active and positive agents of their own survival. The main prejudice I want to address in this context is built around um, the decision to flee or stay made by Polish Jews at the beginning of the war. So the decision to stay imposes a stereotype of passivity on Polish or maybe Eastern European Jews. They were supposed to wait passively for their own death until the last moment. This stereotype, like stereotypes normally are, is oblivious of the reasons why Polish Jews did not flee. The decision to flee, on the other hand, places another blame on the refugee survivors. The most resourceful one were to flee, leaving the weaker majority to the Nazi genocidal intentions in the German crematoria and gas chambers. And this is a quote from uh, Gustav Helling Grudziński. So the question remains, why do these two, and it is easy to establish contradictory accusations and ensuing stereotypes surrounding refugeedom or non refugeedom of Polish Jews, persist? And the answer may lie in them being part of the discriminatory discourse, which is a consequence of, on the one hand, the old-fashioned anti-Semitic sentiment and, and narratives, and that's the easy answer. But on the other uh, hand, it may be the consequence of the functionality of the narrative, which serves to displace various feelings of culpability. Um, 
so um, to sum up this, this part, and I would like to refer to the Polish-American um, author Eva Hoffman. Um, she titled her treatise on the Holocaust memory after such knowledge. In, in it, she offers reflections on the burden of knowledge about genocide. It is the inescapable knowledge, she writes, that seeps into the lives of successive generations born to the survivor families. Another impact of post-factor reasoning is visible in the interpretation of Polish Jews' massive refugee wave at the beginning of World War II, rendering it a subject that barely functions in historical consciousness, for it has succumbed to the deterministic conclusions since three out of 3.35 million Polish Jews died, it means the Jews did not flee or acted. This is the broader problem of popular and theological thinking uh, about the Holocaust, according to which the passive attitude of the Jewish minority condemned it in advance to a tragic end. The myth of Jewish passivity, which is uh, contained in this perspective, even though it has been challenged countless times by historians, and there is really a big literature on the topic, continues to demonstrate its persistence. Initially, the most classic case, this most classic case of victim blaming, served to mitigate the guilt of the perpetrators and excuse bystanders according to the formula, if the Jews hadn't done anything to save themselves, why would others have to risk their lives to help them? This type of simplification of a diverse reality, which in historiography is known as reductive fallacy, was not always ill-intentioned, especially when expressed by the representatives of the Jewish community. It also helped them to face the enormity of the Holocaust, an event famously described as escaping reason and representation. So making reductive judgments about the past uh, based on known outcomes certainly makes uh, the attempt to come to terms with the genocide easier. The testimonies given by refugees uh, clearly support the logical conclusion that the Polish um, uh, Jews around September 1939 were, to paraphrase Eva Hoffman's title, before such knowledge, far before before the knowledge of uh, crematoria and gas chambers. They had no knowledge or possibility to foresee the genocide, its scale, and unprecedented methods. The Nazis themselves didn't know it either, according to the leading findings of a decades-long uh, discussion among historians, the intentionalists with the functionalists, about the genesis of the Holocaust. And I quote, how then can the victims be blamed for not foreseeing their fate at a time when the murderers had not yet decided it? Unquote, and this is Yehuda Bauer, uh, who, and who posed this question half a century ago, and this question is still relevant uh, today. The popular assessment of the Jewish minority that failed to recognize the threat and allowed themselves to be passively led to the slaughter derives also from an important historical debate uh, on the Holocaust, which uh, since the 1960s has centered around the thesis of the learned adaptation of the Jews to discrimination. Adaptation as a collective trait was supposed to lull the Jewish community to sleep, to contribute to its passivity and ultimately to the magnitude of the Holocaust tragedy. These arguments, prominent in the works by free German-speaking refugees who had fled Nazism, therefore um, uh, scholars whose vigilance was not lulled to sleep, Raoul Hilberg, Hannah Arendt and Bruno Bettelheim, have passed into the classic of Holocaust reflection. The question of alleged passivity also preoccupied many Polish Jewish survivors. Some of them, in their desperate search for the meaning of the catastrophe, resorted to theological explanations interpreting the Jewish suffering as sanctifying the tragedy. Others, like Julius Margolin, a pre-war Zionist author, um, allowed themselves more bitter reflections. Margolin noted down in 1946 that already before the war, Polish Jews were doomed. And I uh, leave you with the quote on the slide. <clears throat> Margolin escaped thanks to his extraordinary, extraordinary determination, but he does not address the basic aspect of his refugeedom in this concluding uh, part of his uh, memoir, and these were closed borders. 
Deterministic, the deterministic perception of the situation is inevitable, a foregone conclusion, blaming the victims for being a part of what happened far beyond their will, we speak here about genocide, and not taking into account the practicalities of the time, like closed borders, may be part of an instinctive search for meaning in events that torment the conscious. Psychology, um, psychology is familiar with the concept of retroactive pessimism, resorting to determinism, even if it involves accusing the victims of passing, passive, uh, passive complicity uh, in their own tragedy. Um, because it yields some relief. It is easier to bear the thought that the Shoah had to happen than that it was the result of a chain of random dependencies. What is uh, striking when analyzing uh, Jewish testimonies is the number of factors that influence the decision-making process, including the material status, the status of Polish Jews, their political views, and in the stereotypical thinking, um, Polish Jews are narrated as a homogeneous and similarly inclined mass. So this tendency, known again in historiography as essentializing, typifies the subject of reflection in order to give one's conclusions a sense of greater certainty. And here we speak about the preconceived notion of Jews being allegedly predisposed to passivity. So um, to leave, Poland uh, presented a greater challenge for poorer Jews, but a greater dilemma for wealthier ones. As for the poor, um, until a better solution was found, the Jewish people of Poland naturally tried to live as normal and happy a life as possible. A film of American Jews from their travels in Europe, recently found at the bottom of a cupboard, I mean some years ago, contains a three-minute excerpt from the shtetl of Nashelsk. On a sunny day in 1938, uh, you can see the smiling faces of the local community. Today's viewers of this 180 seconds of the film would like to shout with emotion to the happy people captured on the film, run away. But for them, the future does not exist. They cannot foresee the Holocaust uh, and the war. And this is what the critics of the film uh, rightly point out. So the faces of the inhabitants of Nashelsk immortalized on the film uh, lead today's audiences to ask why they did not anticipate, why they were so unaware, why they just waited. In the meantime, the inhabitants of the shtetl were looking for a way out of Poland, not less, but more than well-to-do Jews. Historiography agrees that migration should be seen as one of the most important elements shaping Jewish history. The historian of Jewish migration, Gal Alroy, asserts that the search for a way to emigrate was an ever-present topic for the Jews of Eastern Europe, afflicted by poverty and pogroms. The idea had a long tradition, and as a process, it was, of course, intensified rather than impeded by the rise of fascist sentiment in the 1930s, including in Poland. The closer we go to September, the more often Jews were forced to leave the country, if only to study. The scale of this mobility, the attempts made, the role of the topic of immigration in the polarization of the positions of Jewish political groups uh, show a picture quite opposite uh, to the stereotype of the passive, <coughs> sedentary East European Jew. The migration team has come to play such a prominent role in the Jewish studies that, as Scott Uri notes, it has produced a persecution, escape, salvation paradigm, which makes it necessary to see Jewish history through the prism of ongoing conscious attempts at self-salvation, especially in the geographical context of Eastern Europe. So given the prominence of the issue of migration as salvation in the historiography of Eastern European Jewry, the popular vision of the alleged immobility of the Jews at the beginning of the war strikes me as an obvious dissonance and intrigues me as a serious scholarly quandary. Um, and I would like to quote now, <coughs> if I have the quotation here, maybe not. Um, yes, this one. Um, about 10% of Europe's largest Jewish community found refuge in Soviet territory, leaving the part of Poland that had been occupied by the Nazis. We are talking about the largest group of European Jews who survived the Holocaust. Because of its size, it is a group of particular importance for historical research. And this has been written in 1978. 
However, this, this group of particular importance and their, and their decision to flee as a strategic response to the German threat remained on the margins of historical research and was lost in the heated debates about the remaining reactions of European Jews to violence. These debates have resulted in various typologies with Raoul Hilberg's and pioneering proposal at the leading edge and then Evgeny Finkel's. His, um, I mean, Raoul Hilberg's proposal um, included resistance, mitigation of impact, evasion, paralysis, and compliance, but not flight or escape per se. According to this uh, important author, conscious refugeedom was not in line with general Jewish attitudes. Hilberg uh, held the opinion that Jews were conditioned to put up with their fate by a several centuries-long tradition of persecution of their community. And I quote, Jews have rarely run from a pogrom. They have lived through it. The Jewish tendency has not been to run from, but to survive with anti-Jewish regimes, unquote. Importantly, Polish Jews could uh, mostly flee to the East, to the USSR, in contrast to the dominant view in the English language literature, which sees the West as a refuge and shelter. Because of this Eastern destination, Polish Jewish refugees fell off the radar of the Western public and, uh, until recently, uh, also academic um, interest. Mm, some, so on the one hand, we have this Hilbergian and continued by other historians argument about the acquired tolerance of Jews to discrimination. On the other, the argument of the key role of the migration and mobility in the history of Jewish minority. And in my opinion, to solve this uh, clear historiographical contradiction and to understand what really happened in 1939, why some left and some didn't, it is enough to turn to the long neglected and not always trusted ego sources. They indicate that the behavior of Polish Jews at the beginning of World War II did not fundamentally contradict either of the two outlooks. Accounts and memoirs show clearly that most of these who could considered escape. The Jews did not, of course, lose their instinct to survive and to flee. The statistics on the victims of the Holocaust do not take into account escapes contemplated but impossible or undertaken but failed. Uh, and this, all these decisions were determined by ability, money, age, forces, family situation, gender, um, rather than preference. To do justice to the pre-war Jewish community, one should not stop at the observations that observation that Jews died because they were passive or because they learned to endure discrimination. Based on the wealth of uh, sources they produced, we are able to distinguish in more detail what stopped them from fleeing. And I won't have time to tell you now what these reasons were, but I will be happy to talk about it um, uh, later on. Um, but now I would like to st um, stress the importance of these sources, because if we turn to them, to autobiographical narratives, to the memoirs, we'll find out that just as today, when we think about the refugees from Near and Middle East or Africa, the, the, the escape as a strategy of survival and clear agency could be afforded especially by those less entangled in caring for vulnerable family members, that is by young and single male refugees. The elders express the agency too, but often via letting the young go. These refugee patterns have their own dynamics depending on the type of conflict people free from, and in fact they are recurring today. If we approach the past without uh, bigotry and prejudice, prejudice, if we turn to ego sources uh, instead of um, looking always at flat survival statistics rates, we will see not only the results of what happened, but we will finally understand the reasons as they are narrated by the main protagonists of this tragic story. We will also better understand today's migration challenges and give ourselves a chance for better policies as host societies. And just to give give you a glimpse on the value of memoir sources to the analysis of the refugeedom of Polish Jews, I will end um, with a quote from a memoir. 90% of Polish Jews died in that war, in a period of just six years. But my parents had all those things a person needed in order to escape and survive. Money, political connections, timely information, a willingness to abandon property, and children who were old enough to walk, crawl, run, climb, and not cry when, they told to, when told to stay quiet. My mother was one of nine siblings, and my father one of eight. Among all these, any who were the parents of young children perished together with their children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lydia, for an extremely uh, 
dense uh, and, and fascinating uh, presentation about uh, uh, reflecting about the, the tension between staying or going uh, um, and to engage with the question whether whether what the role of to take up the motto of the conference what the role of the continuity of rupture uh, was actually uh, uh, impacting on decision making in 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 this moment of of uh, this, the beginning of of world war 2 um, i mean there there is a broader context here of of let's say the the diasporic jewish encounter and uh, lech lecha is is obviously an encounter which is deeply ingrained in the jewish experience beyond beyond the various crises of eastern european uh, jews but i um, um, think that the your uh, turn to ego sources has an incredibly incredible potential to to break new ground and understand the very concrete reflections and very if you want able and and mature if reflections about what to do in in a in a moment of of massive challenge such as the beginning of the war and and obviously the current events teach us f uh, from close up how difficult these decisions are in the context of a military confrontation um, so these are my few words and uh, we have a question from Glenn please uh, would you come here to fetch the f microphone or perhaps we have a roaming microphone yes you have to work well, you were late Glenn so you have to work uh, thank you so much for such a well thought out presentation um, so uh, at the risk of you having already thought of this I just want to make sure we don't elide 1938 with 1939. I think there's a huge difference, that decision to emigrate, you know, 1938, where the pogroms have started to peter out, um, 1939, where you have actual war. So, you know, in your presentation, you suggested that these are, are similar, but I think they could be quite different contexts. I mean, they really are. Um, so just to be sure about that. Um, but my main question is, um, uh, I really appreciate the way you're thinking about demography. I remember Lemkin talks about how he went to his parents and they just didn't want to leave. You know, they're older, they're, they're more sedentary, I suppose, and, and most of the people who were leaving seemed to be younger, on the younger side, which makes a lot of sense. One thing you mentioned, though, that I would actually um, home in on a little bit is, is political orientations could determine also that will to emigrate, whether we're in the pre-war or wartime situation. But I also want to draw attention to culture because politics can be can be superficial. You know, um, if I think about the Hasidic Jews that I'm that I'm writing about now, you know, the, it doesn't matter that your material life could be better in America, or even that your physical danger is, um, is much greater by staying. The point is your Rebbe is here, and your spiritual life is, is, is so rich that um, to leave for a place like America, which they describe as a spiritual desert, you know, a place of great drought, that, that would be an agonizing decision that somebody would, would take only in the most extreme situations. Maybe the younger generation was starting to change. But I think there's that. There's also perhaps the more Polonized Jews would also be very reluctant to leave this culture despite you know, the, the rising uh, manifestations of anti-Semitism still to leave Poland, which you know, was, was really your, your identity through and through. Would also be, so I would just encourage, I don't know if you've, you've started to think this way, to go beyond the politics in these uh, considerations. I suggest you take another question right away. Um, if this is okay for each other. I could just stand here. Thank you so much, it was fascinating. Um, just along the lines of what you were speaking about, um, and you touched on it a little bit when you spoke about some of the theological implications, Growing up, one of the narratives that we heard so often, particularly in religious communities, is that there were many rabbis or leaders, Hasidic or otherwise, who specifically told their communities, don't leave, this is God's will, um, certainly don't go to Palestine, Zionism is, you know, out of the, is completely you know, not kosher in that sense. Um, I'm just curious how, 
how much of that is overblown? You know, I've, I've read little pieces of that here and there. Is that is is that was more made of that than it really actually was? How influential were those voices uh, in reality to the general population? Uh, I'd love to hear your comments about that. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, you touched upon. Uh, oh, sorry. One more question. Okay. <laughs> you, you touched upon very various aspects of, of, of this topic and of this research, starting from uh, the one with the sources. This is my fav favorite uh, thing to advocate uh, the use of the um, autobiographical narratives because uh, we can see precisely in the topics like this one how important they are and that they don't have to be always used with such a caution uh, and with such a fear of the imperfections inherent to remembering as if other types of sources which much, were much more perfect, right? We just uh, need to see uh, the, uh, the value of this type of sources and um, here I think uh, it was Alessandro Portelli uh, who was writing about the value of the oral history interviews and that uh, in this uh, type of topic we can via uh, autobiographical narratives, we can see uh, and understand not only what happened, but also so what people did or didn't do, uh, if they fled here or if they didn't, but also um, uh, why that happened, what the motivations were, what people uh, thought they were doing, and or maybe what they uh, want to tell us about what they thought they were doing. And these are very various layers of, um, and a lot of scope for exploration. And this is, uh, so we can uh, tap to um, motivations, unrealized intentions, um, and also kind of we can get really many clues about people's responses to violence, when we um, go and read these type of sources, as opposed to what I mentioned already, those flat statistics of, of, uh, um, of the rates of victims and uh, uh, the effects of this violence. Um, and I also wanted to, um, uh, to say that, um, and there is a lot of scholarly reflection about it already, sociological and, and other, about um, unintended consequences of planned actions. So um, what people thought they were doing does not mean that this is uh, in the end what, uh, what happened to them. And this is uh, Robert Merton, this is Anthony Giddens also, who is um, calling um, for distinguishing between um, the, um, the plan or uh, intended action and, and the actual consequences and, and effects. So, so about the sources, then there was um, um, a question to go beyond political, um, um, to, to look more in the, on the culture, codes of action, and of course this is extremely important and so um, uh, another very rich uh, um, area to explore and of course I do it in my research, I, I try to see what was the meaning of the socialization of these people, their upbringing, their education, if they went to Polish uh, public school or was it a Jewish school? Because if they went to the Polish public school, they were, and Kamil Kiek writes about it, imbued with those patriotic slogans and uh, we will not give even a button to a German when they invade us and we will fight and there is a dignity and there is all those pretty empty slogans in the end, but um, uh, so, so this, is, this, is, uh, this plays a role uh, there too, the patriotic education. Then we have a generational uh, um, uh, dependency, so those people who went through already World War I and or maybe they had previous experience with uh, migration, with refugees, they were more prone maybe to undertake another flight or maybe less. Uh, or those who uh, lived through World War I, maybe they would think that um, bigger uh, danger comes from the East, from the Bolsheviks, than from the West, because they remembered Austrian or German soldiers as pretty civilized and so on. Um, so, um, and, and there were also so many other factors, and I generally um, 
tried to divide them into those factors which were uh, more dependent um, on, uh, on, on, the, on the actors, like their personality or their um, uh, psychological condition, if they pulled themselves uh, together after the outbreak of the war or not, and how long it lasted. Um, because there is this uh, Walter Cannon's uh, um, um, canonical um, uh, kind of um, uh, um, phrase that there is a flight, freeze and fight as a response to a threat, psychological, biological response. And all these three uh, responses we can see in, uh, uh, in the Polish Jewish community, like in any other uh, community. And, uh, one, and I mentioned this because freeze, so kind of paralysis, was one part of, of those responses. Uh, and some uh, Polish Jews did not really have time even to really ponder on, uh, on what their options are because they were just expelled from their homes at the very beginning of the war, or there was a, a warfare effect on, I mean, there were, the houses were bombed on fire. They just became automatically refugees and they didn't even have to think if this is the, uh, an option for them. So this is an extremely complex situation. Uh, and I would like to uh, uh, emphasize this fact that there were, and we uh, can um, clearly establish uh, very concrete um, reasons why many uh, Polish Jews uh, decided to stay. Um, and sometimes deciding to stay was uh, a matter of an even bigger agency and we, I think, saw yesterday if someone was at the exhibition at the Jewish Historical Institute, Emanuel Ringelblum writes that he's, <clears throat> and I think Jan <laughs> showed me this quote, that uh, coming back to Poland was his duty although he was already <clears throat> abroad. The same for Julius Margolin, uh, or I think Mordechai Anielewicz, who also left uh, at the beginning of the war and then decided to come back to Warsaw because this was their, their agency. And we have a question from Samuel Caso. Hi, uh, thanks for a very uh, informative talk. Uh, there, there are so many contingencies here, as, as we all know. Uh, for example, uh, in 1940, uh, up to half of the Polish Jews who escaped to the Soviet zone wanted to go back to the German zone, uh, not knowing what was going to happen in 1942, knowing the humiliations of refugee life, hearing from across the border that it was possible to adapt to the German occupation. Uh, you had long lines in Lvov and Bialystok hoping to go back. Uh, Nikita Khrushchev mentions in his memoirs, Panamarenko mentions that the Soviet authorities were furious uh, that, that these Jews were rejecting the, 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 the pleasures, the wonders of Soviet rule to go back to, to uh, the Nazis. So again, the, the, this, the, there's this issue of what one knows at what particular time. Now, when it comes to 1941, uh, I think, as, as you mentioned, uh, but, but something that we really have to keep in mind, uh, the, most of the Jewish refugees who left for the Soviet zone stayed in the former Polish borders. Uh, the option of going into the interior of the Soviet Union uh, was rejected because of the terrible letters coming back about work conditions in uh, the Urals and the Donbass. So they stayed in the former Eastern Poland. Now, when the Germans invaded in 1941, it took them six days to get to Minsk. It took them four years in World War I. Uh, the uh, Wehrmacht was averaging 30 to 40 miles a day the first week of the war. So many who would have left, many who would have run, simply could not. They were cut off. We read memoir after memoir where, where, the, where uh, their escape routes were uh, blocked by, uh, by uh, the Panzer Division. So I, I think many, many more would have tried to escape. Uh, 
uh, had it been possible. Also, a, a, a suggestion, there, there are interesting sources, uh, there are interesting literary sources, like Peret Sopachinsky's uh, reportage about moods in a Warsaw built in a Warsaw courtyard in 1939 where people are discussing should we leave or should we not leave uh, the pros and the cons letters coming back from the Soviet zone those are those are sources that you might want to look at and uh you touched upon the topic which is the closest to my heart, so the, um, um, the trajectories of those uh, refugees um, after 1939. Um, and uh, you, you are very, very uh, right. It's uh, uh, this eastern direction of their, um, of their refugeedom um, is extremely important in, what it, in how it is, has been represented because on the one hand, yes, this refugeedom, the positive aspect of survival was overshadowed by the enormity of the Holocaust. But on the other hand, we have kind of, you know, understatement in the memoirs of those Polish Jews because they say it was not their agency. It was not their active um, attitude that uh, saved them. It was contingency. It was luck. It was chance. And we will hear today about it again. Uh, it, because this um, going to the East uh, was not um, this type of uh, logical uh, chain uh, of survival like uh, going to the West. It was much more linear. Uh, refugees went to the West and they were saved. In the East, they had to uh, face uh, deportation to Siberia. They had to face forced labor, starvation. Uh, they um, lost many family members. And they always say that finally they, they survived was contingent upon uh, upon luck or chance and because they understated their role in all this story uh, we also haven't heard about it for uh, such a long time and uh, very many of those uh, Polish Jewish refugees who were in the Soviet zone uh, in 1940 they uh, refused the Soviet passport and as, as a result they were deported uh, to Siberia and this was another like twist of fate which in a way uh, saved them um, and uh, I have to think here about Yusef Hen, work, uh, living still here in Warsaw, uh, who wrote about his sister who was standing in this line that you mentioned, in a line to register to come back to the German zone. Uh, and he writes, fortunately, she was uh, snatched by the NKVD and uh, sent away to Siberia where she, where she uh, survived. Um, so this is extremely huge and, and very important part of an explanation of why we uh, don't uh, really um, appreciate uh, this, um, um, this active attitude of those Polish refugees, because they themselves didn't. Thank you. We have one last question. I would like to ask about the Polish immigrants, Jewish immigrants that came to Palestine pre-war and also about those uh, Polish Jews who came to Poland after the war, left in 1957, like my parents. They left Poland, but Poland did not leave them. And what about 1968? Especially uh, if you can emphasize in the, the Im Polish immigrants pre-war that came to Palestine, and they brought the culture with them. You they had cafe. Polish cafe, you had newspapers in Polish, even in the 50s you have Pszeglond, Maui Pszeglond, I, I was raised like this, so can you uh, add something to this? Thank you so much. This is uh, the final and uh, another very important chapter of this refugee trajectory. Um, and uh, of course, there were problems with adaptation into uh, Palestinian climate or Israeli politics or whatever. Uh, and many Polish Jews tried to come back after the war to Poland. As we know, they were not very extremely welcome in Poland. And um, I would also like to maybe mention here in this uh, uh, context the changing labels of the 
that these people uh, acquired because when they uh, left Poland they could be called refugees, then they were deportees to Siberia, then when they were coming back they would be uh, in Poland, they would be called repatriates which gave them some kind of positive uh, um, uh, label and then uh, what happens, because I still talk to them, what happens to them in, after 1989, they are suddenly called um, um, uh, veterans because they came back with the army, with the communist army to Poland, combatants, then they were repressed persons, and uh, recently they are repressed persons. And in the end, I think that um, I, I got a call not long ago in, in March from one of those people, and she called me and said, Lydia, now I know who I am. Uh, I am a refugee, and this is because she saw um, pictures of Ukrainian people coming to Poland in the very same places where she was traversing uh, uh, with her parents <laughs> in 1939. Um, and I, I realize I haven't really answered your question, but this is, uh, um, this is really a topic for another conference and, and I would be happy to talk uh, about it uh, with you um, during the break. And I realize also I haven't answered um, another question about rabbis. Yes, uh, um, I, I read in the, in, I, I don't have statistics or anything, but I read in memoirs kind of uh, disappointment uh, and many people say the rabbis told us to stay and now they are being some of them are being evacuated while we have no chance uh, to to flee and I think uh, uh, we can see this type of uh, um, uh, this type of uh, opinion in um, uh, the book um, The Stepchild on the Vistula um, by Sam Saminovich, Sam something like that. So th th this strikes me as, as, as something that you mentioned uh, and definitely it was uh, uh, also the case. But also many rabbis decided to stay with their communities. This is, uh, this is also pretty clear. Uh, thank you so much for your questions and I, I'm looking forward to discussing this t topic further with you especially with Leah <laughs> during the break. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lydia. That was really wonderful. Uh, and we move to the last speaker of this panel, Ula uh, Madej Krupicki, uh, who uh, holds a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, uh, and is, current, is now assistant professor in the Department for Jewish Studies at McGill University in Montreal. Uh, she uh, pursues a project on mapping Jewish Poland, leisure travel and identity in the interwar period, uh, a, a topic which I think many of us would like to pursue. Very, very interesting. And we, and Ulla will take us on, on, on a journey. And I very much look forward to a talk which is entitled Polish Jewish Emigres and the Old Country. The floor is yours.
Thank you for being here, uh, and welcome to the next panel, which starts almost on time. Um, and the panel is entitled Reframing Antisemitism and the Holocaust, and it looks at antisemitism, antisemitic narrative, the grand narrative of Polish-Jewish relations, and the Holocaust as a rapture, as a point of rapture or not at all, actually, as some papers will probably show. Um, and uh, we have four papers, uh, which are very strongly interlinked, and also interlinked to what we were talking about in the previous panel. So I think you'll find it really interesting. Uh, my name is Katarzyna Persson, I'll be chairing this panel. Uh, and I think we'll listen to all four, because they are strongly linked, and then we'll have time for, for questions after, after we listen to all four uh, papers, because I think there'll be many questions joining all four of them. Okay, um, so the first paper, uh, entitled Antisemitism as a Cultural Code in Poland, will be uh, uh, presented by Anja Switzer, who's a sociologist, historian, and a translator, graduated of the Jagiellonian University in Kraków and University of London in the UK. And she's currently an instructor in Holocaust Studies and Slavic Culture at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me here and attending this session. And I have a little, not really a handout, if you could just pass on. It's more of a visual aid, because there is a longer quote that is not central to, to my argument, but it's just longer. And so I thought some of you might um, might want to have a, have a look. Okay, so um, I'll begin just by saying some pretty obvious things that anti-Semitism is an, is an important social, sociological uh, category for Jews and perhaps the most important such category uh, that we have in order to make sense of the world we, uh, they live in. Anti-Semitism can also be an important category for non-Jews as a <coughs> excuse me, principle and ideology for organizing uh, these structures of thought. It's therefore, a, it's a structure of making sense of life words and it offers some meanings and insights for Jews and not Jews, non-Jews alike. And to use Shulamit Volkov's obviously terms as proposed in the, in the title of my paper, antisemitism can also be understood as a cultural code that is the position towards Jews and matters of importance that are somehow Jewish, even if not in itself necessarily earth-shattering consequence indicates a certain political stand and an overall uh, cultural choice of uh, considerable significance. And so what I would like to propose today, and I'm going to, to, to argue, uh, including by just highlights of a few um, empirical examples, are, are four points. The first being that for antisemitism to become a cultural code in Poland, the anti-Jewish stance of, Catholic, of the Catholic Church and the equating of Polishness with uh, Catholicism was, a, was of a paramount, uh, paramount importance. Second point would be that the discursive strategies developed by the Catholic Church in this regard converge with and reinforce the, this, the, those goals of the former um, communist Polish authorities that had uh, an anti-Jewish uh, character. And the third point is that the anti-communist and democratic opposition in Poland missed largely the opportunity to thoroughly uh, delegitimize anti-Semitism because it valued its good relationship with the church more than it did human uh, uh, rights and or again equated uh, Polishness with Catholicism. And this point can be, you know, we can think about, uh, um, we can think of, uh, with this point also in, in different uh, contexts and, and think, for example, about history of um, abortion laws in Poland and um, other forms of oppression of, 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 of women. Um, now, the, the last point would be that together with the dominant paradigm of social life in Poland, that of Christian normativity and attendant peculiar to, to, to Poland Catholic hegemony, those various manifestations of anti-Semitism as a cultural code uh, contributed to some extent to the recent rise of 
Ill illiberal uh, populism in, in, in Poland. And so taking together those, those four points that I just sketched out aim to, to contribute to our understanding of the ways in which um, a liberal democracy can be undone uh, in Poland. Um, and so while individual, individual aspects of um, such so-called democratic backsliding may have their counterparts in other states, Poland stands out because of the comprehensive nature of this, uh, of this process. Um, but we can also, we can also venture into, into some sort of um, uh, comparative or um, um, broader studies. Um, um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to offer some necessarily limited insights into that relatively smooth trajectory of uh, democratic de decline in Poland by concentrating on antisemitism and using the context of, of Catholic di discourse and its acceptance in Polish society in the post-war were period as my as my point of uh, reference, and I'm also going to support my claims by presenting um, selected discursive and political practices examination, very very brief, with a view to elaborating on the continuation of antisemitism during the communist period and beyond, and all is done within um, a historical sociological framework. Um, so. Ambitiously, perhaps, I hope to shed some light on the manner in which such thinking could continue in, 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 into today's world and um, impact Polish society and beyond. Um, and so let's begin with the church, with that, with its transnational structure, media outputs, and, and, and m quite mighty human resources and other resources. It has been an active uh, participant in, in Polish public life throughout the 20th century and, and remains such today. Under the communist regime, um, its influence grew and the church attained exceptional state status because it was incomparable to any other institution with an uh, um, anti-communist platform, putative or real. And however, close examination of the Catholic discourse with regards to Jews demonstrates that the narrative strategies employed by the two institutions, Catholic Church on one hand and and the Communist Party states, on the other, were not that dissimilar and in many points, uh, at many points converged. And so this claim challenges also the popular conception of the vulnerability of the Catholic Church under communists and also questions the status of uh, Polish Catholicism as a defender of humanitarian values vis-a-vis -a, -vis a non-democratic uh, regime. Going back to history, we know, for, for example, from Night Without End uh, by Barbara Engelking, edited by Engelking and Grabowski, that the myth of heroic behavior by Poles under German occupation needs to be nuanced and, and perhaps dismantled. There is rigorous historical research that charts the patterns of what um, Natalia Lekshin terms intimate uh, violence. It unfolded in several Polish counties. And, um, and this research indicates that out of every three Jews who three Jews who were attempting to escape from the ghetto liquidations, two were murdered, most often, as Engel King and Grabowski say, by their Christian neighbors. And so what we now term ethnic cleansing of Jews during World War II continued after the war. And the largest single instance of killing motivated by prejudice was the 1946 Kielce pogrom, obviously. And here I would like to propose that while in the immediate post-war uh, period, the Catholic Church in Poland successfully competed with the communist authorities for social influence, in its position regarding anti-Semitic attack, the church inadvertently perhaps supplied discursive leg legitimization of, of ethnic violence and exclusionary and, uh, nationalism. The latter, in turn, being one of the key instruments employed by communists in their quest for the retention of political power. This claim can be, um, for example, uh, illustrated by a letter sent to Rome by the then head of the church in Poland, Cardinal August Land. And so on, 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 the, on the handout, I just included the names uh, in case you're not familiar with the uh, um, with the uh, um, heads of uh, of Catholic Church in Poland, and um, in response to the pressure from from the Vatican on the Polish uh, episcopate to issue 
an open and public disapproval of the Kielce pogrom, Hlond flatly refused to conform. And what he said, if the Roman Curia, for reasons unknown to us, end quote, wrote the cardinal, decided to further pursue, pursue this matter, he would request, quote, a convincing explanation as to why we should still revi revisit this event. And so in his refutation, Hlond presented own interpretation of the pogrom in Kielce, and so if you want to, to, to read, you know, it's a sample from a, from a full page um, a document in my own translation. Um, and, and we see similar linguistic practices, discursive practices that were also employed by the communist authorities. And Hlond explained that he had to carefully balance uh, his messaging around anti-Jewish violence between on the one hand, protecting as what he termed the authority of the church, which the communes were trying to abuse in order to conceal what had really happened in Kielce, and the attendant risk of, again, quote, offending the feelings of, uh, of the nation. And um, he perceived this, this effort to, to uh, he perceived this pressure as an, as an, as an effort to cause a rift between, uh, uh, between uh, Polish society and the Catholic uh, Church. And when, uh, when he felt compelled by the communists to condemn the, as he called it, the sad Kielce event, uh, uh, he felt he's pressured to implicate the Polish nation and uh, that was unjustly accused of, of racism. Um, this argument, this kind of this kind of arguments, uh, collated by the head of the Roman Catholic Church, show how an influential member of the symbolic elite leveraged his cultural and social capital to sustain the symbolic power of the church at the expense of a, cult of a cultural and religious minority. And so, in doing so, Hlant, whose whose perspective is emblematic of a of a wider phenomenon. He continued that, that, that cultural pattern or uh, cultural code of exclusionary practices. He, this, this pattern represented continuation, a bridge of pre-war Catholic um, uh, discursive practices that were thoroughly researched by Ronald Modras, by Damian Pauka, Dariusz Libionka, Grzegorz Krzywiec, among others. And it had received particular reinforcement from the ethno-nationalist movement prior to the Second World War, uh, which had sought to enforce an exclusionary understanding of the national community and, and position itself as the quintessential defenders of Catholicism in, in Poland. And such ideas radiated uh, to various strands of Polish Catholicism, for example, as Piotr Kosicki demonstrates in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, the movement of Christian demo the democracy embraced the ethnocentric notion of not only national belonging, but also of so-called human persons, a term which underscores the transcendent value of a, of a human. And so according to Kosicki, Catholic baptism and membership in the Polish ethnos were preconditions to personhood in Poland. And this idea is uh, favorably received by the majority of Polish Catholics uh, persisted in the, in the post-war period. And then we move to the successor of Hlant, uh, Stefan Wyszynski. He also appeared to be, to be wedded to the, to the idea of linking Polish national identity and Catholicism into one unbreakable um, unit at one point when he spoke to teachers in Częstochowa in Jasna Góra in, at 19, in 1957. Um, he said that the state particularly ought to protect the right of the family and of children to have a Christian upbringing, that is, not only acknowledge the right of Catholic parents to Christian upbringing through some sort of executive order, but also guard this right. And this is a state's duty. And so Wyszynski viewed Catholics as, as a rightfully deserving majority. Their religious needs fell into the realm of rights and the state quote, owed them, owed them uh, uh, support. Mm. And meanwhile, um, Meanwhile, when you know, when Wyszynski confirmed his endorsement of a nationalist Polish uh, ideal, uh, the Communist Party, seeking see, seeking to bolster its its standing, similarly employed nationalist ideologies and and programs that has been also thoroughly researched by, for example, Martin uh, Zaremba. 
Uh, the policy of the regime towards Polish Jewry was often ambiguous and, and inconsistent. However, the ethno-nationalizing uh, strategies of the communist regime eventually prevailed, uh, uh, culminating in, the, um, in March 1968. And in pogrom-like circumstances, the regime facilitated the oppression of thousands of Jewish or allegedly Jewish individuals and the plunder of the property under the guise of uh, uh, semi-legal um, protocols. During those events, the church largely remained a, a passive uh, bystander. Um, but the, uh, but the purported neutrality of the Catholic hierarchy during the events of 1968, in, in quote, really, which some scholars credit for the lessening of tensions in church-state relations, is actually questionable. Uh, I would like to propose a, perhaps a different interpretation, uh, that, the, that inertia or at times symbolically um, violent approach uh, of the church to, to, to Polish Jews came into sharp relief during the period of state-sponsored anti-Semitism in 1968. And so now the, the, the third name, I think, on, on that list, Władysław Bartoszewski, in 1963, in Tygodnik Powszechny, asked, published a call and he asked readers to submit memoirs and recollections of their wartime assistance to persecuted uh, Jews, and then he edited a book with Zofia Levin uh, um, with the same title as the original initiative, Ten Years of Chisne Moje, a quote from Swanimsky, English title, The Samaritans, uh, Heroes of the Holocaust. That publication was originally released in Poland in April 1967, and then re re reprinted in March uh, 1968 as at the pinnacle of, uh, of the anti-Semitic campaign, Tomasz Zhukowski called it a coerced congratulatory scroll. Bartoszewski's appeal effectively disciplined, holo disciplined Holocaust survivors, their rescuers, aid providers, and eyewitnesses by imposing on them a prescribed narrative which underwrites the, that dominant norm in Polish culture, and the structure of this narrative can be summarized as follows. A crisis erupted in which Jews played a central role. A caveat then follows in which Polish anti-Semitism is denied outright or otherwise contextualized so as to provide a justification of sorts. It, uh, Against the Jewish victims, we have a, um, the, the no, noble po Polish behavior is juxtaposed, and it often uh, includes Poles risking their lives. And this suggests symmetry of Jewish and Polish experience, and uh, it performs symbolic violence of the so-called um, Forecki and Zawadzka stem rule of golden mean. And Catholic and secular variants of this redemptive narrative converge at a point where Jews are posited as a problem. Jewish presence is harmful or polluting. And the narrative concludes with a need to solve the crisis in question and an appeal to change something. The change which invariably must occur within the Jews themselves. Um, and a development well known in, in European uh, history. Um, I'll move to the to the last person uh, that the, the last uh, the last figure from uh, from from that handout from the note. Um, the core of the 1968 uh, protesters, students, and intellectuals, for the most part, represented the secular. Uh, left and the initial hope was to reform the regime, um, but the brutality with the, which the government tackled the protest was shocking to many members of the Polish intelligentsia, especially the anti-Semitic nature of the campaign, and uh, Jews and, and non-Jews alike, and be believers or atheists. Um, however, uh, uh, the, the, the church, the church's muted reaction. Uh, to such state-sponsored anti-Semitism did not deter a prominent group of the former rebels, the so-called Komandoshi, to align with the church and to form an inclusive alliance against the communist regime. And uh, then the, the, the church's position, as we know, as the bedrock of Poland's democratic opposition grew, but there is this largely uncritical recognition of the, of the Roman Catholic Church as the country's highest moral um, uh, authority. Among those 
you know, among those man, many members of, of, of this group, I'm just singling out as a ex well-known example, is Adam Michnik, the former sc scapegoat of the 1968 um, uh, campaign. Although at times he is an outspoken critic of the Polish church and at odds with some of its causes, and he received uh, frequent scolding from, from prominent church leaders, he could continue to declare his commitment to Polish uh, uh, Catholicism pursues an agenda of compromise and uh, acknowledges Catholicism as a part of um, Catholicism. So there is this, you know, today the foundational flaw of the Polish anti-communist and democratic opposition, its tacit approval of anti-Semitism as cultural uh, code and um, and there is a missed opportunity to take an ethical uh, uh, stance uh, from all sides that I've described. This practice is continue in absentia, women, refugees and people who identify as LGBTQ can be substituted for Jews and, and treated with the same exclusionary practices. And that's within the, the broader context of Christian normativity that is known to anyone who has lived, worked in on, on North America and perhaps in Europe as well. In Poland, it's, it's you know amounts to cult Catholic cultural hegemony. Um, and 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 as a last point, there is a, a wonderful Twitter account. I'm not on Twitter, but I've just indicated this um, um, this account satirical uh, Jew who has it all. Uh, where a, a group of uh, a group of people uh, present an inverse view of reality. Um, and so you have a sample of, of, of the tweets and, you know, this is they uh, they attempt to, to, to chip away at uh, Christian uh, normativity. And so they would probably, as uh, the mother they is approaching in Poland, they would probably wish you Yom Hamader Samer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for timekeeping. Um, now, the second paper will be presented by uh, Jan Boslav, who is a William A. Ackman Fellow for Holocaust Studies at Harvard University and former fellow at Ecole Normale Supérieure and Princeton University. He's currently uh, completing his dissertation, which is, the first, which is to be the first transnational history of Jewish survival during the Holocaust. His most recent work is or will be published in the winter in the Holocaust and Genocide Studies a contemporary European history. And his paper today is entitled Surviving as a Social Process. It should be up any minute now. I hope that's better. Yep. Is it better? Yeah. Okay. Well, let me already thank the organizers, the host, for having us. Uh, personally, it's my first in-person conference after COVID, so it's a delight to be here and meet all of you. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I'd like to start my presentation with the audio testimony of Denise Sten. Uh, given to the Claims Conference in 1992. Denise Sten was born in 1923 into a well-off educated family. Her father headed the Jewish Merchants Association in Lviv, Lvov, but was hostile to both Zionism and Germany. He never spoke politics with his daughter. An only child, Sten grew up in a large Orthodox family in Lviv. Only two survived. In this multi-ethnic city in interwar Poland, she associated mainly with Jews, and went to Hebrew school, in addition to public school. She was on friendly terms with Ukrainians and Poles, but private contacts were limited. As many, she experienced anti-Semitism firsthand. Right-wing and Dacia students killed her father's uncle in 1935. The first bombings on the city in September 1939 destroyed their house, so the family tended to welcome the Soviets. Under Soviet rule, as the public school had been too selective, she graduated from a private school in June 1941, days from the Nazi invasion. When the news broke, she immediately fled eastwards, but was overrun by the Wehrmacht. Back in Lviv, she suffered through the bloody summer and fall of 1941, 
before moving into the ghetto in December 1941. A day-to-day -day struggle with the harsh realities of violence, loss, and hunger ensued. At first, she tried to stay within the ever-narrowing system of work permits and forced labor, in her case at Janowska, a camp that combined elements of labor, transit, and annihilation. She paid for hideouts in the ghetto during roundups and subsequent deportations from March 1942. A trigger moment for her to escape the second time were her father's deportation and the Große Aktion in August 1942, during which 40,000 Jews were killed in Bersetz. Sten did then what her father had refused to do in 1941, buy false papers. She and her mother successfully fled to Warsaw, blending into the crowd in late August 1942. She then, then worked in a Polish firm under false identity, and her boss suspected her being Jewish as he dropped hints about upcoming raids. But she was also blackmailed by a blue police officer until March 1944, when she transferred to a local branch in Krosno. She was liberated there in September 1944. Her life trajectory follows a path most Jews in Lviv took. The deadly summer 1941, the ghetto, coping with anti-Jewish measures, and efforts to escape that certainly pre-war wealth facilitated. But to what extent did pre-war experiences shape choices after 1941? What were bridges? What were divides? Timing and luck, of course, played a role. But above all, her testimony highlights a central aspect that I found over and over again, choices. For Sten, they occurred at what I suggest calling trigger moments, and you see those in uh, numbers. They occurred at these uh, trigger moments such as the invasion, her father's deportation, the March Aktion. Choices had to be made as limited and fleeting as they were. Sten's first escape was unsuccessful, yet does it not matter for understanding of Jewish responses? And that ties nicely to the previous panel. When combined, thousands of testimonies make the case for an ever-narrowing process of choices embedded in specific contexts. Why Denise Sten attempted to evade? twice in Lviv. This finding seems counterintuitive at first. Did integration not facilitate escape? The question of agency of Holocaust victims has come to occupy a central role, as we all know, but positing agency as either yes or no is misplaced and I would say morally problematic, as it obscures the Holocaust social processes and contingency. Any study depends on a specific time and place. Similarly, Neither luck nor specific skills and qualities, often you find those terms under the rubric of resilience, help better explain wartime experiences such as stance. I argue we must frame a new path between linearity, resilience, and randomness, Lawrence Langer's famous cho choiceless choices. The first step is to remove an artificial opposition between pre-war and wartime factors with all of you today. Two schools, I would argue, exist. The first is well known, choiceless choices, the role of Amidah, Jewish resistance, and leaderships. Thanks to foundational works over the last two or three decades, we know that victims' responses varied across time and space, but for various reasons, archival, methodological, uh, memory, we still know little about ordinary Jews, and especially Orthodox. This was reinforced yesterday. More recently, scholars have begun embedding the Holocaust within the interwar period, and I think that is a welcome development. Jeff Kerber, whose book you see on the left, has argued that Jews' wartime choices in Polish Grodno and Soviet Belarusian Vitebsk were shaped by precisely these political contexts, notably the educational system. In 2017, political scientist Evgeny Finkel, who's already been mentioned, elaborated a new typology on the Minsk, Krakow, and Bialystok ghettos. Finkel created four conceptual blocks, cooperation and collaboration, coping and compliance, evasion, and resistance. For Finkel, quote, the variation in Jewish behaviors was a direct outcome of one key variable, pre-Holocaust political regimes. Finkel has been rightly criticized for a too strict typology, for excluding contingency, gender, non-Jews, and German, and we have two reviews uh, here today. It is clear that Jewish responses over time cannot be reduced to one powerful cultural determinism, such as assimilation or social integration. So again, can we explain, can we try to explain why Denis then escaped that early, even unsuccessfully? 
Combining life stories of victims and survivors, the core argument I will probe with you today is that surviving can only be explained by pre-war experiences and wartime evolutions. This stems from my dissertation, which provides the uh, a systematic analysis of Jews' response to Nazi violence in eight cities across Nazi Europe, four in Western Europe, Marseille, Brussels, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, and four, and four in Eastern Europe, uh, Lviv, uh, Krakow, Vilna, and Kiev. Through 4,000 wartime diaries, memoirs, and view testimonies in 12 languages, I follow Jews step by step, not reading it backwards, but reading it onwards, the war. Death was not always the result of bad decisions, and conversely, survival was not always the result of good decisions, if one can speak even of a good decision. Human behaviors are complex, involve other people and emotions, and, yes, luck. Paying attention not only to the outcome, but the, but the process has often skewed our assessment of Jews' responses. Each persecuted person at some point faced the same dilemmas and questions of how to behave and respond to the persecution, even most fleetingly. One major problem is that Finkel simply recorded one dominant behavior on a certainly limited sample of testimonies. And by emphasizing pre-Holocaust political regimes, Finkel remains within the social science talk, someone could say. As Jewish responses depended on pre-war experiences, choices are not really choices. You are where you grew up. To make sense of behaviors such as Dini Stenz, I think we must include wartime dynamics. In other words, Jews' experiences during the war should concern both continuities and ruptures, and you see where I'm going here. I chose a representative sample of 626 testimonies from 15 archives and divided behaviors into numbered sequences that you can see on the screen, using Finkel's categories. Most written accounts and video testimonies adopt a chronological structure. Every time that a behavior new or of the same kind becomes visible, a new sequence begins. In most cases, a change in behavior occurred during trigger moments that we have already seen, a roundup, a threat, betrayal, etc. Sequences for each survivor depend on behaviors adopted, the vari variety of wartime experiences, post-war memory that we need to include, but also the duration of exposure to the persecution. On average, life trajectories contain some 10 sequences. Once I had assembled these 626 trajectories, I combined them with biograph biographical elements that we talked about before in the panel. Socioeconomic background, ethnic networks, age, gender, family relations, uh, decade of birth, deported yes or no, political experiences, pre-war schooling, languages spoken, and religious beliefs. And you can see that on the screen. That is a sample from uh, Lviv. The last step was to visualize our graphics according to these categories. Um, my revised typology is far from grasping all of Jews' choices and reactions in each city, um, and we have to combine uh, quantitative and a close reading. And life is messy and contradictory. That is why quantifiable categories are precisely that, one tool alongside social and cultural histories to write Jewish histories of the Holocaust. And the immediacy of wartime documents must be complemented with post-war testimonies, and that came across really powerful the last two days. The major advantage I see is to see changes in behaviors. The intents or intentions working against Nazi imposed lack of control, as fleeting as those efforts were, and a key experience of the Holocaust that I think has been overlooked. A universal shift of responses over time from initial compliance, staying put, to evasion over time, or back and forth between coping measures, coping and evasion including those who ultimately perished. The charges against quantitative methods have lost, have lost much of their persuasion, and I think it is time to bridge this gap as well. Not the least of my goals is to introduce an interdisciplinary dialogue about Jewish-centered histories of the Holocaust. In what remains of my presentation, I'd like to single out one specific aspect, social integration, which reveals continuities and ruptures. I will focus on one decision, escape after June uh, 22nd, 1941, and one group, because after all, I only have 20 minutes. The duration of Denis Sten, born between 1910 and 1930 in Lviv, an excellent case study indeed. In my overall dissertation, Lviv and Kiev share a pattern of behavior, a steady process, as you can see, from compliance to universal evasion with important differences in coping. In contrast, seen comparatively, Jewish responses in Krakow and Vilna shifted from compliance to universal coping with important variations in evading the Nazi persecution. What matters to explain choices in Lviv 
in June 1941, therefore, is a combination of three continuities. The interwar period, Soviet rule, 22 months, and the onset of pogrom and mass shootings after June uh, 30, 1941. What mattered were age, social networks, and religious beliefs. These factors mattered for the speed with which victims and survivors shifted from one behavior to another. Like Denise Stan, those with pre predominantly Jewish networks before the war tended to evade comparatively sooner, with, while those with mixed networks tended to stay put before trying to escape, hide or, hide or buy false papers, no matter the ultimate outcome, and that is, I think, important to stress. In other words, insular Jewish contexts in private schools favored evasion before 1942. According to Finkel, this group would have coped longer because of social cohesion. In fact, they evaded more initially, or at least tried to. And to make sense of this generation of Polish Jews be born between 1910 and 1930, we must go back to pre-war contexts. Excellent research, uh, including in Poland, has made clear that Sten's generation had hoped for assimilation at its best or civil tolerance at its worst. But over the 1930s, it seems to have, this generation seems to have lost faith in Polish society, even before 1935, as Kenneth Moss has um, uh, shown most recently. Sten's generation had deeply internalized the Polish cultural code, and this goes to what we just heard, but the public school system had alienated these youth from their parents' generation, but crucially offered no viable alternative. They were attached to Poland without being integrated, to speak with uh, Kamil Kijek. After September 1939, this could translate into a rather open mind, at least, to the Soviet regime. Certainly not celebrating Poland's collapse, the old view of Jewish support for the Soviets, which was in reality a zealous minority, this generation was hesitant at each step, and you can track this really carefully in the testimonies. Social advancement, fears, and hopes for a more equal treatment did not mean acceptance or even widespread sympathy. Rather, the 1930s had pushed all three ethnic groups, Jews, Poles, and Ukrainians, into respective echo chambers in Lviv. Exclusion and disillusions to key terms in Moss study, and anti-Semitism tended to strengthen Jewish identities, uh, also visible in the persistence of traditionalist education, and I referred to the panel yesterday, or the panels yesterday. After 39, Soviet nationalization and secularization encroached on them. Communal and at times family ties, in the case of Denis Sten, were severed over how to respond, particularly as prospects improved for, for some, such as teachers and civil servants. But the Soviet occupation also meant repression and deportation to the Soviet rear, some of Denise Stan's family. It is precisely during the invasion after June 22, 1941, an important trigger moment that we observe these continuities and ruptures. And you, ca you can't really tell from the quantitative analysis. Uh, they are pretty much the same. Soviet rule, even more in Kiev than in Lviv, had flattened behavioral uh, differences, and a concept that I call in my work the Stalinist curse, and we can go this, uh, I'd be happy to talk more about in the Q&A. In fact, it is only by reading, and here we can see the limits of a quantitative approach, it is only by a careful, close reading and comparing testimonies that three groups stand out during the invasion, those who decided to flee, those who had suffered from pre-war anti-Semitism before 39, all the more if they had suffered under Soviet rule, and those politically active, these this zealous minority of young activists who retreated with the Soviets. Denise then fits into two of these cases. With Lviv only 80 kilom kilometers from the border, her generation attempted most and was most able physically, of course, of all to evade after uh, June 22nd. All three factors decreased the likelihood to comply with both Soviet and Nazi orders and seek evasion. The vast majority stayed put. As these three groups had nothing to lose from the Soviets or everything to lose, as true Soviet believers, they had even less to gain from waiting for the Nazis. One word on those who had suffered from Soviet repression, because this is very visible in Lviv, as we already have heard uh, this morning. As Holocaust scholars have often not taken the full measure, I believe, of this most immediate Soviet legacy. Refugees from Western and Central Poland were the primary victims of Soviet policies. Um, but the revolution from abroad so aptly described by Jan Gross and others, was left incomplete in Lviv, so to speak, because of the limit, limited period of Soviet rule, 22 months. The Soviet regime deported approximately 315,000 from the post-39 territories, but it not, did not have the time to carry out brutal waves of terror modeled on those unleashed between 35 and 38 
in the old Soviet territories. As Kate Brown has shown, it was in the Great Terror's aftermath that the regime had secured a firm control of its eastern borderlands. In reverse, for Lviv, this meant that unlike in Kiev, uh, the regime did not emerge as the perceived bulwark, often harsh, but still against anti-Jewish violence. In hindsight, remarks of Ava Janina Oberrotman to circumvent the Soviet repression, quote, served as well under the Germans. Nonetheless, most were overrun by the Germans, as we already heard this morning. When the Nazis crossed into the Soviet zone, they caught up to 1.3 to 1.4 million Polish Jews. Here, the graphics help us see that Orthodox and religious Jews, who often spoke Yiddish, tended to evade much earlier than non-Yiddish speakers, those with predominantly mixed networks, who adopted a wait-and-see behavior, a freeze for various perceptions and reasons that I cannot go into now. Uh, the latter tended to evade during a second phase, the first phase in June 41, uh, and the second phase com uh, commencing in uh, March, after March 1942. And uh, here you can see a collection of fortunate video archives, uh, all the mentions of timing in uh, different behaviors that I, I mapped. Assimilation played a role in this second phase, and this is what scholars have mostly analyzed, to blend in the crowd, false papers, good looks, quote-unquote, fluency in Polish, and financial resources to pay for hiding, or in Stan's case, to being blackmailed. It was during this phase that assimilated Jews coped less and less, and consequently evaded more and more, as we see on a map created from the Shoah Foundation archives, where they went into hiding. What we see here is a learning process. Stent's experience illustrates the ever-evolving shift towards evo evo evasion for Jews with critical moments of arrest and betrayal after 1942. The continuities and ruptures in Polish Jewish history appear clearly. In the absence of one massive traumatic tipping point, such as Babi Yar in Kiev, uh, having mixed networks and being immersed in Polish society, that is not have en having entirely renounced the hopes and attachments from before 39 could and often delay the decision to evade, not just briefly, but consistently. This fits with Jews' shifting perceptions of ethnic Poles and Ukrainians after 42, that I also include. Uh, these increasingly bitter disillusions highlighted as well by Javi Dreyfus. Surviving here was a process of reckoning with pre-war illusions and the upheavals of Soviet rule. Surviving Nazi violence was a process for everybody. But those who reckoned that bridges with the past were burned evaded earlier. To study Jews' response means understanding this process. What stands out is the more recent one's references, mental references were Soviet rule in 1940, anti-Semitic violence after 1935, rather than traditional violence. Um, let me go to the conclusion. Um, in conclusion, there's a case to be made about how ordinary Jews targeted by Soviet policies and Nazi persecution behaved. Much as Stalinist rule had tended to erase differences among communities before 41, the Nazi persecution produced the same equalizing effects over time. Um, what Finkel and Kerber saw were important snapshots of a large picture. In Lviv and Kiev, an old Soviet territory, privately schooled individuals were faster to evade during the first phase. But after 42, Jews educated in public schools also shifted massively towards evasion, even most fleetingly. Uh, and we historians can best contextualize this. And in a world of massive human destruction, uh, I think it is hopeful that cultural factors and prior political systems, as Finkel maintained, do not ultimately determine how we respond over time. Biographical details shape behaviors during the initial stages, but surviving the Holocaust was, above all, a learning process, no matter the ultimate outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and our third speaker is Alicia Podbielska, who received her PhD in 2021 from the Strassler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Clark University. Um, and her doctoral dissertation dealt with um, Polish Holocaust rescuers who were officially designated national heroes. She also holds an MA in Literary Studies from Adam Mickiewicz University in Poland and received grants and fellowships from numerous important institutions among them the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute, Yad Vashem, Claims Conference, and many others. Um, her research interests include Polish-Jewish relations, collective memory, public history, and Holocaust literature, and she's currently a Jeffrey H. Artman postdoctoral fellow at Fort Novo Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies at Yale University.
and her presentation will be entitled uh, Our Feelings Toward Jews Have Not Changed, Polish Underground Press on Help and Rescue. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. In summer of 1942, after the liquidation of the Minsk Mazowiecki ghetto, Yiddish writer Leib Rochman found a hiding place with Polish peasants in a nearby village. His illiterate hosts would sometimes ask him to read aloud from a Polish underground newspaper. He described it in his memoir as follows. Something about the Jews is included too, but before reading those passages, I skim them silently. First, I have to edit the material, deleting whole passages and inventing others, sometimes reading the very opposite of what is written. For example, passages that praise Poles who save Jews and say that they will be rewarded after the war. Uh, indeed, the Polish underground press, while almost without exception anti-German, was not universally sympathetic to Jews and by no means it all called for active assistance to them. The newspaper's political orientation, um, particularly their position on the so-called Jewish question in Poland, determined their perspective on rescue more than the ongoing mass murder. It took mass deportations from the Warsaw Ghetto in the summer of 1942 to elicit first explicit appeals for assistance. The first to raise that call were the communists. It is Paul's duty, declared the Polish Workers' Party Mouthpiece Tribuna Wolności, to assist the persecuted Jews. Communists supported both the ideological argument of uh, solidarity with the Jewish masses against the German fascists, and the pragmatic um, argument that after killing the Jews, the Germans would turn to murder of Poles. And therefore, um, the editors argued, as, as assistance constituted active self-defense. The Communist Press praised Poles, Polish workers' political awareness, which allegedly manifested itself in their aid to Jews, and blamed the reactionary forces for creating an atmosphere of hostility which discourages from fleeing the ghetto um, to the Aryan side. Because of that, indicted Tribuna, the pogrom of the Warsaw Ghetto, and they refer here to the um, mass deportations, constitutes a moral failure of the Polish nation. That's why we must now provide Jews with material and moral support. We need to help them escape the ghetto and give shelter to fugitives. But such explicit appeals for assistance were in fact extremely rare. The Polish underground uh, state institutions um, and its official publications, uh, best informed and boasting the widest circulation, um, made no such appeals at the time despite the dramatic pleas to do so from Jewish activists. They were conscious of widespread anti-Semitism against Poles and uh, constantly attacked by their opponents on the right as being pro-Jewish. And so they were at pains not to appear uh, to favor so-called Jewish interests too much. And really only the uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto changed that. In May 1943, the government delegate for Poland, Jan Stanisław Jankowski, um, declared, I quote, Polish society acts correctly, taking pity on the hunted and persecuted Jews and helping them. Everyone should continue to provide this assistance, end quote. So now those calling for help to Jews were at least able to adduce the government's authority and present assistance as a patriotic obligation. And for example, a socialist newspaper emphasized, this is a government declaration binding for every poll. Whoever defies these instructions collaborates with the aggressor. And Bulletin Informacyjny, the most important um, Polish underground newspaper, its, its official voice wrote, quote, 
aid to every individual who managed to escape death and is hiding from German tormentors is a duty, human, Christian, and Polish. The ghetto uprising made a deep impression on the Polish public, which generally ascribed to anti-Jewish cliches about um, Jewish passivity and cowardice, in contrast to Polish bravery, of course. And only through the armed struggle, Jews earned the privilege of assistance from Poles. Um, the Delegatura newspaper declared, quote, taking up arms, they fulfilled the noble obligation of Polish citizens. Therefore, wherever possible, they deserve our help and support. The Home Army News Agency even stated, although somehow reluctantly, that uh, the German pacification of the ghetto targeted, quote, after all, citizens of Polish state, and as such, quote, harms Poland uh, raison d'etat. For that reason, the Jewish militants, quote, have to be considered as fighting against the common enemy and, by the same token, deserving of help from Polish society when this help proves possible and purposeful. Yet generally, references to Jews as Polish citizens were few and far between. Much more common rationale for help was the threat of moral implication of Poles in Nazi crimes. A major socialist newspaper wrote, quote, the Germans want to make us complicit. Everyone who, following their orders, closes the door on Jews and doesn't help them, uh, helps Germans. We all, we all help to the persecuted, not the persecutors, to Jews, not Germans. Yet even among those who, like socialists, consider Jews equal citizens of Poland, this narrative of Jews as separate from Poles prevailed. Uh, one socialist newspaper actually encouraged help by highlighting hospitality as a fundamental trait of Polish culture. And I quote, we must remember that people in hiding are our guests who took shelter in our home and put themselves at our mercy. There is no case in the annals of Polish history when we failed to treat nobly someone seeking refuge in our homeland. Our conscience demands that we protect the persecuted who took shelter under our protective wing. And so this compassionate attitude notwithstanding uh, Jews were to be protected as outsiders rather than integral community members. And the help was considered primarily a question of Polish honor. Equally often, assistance was framed as a religious obligation. Um, Bulletin Informacyjny declared in April 1943, quote, help for Jews fleeing the burning ghetto is a Christian duty for us. Across the political spectrum, underground press generally presented an exaggerated and idealized image of Polish assistance. In October 1942, uh, Delegatura newspaper Rzeczpospolita Polska contrasted the alleged indifference of Western societies uh, with the compassionate response from the Poles. I quote, in Polish society, its assistance to Jews was so spontaneous and efficient that the German authorities decided to publish an announcement threatening anyone who helped or sheltered a Jew with the death penalty. Though many Poles disliked the Jews, the article continued, they all condemned crimes against them. And that was, quote, a great proof of the fundamental integrity of the Polish nature permitted by Christian ethic. Such statements, um, even if exaggerated or idealizing Polish attitudes, at least presented help as a socially desired behavior. Um, the nationalist right, Prawica Narodowa, on the other hand, criticized rescue on principle. Uh, the national party, Stronnictwo Narodowe, uh, opposed the creation of the Council uh, for Aid to Jews, Żegota, effectively delaying its um, 
its activity and, and refused to participate. It criticized the government call for help uh, for the Jews from May 1943 as reckless and harmful. Because no matter how diminished in number, the surviving Jews still threatened Poland's interests. And so in July 1943, um, the National Party official newspaper advocated following the example of Nazi Germany. Quote, in terms of percentage, we now have more or less as many Jews as pre-war Germany. Yet, we consider the Jewish questions, question to be almost solved. Whereas in Germany, they did not treat this issue so lightheartedly. After the war, Jews in our country undoubtedly will try to bounce back from their population and material losses, and with a vengeance. And so the ultranationalists opposed help as naive and politically imprudent, because even in the middle of their annihilation, Jews remained a threat to Poland and Poles. Um, and here's a quote from a National Radical Camp newspaper, um, which reminded, reminded its readers in January 1943, quote, we have to remember that the Jewish menace still endangers us, that it has not weakened. On the contrary, it has grown stronger, and every hidden Jew in our land is more dangerous than a hundred of his correligionists before the war. Uh, and so far-right publications praised the lack of help from the Polish population, referring to the communist attempt to incite the general uprising in support of the fighting ghetto, um, one author declared with great satisfaction. This deceitful plan failed because the sentiments of the Polish population exhibited a complete indifference toward the liquidation of the Jews and did not evince any inclination to help them. A National Radical Camp newspaper caricatured Zagota's activity as financing a luxurious existence for the Jewish privileged class, while denying support to Polish families in need. Quote, it is notorious that dozens of Jews are being supported with state funds. The stipends they receive amount to pre-war pre ministerial salaries and swallow tens and hundreds of thousands of zloty. Jews hiding in the forests were represent, represented as aggressors, launching attacks on the defenseless Polish population. Quote, Thousands of Maccabees sit in the woods and, together with Soviet saboteurs and bandits, rob and murder the Polish population, distinguishing themselves with particular cruelty. The far right actively discouraged help uh, by representing Jews as disloyal to their helpers. Newspapers publicize cautionary tales about Jews willingly exposing Poles uh, to German revenge. Quote, How many Poles are hiding Jews? How terribly they endanger themselves, heedless of the fact that the Jew they are hiding will denounce them without any scruple, sounded the alarm Placówka, um, newspaper of, of the National Radical Camp. And finally, helpers endangered not just themselves, but more importantly, the project of Poland without Jews. The National Armed Forces newspaper declared, because every true Pole knows that in the resurrected Poland, there will be no room either for a German or a Jew, those who hide Jews will be branded as traitors to the Polish cause. Um, so, to summarize, newspapers across the political spectrum claim that Poles offer generous aid, despite near impossibility of doing so. Yet, no specific or very little instructions regarding Jews on the Aryan side, either in hiding or passing, were supplied. And this is important because the underground press constituted the sole enclave of civic freedom, for the occupied population. It both shaped and reflected public opinion. And um, the newspapers aimed to influence attitudes and often promoted very specific behaviors by publishing stern warnings, clear instructions on how to comport oneself. But it, when it came to the Holocaust and the plight of Jews, um, the latter were hardly even offered. 
if exorations against blackmail and um, schmaltzovniks, participation in anti-Jewish crimes appeared periodically, explicit encouragement to help remained extremely rare. Um, discussions of rescue uh, foregrounded concerns about the moral condition and reputation of ethnically defined Poles and backgrounded worries about um, the Jews' fate. Um, an idealized image of assistance served to assert Polish superiority over an indifferent world and sometimes even the passive Jews, uh, often also accused of ingratitude and disloyalty toward their rescuers. Uh, finally, a dominant notion of aid as Christian charity and humanitarian duty rather than solidarity among citizens of the same state um, emerged as a primary, um, uh, primary motivation for help. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank that? you very much. Perfect, perfect. Okay. Like beyond perfect. I wanted to add. A couple oh, of, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. There's one more sentence. <laughs> this actually was perfect on time. <laughs> I'm sorry, but just to conclude, <laughs> I want to I want to point out to very briefly to three continuities um, that emerge from looking at the way Polish underground press wrote about help. Um, in, theme of, in, um, in relation to the theme of our conference. So first, quite obviously, the continuation between the pre-war uh, ideological orientations and um, the attitudes toward Jews during the war. Uh, the Holocaust does not change that much in this respect, really. Uh, second, the way in which we can trace the entire post-war uh, discourse on help um, to this wartime um, discussions. And if you're familiar at all with the contemporary politics of history regarding rescue in Poland, um, you will for sure uh, recognize those, those motives. And finally, um, I just want to briefly point out to, I think, striking similarities between the way the nationalist right um, addressed help as, as um, naive at best or treasonous at worst, to, um, to the dis anti refugee discourse um, that appeared very strongly in Poland in relation to the uh, situation on the Polish Belarusian border and um, was to find in, in both the right media and right wing media and the official government's um, proclamations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Of course, not a funny topic, but yes. Um, okay, and uh, now our final speaker today, uh, I mean in this in this panel, um, is Dr. Lab Ganor, who is uh, the founder and director of the Mashmout Center and the Spiegel Fellow, Senior Scholar and Coordinator of Poland Forum in the Finkler Institute of Holocaust Research at bar -Ilan University in Israel. She holds a PhD from bar -Ilan University and her doctoral dissertation dealt with uh, Israeli Defense Forces and the Holocaust. Her postdoctoral research with uh, the topic of this presentation, so uh, documentation of stories of Holocaust survivors, air crew members of Israeli Air Force. She's also very involved in education and building Polish-Israeli dialogue. And the presentation today will be entitled um, Life Stories of Holocaust Survivors with Polish and European Roots Who Served as Air Crew Members in the Israeli Air Force. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer of this amazing conference. Thank you. For me, it's like to come home. Poland is for me really dear for me. Um, my presentation or my research, as has been said, is based on my postdoctoral work, and I called it like a phoenix from the ashes. Life stories of Holocaust survivors with Polish and European roots who served in the as uh, who served as air crew members in the Israeli Air Force. I would like to start with a quote of one of my interviewees. If I manage to go from a yellow star on my chest to a blue star of David on my wings, then what more does a person need? It's a very strong quote, 
a quote, and uh, some fa historical fact, facts. In the mid-50s, the approximately 300 aircrew members served at key points of decision-making within the Israeli Air Force, IAF, included 136 Holocaust survivors. In addition of the, in addition, um, of the 285 air crew members who took part in the 1956 Sinai War. 96, 33% were Holocaust survivors. During their service in the IAF, most of them remained, remained silent about their experiences during the Holocaust, out of a desire to be like their Israeli-born colleagues. Even at the price of hiding their own personal experiences. For example, I kept my personal story close to my chest, like cards. I did not share it with anyone. It's known that I am not the only one who kept quiet. This entire amazing group kept quiet, some more than others. Everyone felt foreign, to the Israeli way of life, and everyone made a great effort to forget the, the past, to be like their friends, and to blend into Israeliness. Some succeeded and some failed. Uh, this was a very strong quote from a book that wrote Shaya Harsit. Immediately after the Holocaust, while most of the survivors were waiting at displaced person, persons' camps for a resolution of their status, the Zionist movement's leadership, together with the survivors' leadership, made an anxious choice of addressing the Shoah as a collective catastrophe, where overrided individual clemency. This view led newborn state to adopt the narrative and the conceptualization of the Holocaust, disregarding individuals' suffering and emphasizing elements of national heroism, active resistance to collective danger, and the exclusive role of the nascent Jewish state uh, in the assuring a, a secure life for the Jewish collective. The change in the attitude to individual Holocaust memory began with the Eichmann trial in 1961 and was a long process until the collective memory of the Holocaust changed from active heroism uprising to passive heroism and a bravery of mothers and children. In the late 70s, the individual memories and narrative trickled into public consciousness through literature, film, and media. Around the same period, a parallel process occurred concerning national attitudes toward war trauma. The earliest public acknowledgement of combat stress reaction and war trauma emerged in Israel only after the 1973 Yom Kippur War, shortly before the the, com the, uh, the general community uh, in the West acknowledged post-trauma stress disorder. Some of my interviewees, some of this special group of air crew members in Israel, uh, Israeli Air Force, were Holocaust survivors, started in their late uh, 70s and 80s to share memories of their personal experiences during the following the for during the Holocaust and aftermath. I had the privilege to interview 35 members of this group, air crew members, all of whom were born between 19, 1927 until 1942 and experienced the horrors of the Holocaust as children. After the war, these individuals faced many challenges. I call it the war after the war including difficulties being absorbed into society in the new country. All of them volunteered for the Air Force and served during the 50s and the 60s. So, during the 50s and the 60s in the state of Israel, it was really the early decade. And um, the model of uh, Zionism or officers or really pilot were Sabra, Sabra, the term is Sabra for natives who were born in Israel. This image was reinforced after 96 war 
uh, I mentioned it. Uh, this was the first war in which jet planes participated and the Air Force played a crucial role in the war. Against the background of shortage of manpower in the late 50s, Ezer Weizmann, who was the Air Force commander at that time and later president of the State of Israel, coined the phrase, the best go to the skies. Uh, this was a term that sometimes uh, there was a big argument about it because it's like to produce an elite group. But this helped uh, to bring more volunteers to uh, the Air Force. So many members of this group, which is a part of the legacy of IAF and the State of Israel, link their decision to be pilots to their experiences in the Holocaust. One example, Arye Oz. Uh, Arya Oz, uh, who uh, survived the Holocaust as a child and could see the Canadian planes from his hiding place in Holland. In the fields of the farm beyond the fence, the Canadians pilot in blue uniform. I stood, uh, beside the st sorry, stood beside the planes chatting. I stood by that fence and I dreamed one day I will be a pilot too. Less than 11 years later, on January 5th, 1956, the commander of the Air Force pinned pilot's wings on my chest, with the blue, wings with the blue star of David. This uh, story uh, shows us, reflects the experience of the Holocaust, the influence of the experience of the Holocaust, to understand their transformation from exilic children and Holocaust refugees, the antithesis of the image of the Sabra, of the natives, Sabra fighters, into members of the leading elite in the Air Force and the State of Israel, I analyzed the major themes that emerged in the memories they shared during their interviewees in historical, social, and cultural context. This analysis is based, as I mentioned before, on 35 personal stories of the interviewees uh, and the Israeli national story. Both reflect the Holocaust and the personal and national rebirth of each of the interviewees and their changing consequence over the years. Like a jigsaw puzzle, the different stories produce a whole, a whole that consists a complex account of the phenomenon. The methodological discussion considers several questions. What was the faith of these children during and following the Holocaust? How did their faith during the Holocaust influence their desire to enlist, enlist uh, specifically in the Air Force and their motivation to volunteer for pilot training? What were the factors that contributed to their integration and success in the IAF in, and in the Israeli society? During the interviewees, I noticed that it was difficult for some interviewees to define themselves as a result of the change they had experienced during their life. A few had trouble defined themselves as Holocaust survivors because they were not in concentration camps, but rather, in quotation, only hiding, only running in the forest, or they made the way to Siberia, or some of them came from Bulgaria and Romania. Today we know that the Holocaust was awful in Romania, and we know the Jews that came from Bul to Bulgaria, from Macedonia and Terrakia, were deported too. In addition, the harsh dissonance between the chronicle ages of the interviewees and the fact that they are Holocaust survivors on, on one hand and the, the, the fields of contact that define their consciousness aviation, militarism, and connection to European culture sometimes made it difficult for them to recount emotions and experiences from the period of the Holocaust. This dynamics, dynamic is reflected in the absence of the word Holocaust from the name of the project. Of the, they wanted that the research will be called From Rebirth to the Sky, no, no term Holocaust. 
testimony taken directly from survivors raises the question of the reliability of memories conveyed decades after the event themselves. After all, memories has the potential to disappoint. This study is not aimed to, uh, to be the historical truth. It is an effort to focus on the memories and the view of the survivors. Actually, it's the narrative truth of the interviewees. The interviews were accompanied by fears regarding the opening of age-old wounds and the concern that perhaps it would be better leave the past in the past. They also raised questions as, what, we, what will those who cannot remember talk about? Do I have the right to any, any annoy those who are not interested in being interviewed? What will someone who was born during the war, wh which memories he has? Whose memories uh, he will bring? How can we distinguish between personal and second-hand memory? Other challenges resulted from my effort from my effort and my desire to preserve the uniqueness of each story while at the same time creating a common narrative. For this reason, I decided to present life stories through a discussion based on the main content question that were asked in the, in the interview and to both characterize the main, uh, the main uh, themes and highlight the themes that are expansional. The study presents the first documentary research regarding, regarding this group as an entity whose members share a common denominator, their identity and experience as children who survived the Holocaust and subsequently become a IAF aircrew members. It is also increases awareness regarding the gap between the difficult past, both as children during the Holocaust and the new uh, immigrants in Israel and their contribution to the Air Force. And in doing so, it helps us better understand the social historical process that shaped the face of the country. In addition, the the, the research enlarged our knowledge, knowledge regarding the IAF during its establishment and presents it as a warm home and cultivated equal opportunity, ideology, and the sense of purpose and mission even among those who had dip, the diff, difficult experiences in, in, in the past as children. However, because the enlistment of Holocaust survivors into the other branches of the Israeli military has not yet been sufficiently researched, this study does not attempt to en engage in comparative study. My exploration is this issue within the IAF in this, pa in this uh, paper, in this uh, lecture, contribution uh, to the border scholarship on the subject in general and the use of Holocaust testimony in particular. So, child finding, I can, sh uh, there were from different countries, uh, different, um, a year uh, that they came from different uh, professionals um, and uh, you can see here that we have from the 35 we have most of from Romania and Poland and uh, other countries so child survivor definition so a child survivor, it's uh, children, a child Holocaust survivor who were no older than 13 years uh, in 1939 and no older than 16, 16 years when the war ended, who survived in occupied uh, Europe. Children of the Holocaust experienced three traumatic periods prior to the outbreak uh, of war in Germany and Austria and, and other country, countries during the war itself and uh, after the war. So what memories emerge in those life story? A pre-war period, despite the piosity, uh, the, despite their young ages and piosity of pre-war memories, several themes uh, I found in, their, in the interviews, like economic situation, education, connection to religion and tradition, connection to Zionism, relationship with non-Jewish neighbor, and uh, with relationship with parents. I find al also economic situation, uh, for example, 
Uh, one of my interviewees who was a child in the Warsaw Ghetto and now is watching us in YouTube. Uh, he gave an example. He spoke about a memory that remained in his mind, that my parents came from a, a fa wealthy family. The strongest memory I have uh, of home is a birthday party that they celebrate for me. I was two or three years old and I got, wow, a, cyc a, a tree cycle. So we have lots of um, uh, examples with relationship with uh, uh, may, may member, um, neighbors, Christian, not Christian, maybe neighbors, etc. Um, war memories, of course, it was traumatic and formative, where they survived with parents, where they survived alone. For example, the opening event of my childhood during the Holocaust was horrific. The German came to my grand grandmother's house and beat my grandfather with a whip. I will never forget this picture of my grandfather laying on a wooden floor and um, in a puddle of blood mixed with jam. There were many memories of difficult separation from parents, a difficult uh, situation to survive. But I must, I know there is not much time, but because we are here in the Ringe Bloom archive and Ringe Bloom emphasized the women, I must emphasize and I ask for more three, four minutes to talk about the Jewish mother. It's so important to me and I think that I own it for the women. Mother bravery was very, uh, they talked a lot about mother bravery. And the mother was, uh, when I asked them in the end of the, the interviews, who is the hero in your story? They said, my mother. My mother is a hero. So, uh, I remember arriving to Auschwitz. They took, us the sh they took us to the showers. They shaved our heads. This is the only situation that is branded in my memory that I won't ever forget. That is the moment, head shown with clothes. They left me my shoes. Those were the shoes that my mother had bought for me for a kilogram of rice. The most difficult thing was the shame and the humiliation. I will never forget the moment. Another example of mother bravery. My mother man managed to escape from the camp when she was 34 with a young boy. And then there, were, there was a horrifying moment when a 14-year-old girl managed to crawl out the window and jumped from the train. At the awful moment, she shouted to my mother, throw him to me. My mother held me up and threw me out of the window. This man is almost, almost 90 years old. Until today, he understands the decision of his mother, but it's very difficult for him, emotional. Until today, why she throw me away through the window? And the opposite example, my mother is a hero. She decided to give me away to save me. My aunt is a hero. These two women, my mother and my aunt, saved their children. My mother was strong, wise, resourceful woman, yet she did not survive. Making the decision to give me away, it is an act of heroism. After the war, the period was very difficult, coping with the post-war reality, facing their loss, loneliness, liberation they remembered as a significant day, the period of wandering until they uh, immigrated to Israel. And um, despite of the difficulties, they remember this period in a positive way. The immigration to Israel, um, again, Oppose them to difficulties, language difficulties, loneliness, problem adjusting to virus, new setting. The emotion tool of integrating into Israel society inclu included forgetting the past, adoption, a new identity, and starting a new life. I registered, registered for the first grade, and they called me the refugee. The kids did not accept me. I did not know the language. I did not fit in and no one helped me. Two factors helped them to integrate, the kibbutzim and the Air Force. In the kibbutzim, they, could, they had the opportunity to shade the marks of the diaspora, and life or in the kibbutzim strengthened their ties to Israel and forget diaspora. 
Also in the Air Force, changing from a humiliated child in the Holocaust to child who belongs to the top elite of the state of Israel. And the uh, motivation to uh, go to volunteer to the Air Force, most of them said that Holocaust experience was the main factor. Of course, there were other reasons like the desire to contribute, to make a dream come true. It was a way to integrate like the Sabra society, living close to the Air Force, uh, some, uh, on some of them affected on the decision. It was some kind source of pride for the parents and uh, some of them joined uh, without a specific reason. They all shared a desire to protect the state. I found reciprocal relationship between personal uh, a personal story and national story. I found appreciation and gratitude to the Air Force. During my 22 years in the of service in the Air Force, I served the country loyally with devotion. And at the same time, I knew I know that the country and the Air Force gave me much more than I gave them. And summary and the conclu in conclusion, this study exposed the myth about air crew in the Israeli Air Force because everyone thought that all the uh, pilots and navigators and the Air Force crew were Sabra native, but not. We, 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 saw, we saw here that one third were from there, from the Holocaust. Those who came over there identified with their uh, mission the same as their Israeli born uh, uh, partners. They, their avoidness of discussion of their past and the new identities they built for themselves were major factors in their success. They had a strong ambition to succeed, their pride in playing a role in building and defending the country and the Air Force where they was their home. I found that their personal story and the national stories are interwined, representing the Holocaust and the national individual revival of all interviewees. These life stories teaches us about personal and collective memory, the dynamic of loss, wandering, return, and rebellion. In fact, their stories are some kind of a very, very important chapter of the histor Jewish history. The, the heritage of Holocaust survivor air crew member is an oral history that offers knowledge and insight to anyone who is interested in understanding their unique contribution to the Air Force and to the rebirth of the Jewish people in the State of Israel. I hope this study uh, will become an important source of information to anyone interested in learning more about the topic. The research was published in four languages, Hebrew, English, Polish, and Hungarian. Thank you very much for attention. Sorry, I took a little bit more of the time. Thank you. It wasn't that bad. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I'll start with my very brief four questions, because I'm sure you'll have many questions, and I will have less than half an hour for them. Um, so to be very brief, uh, we had two papers, uh, which I think showed us a very interesting and a very new view of, of discursive practices regarding representations of Jews. Uh, in the media before, during, and after the Holocaust. Uh, and what they both showed us was this uh, continuity and longevity of culture and antisemitism as a cultural code. And the questions I have here uh, are of, uh, of Alicia mentioned of this concept of aid as a Catholic and Christian value. And this is my question for Anya, how that works in, in the narrative which you described and also when it comes to comparing the narrative to the narrative regarding Polish-Belarusian uh, border, which you mentioned as well as a similar exclusionary practice. Uh, and for Alicia, uh, because I'm not sure if you, if you mention explicitly Catholic press, whether this actually appeared in Catholic press uh, during the war as well. Okay, should I say all four? Or yeah, I'll just say all four. I'll just go. Uh, for Jan, this is re I have like a million questions. This is really interesting. Uh, but I think the key one I have is, is that you look at eight cities and how this can be applied to other contexts within, uh, within the history of the Holocaust. So how it works in cases of small ghettos or open ghettos or, uh, uh, or even Warsaw. Does it still apply? Is it something that you think is, is universal? Uh, and the question probably many people ask you is about emotions and how emotions play part in their decision-making 
like I have lots of questions. And this is really the last one, is, is about uh, testimonies. Uh, your use of testimonies coming from different periods and how the fact that people explain the decisions differently in different periods of time in different testimonies factor in your research. And the last uh, paper, which was again very interesting, um, I really have a question about uh, about testimonies. Uh, and you, sa you said at the beginning that it was difficult to get people to speak. And would you say that it's more difficult to, uh, to uh, gather Holocaust testimonies from among members of, uh, of the Air Force or maybe military in general than people who are not members of the Air Force? And is the identity of, of a member of the Air Force playing an important part here? Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for the insightful question. Um, I would answer um, perhaps by um, thinking about, um, you know, in the in, in, in the contemporary uh, context and situation on the Belarusian uh, borders, those who who oppose help perhaps have more. Um, how they experienced the transformation uh, of 1989, um, how they currently build their own identities, and how they turn to to, to history as uh, as a, as a as a resource for for building uh, uh, their identity, and it's a very much an ongoing uh, process, whereas uh, commemorating um, the righteous. Uh, related to something that was relegated to the past in those who were no longer among us or among them, um, the dead, mostly the dead, the exiled, those who uh, had left or emigrated and, and so on. So in that sense, to put simply, it was just perhaps easier in to, to cast it as a certain moral um, imperative. Thank you. In general, um, the Polish underground press does not dedicate that much space to the Jews and the Holocaust, and the Catholic press even less. But, but perhaps the most known example of uh, um, a text that is considered a direct and passionate call for help to Jews is Zofia Kosak protest and her other articles in, um, in Pravda, uh, the underground newspaper of the uh, Front of Poland's rebirth, Front of Polski, um, refer very strongly to this notion that helping Jews is a Christian duty, even if it is actually against Polish interests. Um, and the title of my paper, of course, uh, uses quote from Kosak, our feelings towards Jews have not changed. Uczucia nasze względem Żydów nie uległy zmianie. And this notion that Helping Jews is, um, is a Christian obligation, really allows her to reconcile anti-Semitism with, um, with her rescue efforts, which are not um, to be denied. Or, um, and this notion is also extremely prevalent in the contemporary discourse on, on rescue in Poland, when even people uh, like Irena Sandler, even socialists, people who are the farthest from the church, and uh, or uh, presented as, um, you know, following some Christian conscious in their efforts to help Jews. About the question, uh, if I find it more difficult to interview people that serve in military or air force, uh, the, the answer is, is, is there is a difference between interviews if from men and women, especially men that serve in military. Because when we talk about those interviewees, they served in the 50s and the 60s when, uh, the, um, you know, they, in Israel, the society was brave is with, with physical heroism, you know, and you cannot cry and you cannot express emotion. And especially when you are talking about officers and especially airmen crew, it's like an elite group, and to expose your emotions or crying, it's really not, it's not in the lexicon. And some of my interviewees, it was the first time for them to sit and to, to cry. 
And sometimes the wives uh, sat with them and she said, wow, I know I live with him 50, 60 years. I never saw him in like w uh, such situation. What did you do to him? I did nothing. I only asked questions. And I want to emphasize also that after every interview, I called them to ask them how, do, how they feel. Is, is it okay? Some of them wanted to continue the connection with me and they started to share their ex experiences and tell their story. But some of them said to me, don't call me again. I don't want any connection with you. Not because you are not nice, because I, I start to dream about it and I don't want it anymore. I don't want to be there. Uh, thank you for your questions. Um, for the comparative potential in general, uh, of course that is a sample and that is a dissertation that is already too large. Uh, sometimes, <laughs> especially when I'm writing it up right now, um, I had to select eight CDs. Um, my goal is to make it accessible as a method uh, because the method is to follow individuals, groups, uh, uh, communities. Uh, otherwise, we could focus on one uh, context on one city, we could follow one episode. I'm thinking, of course, uh, in Warsaw, the, the Polish school of, of the Holocaust, the hunt for the Jews. But those are episodes. I wanted to focus really on, on life trajectories, even of those who ultimately didn't make it. Um, so I think by selecting those uh, samples, um, and I, I, that goes to the question of testimonies. Uh, there's a broad, I, I really s try to encompass the, the whole range of what is out there in the archives. Uh, from across the street to the Fortune of Archives, uh, to the USC Shoah Foundation with digital methods, and of course the world of memory is really important. The context, the decades of recording, the places of recording. People in Israel speak differently in the 1970s about survival than uh, US survivors in the 2000s. So um, what I try to do is to mitigate those effects by looking at semantic analysis of the Fortune of Archive. Uh, I entered the keyword poll, and then I divided into decades of recording how people speak about polls in the 1970s, 80s, 90s. So of course we have to mitigate these effects. In terms of memory, so I can, uh, um, I think we can really confirm the idea of, you know, Browning, Himka, all those scholars who have worked on those testimonies, there's a, a stability, an overall stability of memories. Um, and I think the sequence really, ha or sequencing helps us understand these, these choices and behaviors at trigger moments, and those are the moments of powerful emotions. Of course, emotions play a huge role in my, in my research. Um, uh, loss of, of loved ones, uh, specific threats. Uh, uh, often people act on emotions, on certain contextual factors that you know no pre-Holocaust political regime can account for. So it's really uh, instead of looking as sometimes you know often social scientists do from uh, one factor they look at the entire sequence. What I do, I look at the previous sec sequence. So what did what happened just before, and how does this inform their choices in the moment? So emotions play uh, an immense role, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I have 18 minutes uh, for questions. Uh. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question to Alicia. A very specific one in the context of a project I'm, I think of developing about radical anti-Jewish attitudes in in uh, in Polish uh, reflections on the presence of Jews in Polish lands, uh, in a in a long durée perspective, uh, where I found initial I mean in initial prospections some very surprising and interesting continuities of tropes, whether you came across tropes of of uh, the betrayal of the Polish elites, which leads to the presence of the Jews, and um, a challenging of the legal basis of the presence of the Jews as part of an argument how one should or should not engage with Jews during the occupation. answer now. Should I get a few more questions? Yes. Hi, thank you very much for your lectures and I want to say thank you very much Lea Ganor because uh, her um, uh, information for, for me is absolutely new 
And my question to you, Lai, is um, uh, because I didn't see this statistic uh, clearly, how many uh, uh, pilots was from Poland? This is the question to you. And also I have a question to Mrs. Anna, sorry, Slitzer. Uh, I have two questions to you. One, uh, about the situation after the war. Have you studied statistics on criminal records in the areas where they committed against the Jews in relation to Poles? This is one question. And the second question, uh, do you know the first, uh, this is about the Kelsa program. Do you know the first official statement of the Polish church on the Kelsa program? Okay. Shall we get one more question, maybe, so that we can... Um, I have a question to Jan, and this is not a surprise. Um, Jan, I would like to refer to your concluding words about um, uh, surviving as a learning process. And I would like to ask you if this is uh, already a result of your quantitative uh, analysis, because we couldn't see really very clearly the slides, or is it still a working hypothesis? Because if we really um, accept that surviving is a learning process, we are, of course, running the risk uh, of uh, implying that uh, those who did not survive were simply bad students. And I'm sure it's not what you want to say. And I wonder what uh, do your qualitative sources say about this topic and if, the, if this uh, kind of um, uh, factor that surviving was a learning process transpires in these type of sources. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to start? Uh, thank you, Albert, for coming. Albert is the director of the Ghetto Warsaw Museum. So uh, thank you for coming. Um, here you can see the findings from the 35 I interviewed. There were uh, seven uh, from Poland, seven. And um, some of them were in, the, in Warsaw, from Warsaw, from really Warsaw, in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, actually, the lady is here, uh, Mrs. Vanda, came here. She was a child in the Warsaw Ghetto because she knows one of the pilots that was in the same age. So if I did not understand your question, we can continue this, that conversation later. But I, as I understood it, I want to say that absolutely in the discourse of the right during the war, both national democracy and, and uh, the, the far right, um, the, the notion of uh, betrayal, um, which is connected to the idea of, of judo komuna, Jewish communism, uh, Jews... Uh, you know, constantly betraying Poles to the Germans um, is uh, very present, and uh, that continues also after the war, when this um, this discourse on help cannot appear anymore in the official discourse, but it kind of remains underground and is to be found in the underground publications of those anti-communist guerrillas celebrated today in Poland as the as Żołnierze Wyklęci. Uh, and then, decades later, it emerges in the far-right internet, uh, anti-Semitic publications online, and I would argue uh, emerged last year in the anti-refugee um, uh, statements uh, about the Belarusian border. So, yeah, um, the notion of um, the Jews are not, don't have the right to be present in Poland anyway, absolutely is also present and um, so there are articles that of course that claim that of course we condemn the German methods but because our goal is to get rid of Jews anyway and whatever the Germans do not do now we will have to complete after the war but for migration it just makes no sense for them to help them we just cannot do it and we should not even uh, feel sorry for them and the uh, rhetoric of Jews as guests in Poland rhetoric of Poles as hosts. Uh, of course, it's an anti-Semitic rhetoric, which is um, so, makes it so perplexing to, to see it in a socialist newspaper, but of course it's a, it's a deep um, cultural code in Poland. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. I'll start with the 
uh, official uh, statement on the on the Kielce uh, pogrom. So as far as I remember, there is there was um, not an official uh, statement as such. Um, there were sermons praised today by um, Bishop Kubina of Częstochowa. Um, there were publications, there was a, an, an, an op-ed op op uh, in, in Tygodnik Powszechny, in the, in the main uh, Catholic wi weekly, so we can, by extension, because it was officially approved by, by the church in um, uh, especially Sapieha provided some some fi f funding and and support. Uh, we could also um, we could also read it as a as a as a voice of the of the Catholics at a at a time. Um, and it's a question how you know how of our reading, right? Like how how do we interpret uh, those, those 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 statements? Um, and regarding to the, um, um, and then there is also uh, perhaps uh, a better known, um, better known uh, statement of uh, Cardinal Hland, um, who was mentioned um, at um, in the, in, in some, somewhere in the middle of my presentation uh, to the foreign uh, press, to the correspondence, and that was then uh, leaked. Uh, uh, back uh, something that he did not apparently intend, um, but as an official um, a letter, I'm, I'm not sure that we have anything, and happy to hear the information. And regarding the first question on uh, criminal statistics, I, I quite, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit, I have to admit, I'm a bit confused. So perhaps we can um, talk about this question because I did not quite. After after the Q and A's, thank you. Thank you for your question, and I look forward to exchanging more afterwards. Um, I would say surviving as a s surviving is definitely the the central concept. Learning process is definitely solidifying in in my chapters. What what I'm doing right now, uh, and one reading that you suggested could of course be those who didn't survive didn't learn enough or didn't learn the right things. That is absolutely um, not what the historical record is showing across decades and place of recording. And actually, it's, the learning process stems from a testament really dear to my, to my heart from Regina L. from Krakow, who uh, uh, was killed two months before liberation. And it's repeatedly in her writings, in her diary, in her, in her wartime writings, in her letters, she repeatedly uses the word learning. I learned to accept my fate. We learned a lot. We learned to live with it. So the word learning comes up again and again. And I think that is something we need to, to ponder uh, in terms of the intent. We always have um, often been remaining focused on the outcomes. You know, this percentage of, of Jews survived in this locality. And what I try to do is to look at the intentions, the efforts. So the whole process before the final result. And I think that that, that, that is actually the, the opposite reading of, you know, those who... Uh, survived, did learn the right things. Everybody learned. We're like we all students of of life, even now, in normal, you know, non persecution context. So I think that is a really fruitful way of thinking about it. And of course, this has to be measured against the local timeline. And that is, as as historians, we can we can do that best, I believe. Uh, France in 1941 is not the same as Kiev in 1943. So we have to really take into account the local context. But I think the the, the, the idea of process really accounts for this best. Thank you. And we have time for probably one or two more questions. Thank you so much. That, that was a great panel. And uh, well, Leah, a question about your positionality as a woman. Uh, in, in those interviews, uh, you, because what oral history is, right, it's a creation. You co-create the document with your interviewee. So I also wanted to ask you about gender dynamic. I understand some of these were women also, some of, no. So, only men. Only men. Only so men. This is something I would like but you to... But they came to the interview sometimes with their wives. Uh, and you know, when in a Polish, when you are in a Polish marriage, you answer the man, the wife answers. <laughs> 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 <That's right. laughs> 
So I, I, I'll ask another question to Jan, and then I would love to hear more from you because this is <laughs> uh, Jan. Thank you. This is so. I'm thinking about. So I thought your work is bringing something to our understanding of agency and structures. But then I heard your last answer, and you say it's really about intentions, sort of, it's not really about capacity to act, it's about intending to act. So, uh, so this is a little bit about the theory, uh, how much you think that your work can contribute to our understanding of agency um, under extreme circumstances. Thank you. And one more question. Hi, uh, so a question for Alicia. Uh, so I, I have to confess I'm more confused than ever because are you saying there are no correlations between the political um, identifications and the um, recommendations about how we should respond to this Jewish persecution? Or are you saying there's less correlation than you expected? And finally, how do we explain the phenomenon of uh, Zofia Kosak who seems to defy everything and yet is possibly the most heroic. Uh, so, and, and based on, based on you know, Christian claims of you know, doing, this is the Christian thing to do. So are you able to make sense of any of this? Thank you, and who goes first? I think. So I did not make, make myself clear because I see a complete correlation. Um, probably more than I naively expected. Um, um, I guess I would expect that the ongoing mass murder would change something, but it really doesn't. The, whatever was the position before the war is usually the same position during the war about the Jewish place in the national community or even physically in Poland. And, and that really influenced um, very strongly the recommendations for what should we help, should we not help if we should help, why and how. Um, and Cossack, I think, is just too big of a uh, discussion to even go into right now. A lot has been written about it. Um, so maybe we can continue that later. <laughs> OK, about, yes, it was difficult. I uh, work a lot in this field, and I meet a lot of Holocaust survivors, and I interview. But this group was really special because, um, as I said, it's men, forgive me men, it's pilots, navigators, and um, I, the age of almost their daughter, and they have to open up and to tell not facts but emotions. And it was really difficult in the beginning. Some of them did not want to be interviewed and I really persuade so much that until they could not say to me no. And um, I must say that after one interview, the second three, they are like a group, but they did not know the, uh, one of each other. They served together in the, in the uh, Air Force and nobody spoke about his experiences. Nobody knew. I know the whole 35 stories, but everyone knows his story. They don't know the others. And um, the most difficult thing was the first time when I finished writing and I analyzed and I uh, presented for them my research. It was really scary that maybe I did not understood them okay. Maybe I got wrong something. And I really was uh, <laughs> fear, it was a lot of uh, fear. And uh, after the lecture, they hugged me and they said, wow, you are our voice. And I promised them. Everywhere I'm being, I am invited, I will go and I will tell your story. Because of this group from the 35, almost seven died in the last years. Some of them died from COVID. And I feel that when I'm talking about them, I'm telling their story, nobody will forget. I will be their voice. And I really want to thank them to who, part, who collaborated and shared his memory because they are watching me now in, in YouTube. Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. And I hope I answered you. Uh, very quick, thank you for your, for your comment. Um, agency is a, is a really uh, interesting concept. Um, I'm interested in this uh, interplay between structure and agency. Um, 
And agency as a sword is like the, the question is wrongly placed by saying yes, people had agency or no, people didn't have agency. What I try at least to, to, to measure is the impact of agency in specific situations and contexts. Uh, but uh, I know you raised the very uh, you know fine grained distinctions of agency in the in the Shofa forum, and I'm actually working on that and and try to uh, to make my to make uh, sense of, of of that. So I'm looking forward to engaging more. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the speakers, and thank you for your wonderful questions. And um, now we can have a lunch break. Thank you. Thank you for
Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> uh, if we could uh, ask uh, <laughs> audience from here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, welcome to our panel on uh, Polish-Jewish uh, philanthropic networks. And we will uh, st start hopefully on time. <laughs> our first uh, presenter, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Karolina Kopak. Uh, Karolina is a PhD candidate at uh, Yale University in modern history of Eastern Europe and Russia with focus on late 19th and early 20th century Poland and Polish Jewish relations. Uh, her work engages history of nationalism and empire, antisemitism and fascism, transnational networks and exchanges, civil society and democracy, childhood and minority histories. She already has some publications under her belt. Uh, she is currently working on her dissertation, uh, The Making of a Society of Children, Summer Camps for Impoverished and Weekly Children in Warsaw, 1882-1939, uh, this dissertation reconstructs the history of uh, summer camps of Colonia Letnia in Warsaw, and the paper today is part of that project. Karolina, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it is a great privilege to be here today and be able to um, have this opportunity to share with you um, a few aspects of my dissertation project, which is essentially a story of one institution, the Kolonie Letnie, or the summer camps, which uh, began, evolved, and gained immense popularity uh, within the Imperial Russian context and Congress Kingdom in Warsaw. They existed during World War I, and they survived that war, and then they reemerged in the Second Polish Republic. Um, in this presentation, I would like to focus um, primarily on the institution's pre-war existence, mostly because I only have 20 minutes, but also because I think that um, this origin story and uh, the story of its origin, but also the evolution of this institution, demonstrates its significance and its endurance. Uh, everything that followed during World War I and especially in the Second Polish Republic has its beginning here in the Russian partition in Imperial Warsaw. The foundation or the blueprint of the Kolonie Letnie comes from this late Imperial period. In August 1881, a doctor, hygienist, Dr. Stanislav Markiewicz, published an article in the Warsaw Gazette entitled, We Want Kolonie Letnie for Poor Children. And this was the very first public appeal um, regarding uh, the Kolonie Letnie, setting something of that sort in Warsaw. In this article, Markiewicz did two things. First, he presented an already well-known image of the dire situation of the poorest children of Warsaw. But at the same time, he explained to the reader, look to the West, because the West has come up with an idea and Warsaw should apply it. Um, the first Kolonie Letnie were established in Zurich in 1876, and from there they moved on to other Western uh, European cities, and of course Warsaw was now to participate in this kind of civilizational project. If it was to be a Western city, um, then it was to also have this initiative. Uh, now, the very first Kolonie Letnie were organized in the summer of 1882, thanks to the initiative of Dr. Markiewicz, but also um, other doctors, his colleagues, and a few representatives of the intelligentsia, most prominent of which was Bolesław Prus, uh, a representative of the positivist movement. And this is important because this institution was very much a positivist project. 
Um, now, there were problems with creating uh, such an institution in Imperial Warsaw, and Markevich had this idea that perhaps the best way to avoid legal hurdles of legalizing such an institution would be to pin it already under the existing Warsaw Charity Society, uh, which was an official organization approved by the state and had many initiatives that addressed the needs of the city um, uh, it was already active. And so Markevich thought perhaps if they allow Kolonia Letnia to exist under their wing, the organizers wouldn't have to deal with those legal hurdles. Unfortunately, the Warsaw Charity Society declined. Um, so now for 15 years until the society would be officially approved by the Tsarist authorities in 1897, uh, Markevich and the group of organizers which grew with each year would have to every year um, get the legal permission to send children to the countryside. Now, aside from the legal aspect, there was also the question of funds. And the state was not going to provide any money for this initiative. Uh, there was no municipal uh, government that could provide funds. So everything came from private initiative, from private pockets, wallets. Um, and this would be the case for the whole duration of the Kolonia Letnie, including World War I and the Second Polish Republic, although I cannot talk about this here, but in the Second Polish Republic, the role of the state would absolutely dominate here. And so, like I said, the blueprint already comes from 1882. It would be modified and with gained experience, it would grow and sort of uh, become even, even better. Um, but really, it was here that uh, these men created the organizational and uh, the procedures for running successful uh, Kolonia Letnia in the countryside. So instructions for caretakers, kind of the issue of the qualifications of children, what age uh, would be allowed to, to go to the countryside, etc. Now, the Kolonia Letnie were really a successful organization, and Bolesław Prus would say that Kolonia Letnie became one of the most, if not the most, beloved institution uh, of Warsaw. Um, Janusz Korczak, who later would be one of the caretakers at this at both the Jewish and the Polish Kolonia Letnie, would say that this was indeed a holy institution. So what is it that made Kolonia Letnia stand out? And what was it that made them successful, that made them endure this period, the war, and then uh, reemerge very successful in the Second Polish Republic? And one of the things is that the 1880s, uh, Warsaw saw the publication of two important uh, journals. One was called Przegląd Pedagogiczny, the Pedagogical Review, the other Zdrowie, or Health. Um, and these two publications signaled um, the arrival of the hy hygiene and pedag pedagogical movements in the kingdom. Przegląd Pedagogiczny dealt with issues of upbringing, and that's important because it wasn't a strictly um, school-oriented or a very narrow understanding of education, um, also due to the kind of circumstances of, of the schooling system in the Russian Empire. Um, but it, it was about a kind of holistic uh, upbringing of the child. Um, Zdrowia, on the other hand, focused on private and public hygiene. So questions of, for example, the very important apartment issue that Warsaw faced, the question of greenery in the city, do children have anywhere to play, particularly the poorest children? Because while Warsaw did have parks, many of them were not accessible to the poorest children. Uh, the question of nutrition, what are the poorest classes eating? Uh, all of that was addressed in Zdrowie. And in many ways, the Kolonia Letnie became a kind of connector of those two movements, because both the upbringing aspect, the educational aspect, and the hygienic aspect were combined in this institution. Now, Again, this wasn't just a typical charitable uh, institution. The language of compassion, the kind of emotional appeal to the public, will always be there, especially if one traces the reports, um, the reports of, the, of the institution. But especially since the 90s, and definitely since the, the second half of the 90s, 1890s, 
this language would um, sort of, the dominant language would be one of medicine, of a kind of scientific proof that this is actually working. Um, reports, statistics, I mean, there was immense transparency going on here where every cent was accounted for and um, every, um, you know, every gain in weight uh, of a child was, was reported as a success. So there is this trend of limiting the kind of appeal to the hearts, uh, very kind of characteristic of, of uh, charitable institutions, and definitely a much more of this kind of scientific language that was meant to persuade the public that this is, this is a progressive institution and that, more importantly, it works. Um, and lastly, like I said, because it was rooted in the kind of positivist tradition, this project was very was understood as a progressive, future-oriented deed. So it wasn't just about um, pitting the children and kind of ameliorating their, their needs at the moment. It was about who are we raising? What will be the future stock of our uh, society? And the question here was, do we want to raise healthy, valuable, mature citizens, or do we not? And Warsaw seemed to respond, uh, we do want to raise such, uh, such individuals. Because as I have uh, realized, and actually this has been one of the most inspirational and fascinating parts of this project, this really did become a, a wonderful expression of a very active and diverse civil society. And I will stress that because it was truly diverse. Um, Colonia Letnia, is an interesting space to, to study because it's a space of cooperation, uh, particularly between the Christian and uh, the Jewish segments of the population. So like I mentioned already, this institution was backed exclusively by private initiative. Um, and without this kind of public support and the involvement of the public, it wouldn't, it wouldn't stand a chance. Um, and here, aside from the financial needs, uh, which of course the donations, there was a wide spectrum from the very sizable donations from the uh, high, uh, high bourgeoisie, there would be also little tiny donations from children who wanted to donate money so that other children could go to the Colonia Letia. So it's an interesting spectrum of, of people who, who finance this. Um, but there was more than that. Uh, there was also a need for materials and services. So here, for example, we see the participation of uh, big factory owners sending in plates of sugar, textiles, brushes, kitchen utensils, anything to build up the inventory of the Colonia Letnia. Uh, girls and young women would be mostly in charge of sewing clothing for children, little backpacks that they could take and put their things in when they would go to the countryside. And then after the closing of the season, they would be the ones who would be fixing up uh, the inventory and prepare it for the next year. Uh, women were also, uh, particularly of the higher bourgeoisie, uh, in charge of um, organizing charity balls and charity events that would, uh, that would get uh, funds flowing in. Um, also, the Polish-Jewish presence was important, uh, particularly in terms of property. This was one of the main issues of the Colonia Letnia. Where are we going to send children? Um, in the 80s, there's a predominance of aristocratic fa families um, landed gentry offering a space for such initiative. But towards the 90s, um, this, this didn't seem to be practical anymore because Colonia Letnia still had to pay for, uh, for renting out the space. So two very prominent um, members of the Polish Jewish high bourgeoisie uh, decided to offer to Colonia Letnia to, uh, to this initiative. One in 1889, Leszno, um, this was offered by Jan and Cecilia Berson. Um, this was a Colonia Letnia that uh, housed both Christian and Jewish children. Then in 1892, we have Hippolyte Wawelberg offering um, a, a, a Colonia Letnia in Czechochin. Again, this was a special Colonia Letnia because it was curative, so it was meant for the most dire cases um, 
uh, of children who were extremely sick and really needed, um, needed long-term help. In 1894, uh, Matilda Posner would offer property in Kujare. So these people, these Colonia Letnia, although they were never owned by the, what later would become the society of the Colonia Letnia, nonetheless they were free of cost and free of charge and so they really did become uh, the main kind of uh, spaces where these children could be sent. And like I said, it was both Christian and Jewish children sent to these Colonia Letnia and um, the proportions were about 70% Christian children, and here we do not know if it was strictly Roman Catholic children or also some uh, Protestant denominations, because there is just no mention of that, um, and about 30% of Jewish children. Uh, some, like the Leshno and Chehochina Colonia Letnia, sent both groups together. Um, others, like the one in Kuhare and later Mihaufka, which would become a um, an actual real estate owned by the society uh, was, was just for uh, Jewish children. Um, finally, in terms of the organizational aspect of the Colonia Letnia, Polish Jews also played a tremendous role in running the actual initiative. They were members of the committee, both representatives of professionals, experts, mostly doctors and pedagogues, but also um, the more influential, financially speaking, uh, representatives of that uh, community. So we have Dr. Antoni Natanson, Dr. Julian Kramstück was extremely uh, involved and he actually um, he actually is the one who persuaded Janusz Korczak to, to be a caretaker at the Kolonie. Stanisław Rotwand, Henryk Konitz, Bonaventura Teoplitz, Valerian Kronenberg, all of these names probably at least uh, somewhat ring a, ring a bell. Um, in any case, I think my time is running out. Um, this last bit, I, I would gladly expand on it and sort of uh, provide maybe more concrete examples of how these colonies looked, uh, what exactly was, uh, was going on, but I just wanted to paint a picture of kind of the involvement um, of really representatives of various segments of society and um, both religious groups, Christian and Jewish, uh, in the undertaking. Um, and I think I will stop right here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolina. You still had time, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker will be Samir Saadi. Uh, did I do it right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, he came, Samir uh, came to us from Tunisia. He's a second year PhD student of modern history at the Graduate School of Humanities at the University of Warsaw. He's currently working on his dissertation entitled The Emigration of Jews from Poland and France to Israel after the Second World War with a comparative approach. Uh, and he works on, on this um, uh, fascinating research under the supervision of Professor August Grabski. And the paper today is part of this project. Uh, Samir, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings from Tunisia for everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, uh, the Hebrew uh, sheltering and immigrant aid society known as Hayas. Okay, we have the slide here. Uh, the purpose of uh, my presentation is uh, to shed light on the history and some of the activities of this uh, famous but unknown organization in Poland, uh, dealing with the Jewish migration over three decades uh, during two different uh, historical periods before and after the Holocaust. Okay, that's the way. Okay. To change the thing to click here. Oh, oh this one. Okay. <coughs> so, 
So at uh, the beginning of uh, my presentation, I'm going to present uh, briefly the, um, the state of research on the activity of HIAS in uh, Poland. Uh, in another word, uh, who and how the activity of this organization has been uh, treated. Uh, and I will underline uh, also the history and the activity of HIAS in Poland during the interwar uh, period in its first and uh, second edition. Uh, later, I will study the activity of um, uh, this organization and the outcomes uh, after the Holocaust by accrediting the rich archive of Jewish Historical Institute in uh, Warsaw. And uh, finally, I will uh, compare the outcomes of this organization work before and after the Second World War. As it was uh, planned, my presentation will last about uh, 20 minutes. Uh, <clears throat> despite the organization fame and its great role in the history of uh, the Jews, not only in Poland but also in the world, the process of searching for information about Hayas was not an easy matter. Uh, the only reference which I found dealing with the history of this organization is uh, Mark Wischnitzer's book, Visas to Freedom, the History of Hayas. A book that studies in uh, may not detail the history of this organization and uh, uh, presents many statistics uh, on the organization role in facilitating the immigration of Jews to the United States and to several countries in the world. The information here related to the history of the organization in Poland is really uh, scarce. Uh, <coughs> Despite the abundance of writings and academic research on the history of Jewish migration from Poland, to name a few, uh, Stanisław Pawłowski, Matusz Stroka, uh, Zofia Trembasz, uh, Albert Sankowski and uh, others. However, there is no comprehensive study of this organization activity in Poland, either before or after the Second World War. All of the studies that deal with this Jewish immigration from Poland accidentally mentioned this organization in the context of, pro of providing some statistics. In my opinion, attention should be paid uh, to the number of primary references in the study of this organization. Uh, primary, like this, like what, what I found, for example, the report of the Jewish Central Association Immigrate, in Polish it's Zidowski Centralna Towarzystwo Immigracyjne, and also addition to the archive of the organization uh, here in the Institute in, in Warsaw. <coughs> the Ebro Sheltering and, Aid and Immigrant Aid Society, HIAS, was established in uh, Poland on March 1920, two years after Poland gained its independence. The seat of HIAS in Warsaw was at uh, Moranowska Street 34, it's now, as you can see, the map near to Hotel Ibis, that far from Pauline. Later, it changed at Piękne 43 Street. Uh, Hayas has uh, local branches in many cities in Poland, like in Białystok, uh, Krakow, and others. The task of uh, the office in Warsaw was to reunite Jewish family separated during the First World War, to help and care for Jewish immigrants and to cooperate with the government bodies as the immigration department at the Ministry of Labor in Poland. Hayas uh, worked to get rid of all obstacles that forestalled the biggest number of Jews from obtaining the visa. For example, the visa forms were uh, filled in the association offices rather than the American consulate which made the number of applications running from 50 to 500 applications per day. The affidavits were conjointly replaced by regular letters that embraced the relative's pledge to bear the cost of the travel, furthermore, as not requiring the presence of the one who intend to get the visa uh, to the consulate, but rather sending the request by mail is sufficient. Uh, in 1921, thanks to the works of Hayas, uh, approximately 
86,000 Jews obtained the Polish, Polish passport and exit visas. The turnout for tickets to the United States was so great that the companies decided to start selling uh, tickets of the first and second classes, especially after tickets of the third class were sold out. Through Hayas, about 4,800 telegrams were sent from Jews to their relatives in the United States of America. More than 5,000 affidavits were registered and fled by the Hayas. And on January 1921, Hayas paid out to 3,000 people an amount of $1 million as remittance. Uh, between December uh, 10, uh, 1920 and January 1921, 81% of the Jewish immigrants from Poland immigrated to join the close family, whether they were brothers, sister, husband, and wives, and only 2% uh, had other connections. What about the relation with the Polish state? During the interwar years, uh, the relationships between uh, the Polish state and Hayas went through ups and downs. For example, to obtain travel visas, the Polish authorities had imposed on Jewish immigrants to purchase their tickets from certain companies licensed by the Polish government. Later, after a first stage in which the Polish government accepted to pay uh, remittances in dollars, later the Polish government ordered Hayas to pay out the remittances in Polish Zloty. So this was, of course, an intense blow to lots of families, especially to potential immigrants. So let me now to speak a little about the Jewish Immigrant Aid Society, Jias. So we are speaking about Hayas, now we are speaking about Jias. Is it the same thing or not? We will see. <coughs> After the restriction imposed by the United States of America and several countries from the American country on the immigration of Jews from Europe in 1921 and 1924, Hayas ended its mission in Poland. But on Hayas' initiatives, an organizational committee was founded at the end of 1923, which included, among others, Hayas, the National Council at the Club of Jewish Same members in Poland, uh, the Palestinian Department and other uh, departments. And as a result, the Jewish Immigrant Aid Society, known as GIAS, was founded. The central uh, office, as you can see here on the slide, was located at the Gzibowski Square. On the right, you can see the actual uh, building. Uh, GIAS had uh, nine local branches in many cities in uh, Poland. Uh, but here, as you can see, in 1927, uh, three international Jewish organizations working in the field of uh, relief and immigration, here Hayas, the Jewish Colonization Association, and Emig Direct, unite and form one organization called HISEM. And HISEM took over the financing of GIAS. So GIAS is like update of Hayas. According to its uh, status, GIAS pur uh, purpose was to inform the immigrants strictly and objectively about the possibility of immigration to a given country and about the condition of settlement and accommodations. And because of the Great War, most Jews lost their personal documents, while others had only religious records. Anyway, the formalities, the formalities related to immigration to all countries are so complicated that an immigrant, even having a good understanding of this maze, will not be able to do without the help of a social organization. In this context, GIAS took it upon itself to assist immigrants making these documents. In addition to legal aid, JS conducted vocational training courses for Jews intending to immigrate. An experiment that was unsuccessful due to lack of founders. 
and nearly 2,000 people completed uh, courses organized by the organization to teach uh, languages of polarizing countries such as English, uh, French, and uh, Spanish. In uh, 1926, GS opened an outpatient clinic for immigrants with visual ailments with the aim uh, of providing them with adequate and inexpensive treatment. It also, in 1931, uh, a hotel of Jewish immigrant under the name of Abraham Polishevsky House of Jewish Immigrant was opened in Warsaw. Uh, the task of which is to gather immigrant arriving and departing from Warsaw. Here I would like to present you an example of uh, a document requested, requested by Hayas in order to help a Jew uh, named Lizar Mebel to obtain a visa, visa of work to Sweden. And as you can see, a huge number of documents were requested. Between 1925 and 1934, GS received about 500,000 application form from 200,000 people. Sent, as you can see here in the slide, many letters and received the same. And also issued about 38,000 passport and 13,000 visas. Uh, the organization's wide range of action areas necessitates the presence of large financial resources. Here, and according to the administrative and financial report for the financial year 1933-1934, about 72% of JS. The relation with the Polish state, <coughs> the diversified and branched activity of the organization has been recognized not only in the broader strata of Jewish society, but also among the government factors. In the first place, the former Bureau of Immigration or intervention of GS enjoyed the total support of the state factors. Here, for example, the Ministry of the Social Welfare granted a permanent uh, subsidy in the, in, in the total amount of 300 Polish zloty per month for the emer uh, emergency allowance for families of immigrants. The highest in Poland after the Holocaust and until 1949. To know more about Hayas and uh, its activity after the Holocaust, uh, we have to visit the archive at the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. There we have the collection there includes about 486 archival units, which a volume of about 8 megabytes files. Uh, in 2016, an inventory of the archive of the Ebro of the Afhayas was made by Tadeusz Epstein and Agnieszka Reszka. This inventory is available in the Institute website. The, recorded, uh, the records include organiza organizational files, news uh, releases, correspondences, letters, monthly reporters, and others. Despite the changes brought uh, about uh, World War II, particularly what Jews experienced during the Holocaust, the organization maintained its pre-war policy in the sense of assisting Jews in immigrating legally, uh, besides the normal functions of informing people, consulting them, and giving technical and material assistance, Hayas has developed a new section of searching relatives and family. About 6,000 6, searches of this type were made during the reporting period in 1948. In the archive, we can find uh, hundreds of letters and personal correspondence regarding the search. Uh, this separate sector of Hayas activity was searching for relatives at home and uh, abroad. What about the outcomes? As you can notice in, uh, through the following uh, diagram, there is a huge uh, disproportion between the number of registered people 
here in the in the uh, red color, and the number of people who immigrated. It shows it shows the scale of problems faced by immigrants trying to legally leave Poland. For example, in 1946, about 4,000 uh, people signed up for departure to the United States. Just 140 people went. 1947, more than 3,000 were registered, but just 100 went. The relation with the Polish state is like always stable. It becomes evident to, to me much after reading some of Hayas uh, documents that Poland and Hayas cooperated together. Hayas was acting in permanent contact with the Ministry of Work and Social Help, which is supervising its activity, as well with the Ministry of Public Administration. Hayas, Hayas also was cooperating with the immigration section of the Central Committee of Polish Jews, known in Poland as CKGB. <clears throat> Just uh, a while, okay. Now let to see the work of the organization before and after, and which conclusion what we can have. About the area of intervention. Despite the development, development imposed by World War II, especially what the Jews were exposed during the Holocaust, Hayas continued to pursue the same policy before the war, in the sense of helping the Jews to immigrate, but in legal ways. This caused many uh, misunderstandings, as it was mentioned in some documents. The immigrants asked Hayas many times to intervene in the American consulate and requested to facilitate them leaving Poland by any means. The outcomes, as you can see also, it's not possible in any way to compare the outcomes of the work of the organization before and after the Holocaust. Uh, before the Holocaust, we have about 184,000 departures. And later, after, we have about 4,000. And this number, this last one, is uh, very weak, especially if it's compared to the number of registered Jews, as well as the number of Jews who left Poland illegally. Until 1930, immigration may, mainly went to South America, Argentina and Brazil. But since the introduction of the restriction in 1921, 21, uh, 21 24 and 1830, the immigration moved to South America has decreased, while significant Jewish immigration to Palestine begins. In the years 1946-48, uh, the largest group of people, as I previously said, applied to, to migrate to the United States of America, but only a small part obtained papers. But later also, from 1949, many, many people wanted to go to, to Israel. The relation with the Polish state, during nearly 30 years of the organization's existence in Poland, the relationship between the Polish government and IAS was characterized by cooperation and absence of confrontations. This is what the organization report uh, revealed. And in my opinion, uh, the relationship was a kind of uh, marriage of convenience. Uh, the immigration of Polish Jews in the interwar period was considered by the Polish government as the magic solution that would solve all the emerging economic, social, and political problems in uh, Poland. But also, thanks to, to the presence of Hayas, and in order to help the Jews, about $9 million were tra transferred to Poland from Hayas, America to Hayas and JS Poland. On the other hand, uh, the goal of Hayas was to help the largest number of uh, Jews and without problems with the Polish government. Uh, this is bringing me to the end of my presentation. Let me just run over the point, uh, the key points again. The activity of Hayas before and after the Holocaust in Poland includes only the legal immigration. 
One of the most active uh, sections was the section of searching relatives and families, especially after the Holocaust. Despite the large budget and the important financial support obtained by the organization, the large number of administrative uh, procedures and the attendant bureaucracy made the outcome of its work, especially with regard of the Jewish immigration, very poor. Until 1949, the relationship between Poland and Hayas was a good one. A win-win deal. A relationship that will change radically after the establishment of Israel and uh, Poland's tendency to oppose Zionism. Uh, my presentation is really a simple attempt to introduce this organization and it's a call also for more studies on this organization not known in Poland. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Samir. Um, uh, as you noticed, it's a panel of excellent uh, early stage scholars, PhD students from Yale, from University of Warsaw, and our last presenter also uh, in her fifth year of doctoral studies at the University of Toronto, Dikla Yogev. Uh, she will defend her dissertation next month. <laughs> Uh, she's well versed in quantitative, qualitative and mixed methods of social sciences and a lone non-historian here. <laughs> uh, she teaches undergraduate courses in Israeli and religious studies as well as criminology at the University of Toronto. She has published in peer-reviewed journals of criminology and Jewish studies in which she has recently written about the Haredim, the police, and uh, coronav coronavirus. Uh, she serves as the research manager for uh, Professor Naomi Zeitman's uh, Beis Yaakov project, and her work focuses on the school leadership network. And the paper today is a part of that project, and Dikla, floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. I'm very excited.
wonderful. Uh, thank you all, and I really look forward to uh, all these projects uh, published uh, <laughs> in a very near future. Uh, so, these three interesting presentations, uh, papers, they all study explicitly or potentially uh, social, philanthropic, or transnational aspects of Jewish institutions. The institutions which emerged from variety of modernization processes uh, which defined Jewish history in the context of United States, Palestine, Europe, Eastern Europe, between the 1870s and the Holocaust, roughly, in that time period. Uh, so I think these projects potentially and surely uh, will tell us a lot new things, new interpretation of modernity and modern urban transformations of Jewish life in a global perspective uh, and in transnational dimension. All of them, also along our, the, the theme of our conference, all of them present us with fantastic opportunities to think about rupture and continuity uh, from imperial to nation state, from pre-war to post-war, and from month to month, um, uh, as in the last presentation. So now just a few questions, observations, and you don't need to answer them here, but something to, to think about. Uh, Carolina, uh, I would like to hear more about this rupture and continuity. So in this presentation, you focus on the imperial period, uh, but your larger projects will span both the imperial and the nation state, uh, the Polish Republic. Uh, so, uh, do you see rapture, do you see continuity in thinking about philanthropy? Uh, how did class-based terms change? How the civilizing mission change? Uh, what changed? How? Um, and I know that you also look into the wartime, so you will actually look at the Warsaw Ghetto and see colonial etnia or semi-colonial etnia during the war. So this is one. Uh, second, uh, of course, this is the story, the larger, broader story of Western philanthropy, right? Upper middle class, civilizing mission, a future-oriented progressive uh, about health, public health, um, uh, creating future citizens, better citizens through philanthropy. So I'm thinking that maybe your project has a potential to really rethink, redefine philanthropy in East European terms, right? So to really think about philanthropy in East European shape and form, in particularity of Poland. And what I found really fascinating, of course, you bring the Polish positivist thought, positivist school, and then, of course, you have those Western transnational uh, blueprint model so I'm thinking about, of course, transnational connections and actors moving uh, both ways, right? Um, and I wonder to what extent, I don't know, French experiences or US experiences of philanthropy made its way to places like Krakow, Warsaw, and the other way around. And finally, of course, gender, right? So you mentioned women, uh, and philanthropy is necessarily a gendered um, undertaking, and, and I wonder if you I'm sure in your project you will develop it, and I would like to hear more. Uh, and there is much more, but <laughs> in the break. Thank you very much, Carolina. Um, uh, Samir, uh, so this is the project that uh, uh, I understand. Um, uh, th this, is, this is the beginning, right? So you mainly presented us with an outline of a history of Hayas in Poland um, before and after the war. But I know that you are working on comparative angle with France. So do you have, I don't know how much research you've done in the French context, but do you have some hypotheses concerning these two histories of Hayas? Uh, for example, you focus on, on government. Um, how did it look um, when we think about the French government and Hayas, right? Uh, how, do, how did it differ or not from the Polish case and why? Uh, of course, when you think about history of migrations, 
you will necessarily study history of exchange of resources, transnational networks, trans transnational connections, transnationality runs here through all these papers. Uh, so you might want to consider who, what actors, and in what ways affected the activities in both contexts, France and Poland. Uh, to what extent Jewish philanthropic centers in the US, um, Jewish leadership in Palestine, in Poland and France, how they affected day-to-day -day activities, resources and priorities of Hayas. You can look at the language of correspondence with a government, right? And, and see what kind of rhetoric, what kind of language they use to, to get the best possible outcomes. Uh, it b in both contexts, right? The French and Polish before the war and after the war. So this is something that I really look forward to seeing develop, uh, develop further. Thank you very much, Samir. And Dikla, I'm completely ignorant, of course, and I, <laughs> in, uh, in that theory, so I won't even pretend, you know. So I'm, I will comment as a historian. And uh, again, to come back to our theme of rapture and continuity, uh, we historians are very preoccupied with change over time. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, uh, how useful do you think your method can be to illuminate rapture and continuity in this particular history? What can you see that historical narrative will miss, right? Will obscure? What do we have to gain from your method? Because, of course, historians have been quite aware of um, this overlap of social, religious, and educational functions of Jewish institutions under Nazis. But I think that you have something more here uh, to tell us, to teach us. So that's one. Uh, second, uh, historians are also preoccupied with context, of course, and particularity. So I'm thinking, uh, to what extent your work about Jewish networks um, will change our ways of thinking, for example, about the Warsaw Ghetto, which starts later in the fall 1940, but when you move in time, what do we learn, for example, about porous, uh, porous borders of ghetto? I, I think your, your research can teach us a lot, uh, some, maybe something new about ghettos like Warsaw and Kraków. And finally, and this is the last comment, um, transnational dimension again, uh, Poland, Palestine, Latvia. Uh, so you, in this presentation, you focus on actors, uh, major actors, major power brokers. But in your introduction to theory, you also spoke about social capital, right? Network as social capital as cultural capital. So I would like you maybe to expand on uh, how did uh, <laughs> how uh, how that culture and social capital was was exchanged through these actors? Maybe if you could um, co you could connect actors to that uh, to that theory. So again, thank you so much uh, for this. And we will Should take a few minutes and and then uh, questions. Uh, thank you so much for the comments. Um, just thinking about all of them, I, uh, I get anxiety, but uh, <laughs> but they are they are nonetheless beneficial because you're right. All of these aspects are somehow uh, involved in my project, and I think the hardest part for me is actually to not miss something. <laughs> So not miss the, the what role did women play? What, what is happening? What is, what is the change that happened after World War I? And um, the positivists are in the back of my mind. Um, what's happening in Western Europe? So it's, it's, um, it's immensely difficult to make sure to not miss something uh, that perhaps could make the story richer. Uh, but of course, I will for sure miss something. Anyways, in this, uh, in this short response, um, maybe I will talk a little bit about the rupture and continuity that I'm, that I'm seeing when we, when we pass the uh, World War I threshold. So the continuity is that um, the Colonia Letnie, and once again, I'm, I'm studying only the Warsaw Colonia Letnie. 
these ones that uh, began in 1882. After the war, they changed their name into the Dr. Markiewicz Kolonie Letnie. And what happened is they still existed as a separate society, uh, but now they were one among an ocean of Kolonie Letnie, of these kinds of societies that developed literally almost everywhere. Every school, every workshop, um, every youth group, uh, all organizations had to have Kolonie Letnie. So again, I'm also realizing that, I, that my story is a micro story, micro history. Um, and while in the, in, in the imperial period, the Warsaw Kolonie Letnie Society was the main uh, institution of its kind, and it inspired Kolonie Letnie that were developing in the provinces in the kingdom, but also Galicia, um, and the Russian Empire itself, because the Warsaw Kolonie Letnie were the first ones organized uh, in the Russian Empire. Petersburg followed, and actually learned a lot from the Warsaw example. Uh, in any case, after the war, this, this society became one among many. And what one notices is that they constantly had to remind the public, which now the roles have changed. Before the war, it was really the public that was maintaining and sustaining this organization. After the war, the state takes over. Immediately, um, Immediately, the state organizes this Council of Colonial Letnia Affairs, that's in 1922, um, and they fall under uh, the Ministry of Labor and Social Services. So the state is immediately involved. And we notice that the public involvement, especially the philanthropic one, really, really declines. Um, and so in this ocean of Colonia Letnia, the Warsaw one is saying, remember us, we were the first ones. Every single one that you're seeing now is, is a replica of us. Please don't forget to donate uh, to our society. So that's one thing that, that really changed the nature of this institution. The other one, and here, I, I think I'll take a step back because one of the reasons why I, I became interested in the topic of Colonia Letnia is because I saw this, um, I saw it as a kind of, it, it inspired me, okay? I, I saw this as a territory where there was um, great Polish and Jewish cooperation and this is something that's uh, close, to my, <laughs> close to my heart. So I thought to myself, this is great and when I you know, did the initial research, um, I saw that this institution would go on past World War I into the Second Polish Republic. And before I dug deeply, I, I thought to myself, this would be this kind of ray of, of uh, sunshine in the growing kind of um, you know, anti-Semitism of the interwar period. Like I would study an institution that managed to preserve this cooperation despite everything that was going on. Um, and then I discovered a source which told me that actually um, this initial, um, this society that developed in the uh, imperial period, in the interwar period, ceased to be a Polish Jewish organization. And at that point, I thought to myself, this is the end of my project. Like, I don't know what to do with that. What I was hoping for um, clearly wasn't the case. So I, I began to, um, to lose hope in my project. But also, um, obviously, I'm still working on it, so I just, I just changed my way of thinking about what it, is, what it is that I'm doing. And so here, I'm trying to also really work on my interpretation of what precisely happened in the interwar period. Um, on the one hand, um, there is a visible change in how the leadership of this particular society, again, it's just this one, talks about uh, how it used to be and how it is now. So this comment of um, when this institution was founded, Dr. Markevich was surrounded um, by um, uh, cultured assimilationists who were patriotic and, and uh, you know, this kind of language. But now th this has changed and so therefore the institutions, now the, the two populations have to 
work separately. There is that language, which is extremely heartbreaking because it comes from a woman who worked both in the, in, in the imperial period, actually was extremely involved, and then became the president of the society after the war. So what happened in, in her mind, or how she uh, understood the institution pre and after the war, I don't know, and I don't think I, I ever will. Um, so, so, so that happened, but also, aside from this, this shift in the mentality and the thinking about what it is we're doing, I think also um, the institution gave, for example, Mihaufka, which was a, a specifically Jewish Colonia Letnia, to a new society, Colonia Letnia society, that was um, meant for, uh, for school children, uh, for school children um, uh, of the Jewish faith. And so we see that there's a new society that developed, and so they decided that it would only be appropriate if this Colonia Letnia, this building, this actual property that survived, would be given to them. So then now they could take care of their children. Um, so in a way, I'm not sure exactly to what extent it was this kind of, um, you know, Jewish organizations now also want to run Colonia Letnia for Jewish children, uh, whereas the Polish organizations will take care of their children, this kind of division. So I think there's two, two things going on here, and it isn't, uh, anti-Semitism will, uh, will not explain uh, this particular uh, rupture. Thank you. So, thank you, Anna, for your uh, comments. But uh, I think it's too early for me to, to answer your questions because, as you said, i just giving an outline of uh, Hayas. Uh, and this outline is part of my first chapter uh, about the Jewish migration from Poland to Israel in 1945, 1989. So, I started... Uh, three months ago, working on the Hayas archive here in uh, Jih. Uh, it's a huge archive, so it's a lot of, of work. Uh, to compare it with uh, Hayas in France, it's really, it's, it's in my plan to, to, to go to France and to visit the headquarters of uh, Hayas in uh, Paris. Uh, Haysam also, which uh, sponsors Jayas, has its own uh, headquarters in, in, in uh, Paris, so it's uh, it's more than my obligation to, to, to go there. Uh, in this, because in this step, uh, it's as I said, it's, it's too early to answer your question and to do to compare both Hayas uh, Poland and Hayas uh, France. But there, I think it's very very interesting to, to compare them and to know the similarity and uh, what's between them. It's, it's going the corporate, they know how it works t together. It's, it's it's a huge job, but I'm planning to 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 do this work as part of my PhD dissertation. Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. I'll I'll definitely talk about the methodology. Um, so I think what it so when I started doing it, I didn't really think that's what I'm gonna do. Um, I just covered um, basic conventions in the press. It looked boring to me. Uh, but then it started to be very interesting and attractive because of the names. So, um, and I immediately thought that social network analysis can provide the understanding about connection. So I think um, using the methodology of uh, social network analysis, historians can connect stories. Because what I hear in these two days is stories, many, many stories. Um, and I think that the potential of this methodology is to connect and look at the meso and macro levels, uh, which is what I'm trying to do. So I'm trying to, to see what's going on. What's the structure? What's the leadership? How the leadership looks like? Um, is there a development? Are, what are the changes? Uh, what are the changes over time? Who plays a role? And when I talk about brokers, and I'll, I'll touch, about, uh, I'll touch uh, upon theory, I use social capital to define the brokerage, the position within the network. And this position within the network allows the individual to control, to control access either to, to block it or facilitate. 
Um, and this, this is the most important thing about these key actors, these key leaders, because they are the gate for information. They are the gate for connections, for a wider connection in other parts of the network. So there are isolated pockets in the networks, in the network, and these brokers have the ability to connect those uh, modular pockets. So um, I think that what it tells, um, so I ran the analysis for Basie Yakov and then I started at it about four months, five months, I looked at it and I was like, I don't know, I don't know what's going on. I need to, of course, talk to many, many people. Um, and then I realized that there is a story that um, we tell about Bess Yaakov, but there are people that didn't look that central and didn't look that significant, and they're possibly very significant. Um, same for organizations and same for relationships between organizations. We tend to think that, yes, of course, educational networks might overlap or connect, but no, there is a social service element to this. What, what about that? So what is the role? Um, and what, what uh, role organizations play in brokering um, connections? So, for example, look at Beis Yaakov. During the war, they basically immediately jump into social services. They immediately run soup kitchens. They are mentioned in soup kitchens. So I, I think this, this t kind of gives another layer to the stories and also validates some of them. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, let's open to the, uh, yeah. Yes, thank you for, again, three fascinating papers. I have one, uh, one uh, a question uh, to Carolina. Uh, can't resist the temptation to speak and think about the uh, Kores for Polskie. Uh, very dear to my heart. Um, a, a very, very simple question. Um, 1905. I mean, in my uh, in my understanding of the archival sources, this is the ma first major watershed in the emergence of a separate structure of social services, educational institutions, charities, and so on. Jews and non-Jews separate separating ways and explicitly so on the basis of the new Russian legislation on charitable and voluntary associations. So how does 1905 impact on the school Um That's a wonderful question, thank you. And I actually couldn't wait to get to reading the reports for that 1905 uh, period. Um, and to my great surprise, business as usual. Nothing has changed. Um, there was mention of, okay, there's commotion in the city, but the number of children s sent to the countryside is more or less the same. It always fluctu fluctuated a bit due to funds, um, but for the most part, nothing has changed. And also, again, both Polish and Jewish, uh, both Christian and Jewish children were sent to the countryside. Um, and the moments of crisis, because this is also interesting that you bring it up, sorry for expanding on this a bit, also 1904, 1914, right, when the war starts, I also assumed World War I would be this moment where uh, the, the, this institution ceases to exist. Uh, no, actually, it almost, um, not only does it not cease to exist, it also uh, adjust in such a fascinating way, creating kind of new ideas for how Colonia Letnia can be further developed um, so that they could accommodate more children, especially in this moment of crisis, crisis when we have more children who need this uh, kind of help precisely. So there were ideas of organizing what were called the half Colonia Letnia. Um, which simply meant that children would not be sent to the countryside, but we would find spaces, any green spaces in the city where we could accommodate them for like a, you know, one day, and then they return the next day, you know, morning till evening, they get two nutritious meals, they play, uh, games run around, etc., cetera, um, and more children would be able to benefit from that. But in terms of 1905, nothing has changed. It's almost as if the crisis hasn't touched the, the institution, yeah? Um, I have a question for Dikla, and I, I apologize if perhaps you already, you touched on this and I, I missed it, or maybe this is a klotz, Kasha, I don't know. 
Um, but I'm interested if you have used your data visualization and mapping to look at how gender influences these networks. I mean, it seems obvious, right? It's based Yaakov, but it's not so obvious, right? That, that's, that's a good comment. Um, well, yes, key leadership, the top workers are, are men. The leadership is not of women. Um, so, when we anal so if I'm trying to kind of isolate the, the dimensions for women in the network, so we see Sarah Schneer, who is kind of mentioned by almost everyone, so is very much central as the founder, and she is also mentioned as a legacy, not as someone who is actually acting, doing stuff. So she is mentioned. Um, as a founder, she's mentioned as someone who was a tradition. Um, and then we see other women that are teachers. They are not managers, they are not considered leaders, they are not doing anything that is administrative. Um, we see, uh, for example, in Israel, we see Pesia Shorshevska, who was a Holocaust survivor. And she was also kind of, I would say, the most central woman in Israel. She was uh, uh, speaking in public places, uh, telling her story, and she was al always mentioned as the base Yaakov teacher. There is Adassa Landsberg, um, who else? Rivka Horvitz is mentioned also. Um, but we don't see too many women in the network, and sometimes they are the wife of. Um, so this is an, a totally different question about what's going on with the women, women in, in the network. Um, and also during the war, the, there is also something that I think I should talk about, but I really didn't delve into it. So I can tell you that men are running the base Yaakov. Thank you, everyone. Um, Carolina, I wonder about um, your paper a little bit. I, I know uh, a little about the summer colonies in the Galician context. And um, I wonder if you can compare it a little bit to make your case clearer. Um, because you stress a lot about how uh, colonial let near the space of cooperation, right? And in the context of Galicia and Krakow specifically and other places, um, in the 1860s and 70s, the idea emerged because Jewish children were not invited or not allowed to participate in uh, the regular summer, uh, summer um, camps. So the idea was to create a, a, an alternative, basically. And Rapka and Franklova and all these initiatives are just to basically provide the same opportunity. So number one, I wonder if that's true for the Warsaw context or not. Uh, and whether or not Warsaw is exceptional, or you know, we, we see the context of Galicia very different. So number one, and number two, um, the nature of this cooperation. I would like to probe a little bit more. So, is it really a cooperation, or is it one-sided? That is, are these Jewish organizations that simply invite uh, Christian children, let's say Hippolyte Pavelberg or Madam Sanatorium or so many of those run by Kodchak, for instance, these are basically Jewish organizations that invite various non-Jewish kids. You know, Madam, in, for instance, they are uh, children of minors from Silesia and Sosnovitz, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, is this an actual cooperation or sort of there is this asymmetry of just making more space and allowing um, the non-Jewish children to participate. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your questions. I, um, yeah, they're, they're both very, very crucial here. Um, and to respond to your first question, the reason why I was attracted to the um, Warsaw Colonial Ethnia Society is precisely because it was different from the ones that you mentioned, like in Galicia, also Wuj, which is also Congress Kingdom, had separate such uh, societies for um, Jewish children and then Polish children. So I found the Warsaw story to be most attractive to me because I was interested in 
in this space as a space really for both Christian and uh, Jewish children. Um, in terms of was this cooperation real or not, and trust me, I constantly, <laughs> I constantly ask myself that because I don't want to create also this image of like this ideal organization where now Jews and Poles hold hands and Polish and Jewish children run in the, you know, in the meadow together because that's not the point. But the cooperation was real and I will, I will stress that and I will always defend that. Um, this institution would not have been what it had become, the successful uh, institution that survived the war had it not been for this cooperation. And uh, Christian as well as Jewish representatives, first of all, sat on the committee. Uh, and this trans, you know, it, this went through World War I and also uh, into the Second Polish Republic. This never changed. The committee had members uh, from both um, religious groups. Uh, aside from that, like I said, um, Jewish and Polish children would be sent together to certain locations like Leszno and Czechocinek, and this was uh, the specific wish of the donors. So Berson said, this is how we're going to run this Kolonia Letnia. And the organizers of the, um, of the Kolonia Letnia said, yes, of course, let's do it. The same with Czechocinek. And for a long time, Czechocinek was the only curative Kolonia Letnia that existed um, for Warsaw. So in this case, even more so, the desire was to send both Christian and Jewish children. And this was also the wish of the founder of the Kolonia and by the way, both of those continued, this is a fascinating little side, side point to the story, both of these Kolonia Letnie, the ones that catered to both Polish, mm, Christian and Jewish children at the same time, they survived the war and they emerged as a separate society uh, for um, Christian and Jewish children, or as they were called, Polish children without difference of, of faith. Sorry, my, my translation I think is kind of, uh, kind of bad here, but the emphasis was these are Polish children regardless of what faith they were. Um, so I, I don't know if this if this answers your question completely, but I could of course present even further examples of a real cooperation and kind of dialogue. Also, we we have reports, and that's the thing. No one has read these reports, and so it's it's hard sometimes to believe. But um, the conversations that are being held, we have minutes of of, of these meetings. Um, the conversations, the exchange uh, is there on paper, um, and it's really both sides that are putting uh, pu putting energies into the project. It is it is a common project. We continue those in the yeah. break. <laughs> Thank you so much for a wonderful panel.
Oh. Welcome on the last session of this excellent conference. My name is Andrzej Zbikowski. It's a great honor to be a, a chair of this conference. We talk about a lot of issues of Jewish history, and now we will, my guest will talk about our resources, our departments, our sources, archival uh, photos, and so on, so on. So, uh, to be in time, I started with Marzena Zawanowska, who will talk about liberal, uh, library. Please, the floor is yours. Does it work? Yeah. Okay. Uh, may I? Oh, great. Um, hello, good afternoon. I'm very happy to open the session and tell you, to tell you about our library. Um, I am the curator of the manuscripts and collection and I have prepared this presentation together with my colleague and friend who is not with us, the curator of the old print collection. So my presentation will be devoted to this special collections mostly and not the library as a whole. But to begin with, I just would like to give you some details of our library, which is the largest and oldest post-war Jewish library in Poland. It continues the tradition of uh, which was here before the war, and we are, you know, we are continuing this tradition despite that the collection, actually it's not the same collection, uh, it has a very stormy history, but I will not um, discuss it now. I could have provided you with all the details about the number of books and old prints and manuscripts, which is certainly fascinating, but instead, I would like to take you into a journey through the collection, giving you several examples of our most precious or most interesting, uh, interesting pieces. So I will move directly to this part of my presentation. And if you are interested in specific uh, data about the number of books or periodicals or manuscripts, I can give it afterwards. Um, the examples are chosen so that, they reflected, so that they reflected both the old prints and manuscripts, and sometimes both at the same time. You will see the examples of handwritten comments on old prints and, and uh, yeah, fascinating examples. And they are, with them are related exciting stories. So I will tell you stories I've heard in the previous sessions that you like listening to stories. So I will give you some more stories. The first story brings us, one moment, the first story brings us to the 16th century Venice and uh, to the time when, uh, when Giustiniani published books, printed books, it was a well-established uh, printing house in Venice. And one day, Me Meir Katzenelenbogen, who is known as Maharam of Padua, approached him and wanted to publish Mishneh Torah by Rambam with his comments. And they couldn't reach an agreement, and finally the author moved away from this printing house and went to newly established Bragadini publishing house. And they reached an agreement and published the work, the Mishneh Torah with comments, but uh, then Giustiniani thought that it was a bad deal and that he lost. Um, uh, not reaching an agreement with the author. So he decided to print the same book as he had a copy already, so he printed it illegally. Of course, of course the Maharam of Padua, the author of the, of the commentary, was not very happy with this and turned to Moses Israelis of Krakow uh, for support. And Moses Israelis decided to issue a cherem, um, to excommunicate everyone who buys a Giustiniani illegal copies of this book. Then Giustiniani wasn't very happy and wondered what to do and he decided, and he did a very uh, bad mistake because he decided to turn to the Christian authorities. And as history tells us, turning to Christian authorities for Jews, it's always a bad uh, decision. We know it from the Frankist histories, history and other examples we may bring. Anyhow, Giustiniani turned to Pope and then Pope realized that there are Hebrew books being printed in Italy and that it's not a good thing because they are, they are not under the censorship of, uh, of a Pope, of the Christians. So he decided uh, to install censorship 
over Hebrew books. And the result of the censorship you may see in this uh, edition, which, which is stored in our um, in li library uh, of Maimonides' Mishneh Torah, where we have handwritten, and this is the manuscript part of this old print, when we, when we have handwritten inscriptions of the censors, of the pope's, pope censors. So the first one which you can read is Revisus per me, Laurentio Frangelli, uh, 1575. The second is Revisto et Corretto per me, and it's signed Fra Luigi da Bologna, uh, 1599. And the third one is just the name Camillo Jagel. 1613. So we have a direct result of involving Christian authorities into Hebrew uh, printing um, business. And you can see in the copy that is stored in our collection, you can see the censors' um, marks put on the Mishneh Torah and on the commentary. Um, so it's a very precious and I think interesting copy with a very, very interesting story. Second story. Second story, it's about Bible translation. It will not have this handwritten aspect, this manuscript component, but it's still very close to my heart because I deal a lot in my research with the Bible, with Bible commentaries, but with the Bible too. And this particular Bible is a Bible in Yiddish. Um, we move now to Amsterdam, to the 17th century, so we, we move 100 years later. We are in Amsterdam when um, a Jewish publisher, Josef or Joseph Atias, comes with an idea together with uh, Uri Faivu Shalevi to publish a Bible in Yiddish. They both think it is a really good business because the Bible is very, um, it's a book that everyone should read and uh, Yiddish is a language that every Ashkenazi Jew knows. So they thought it would be a great business. The problem is that when you have two Jews, you have two synagogues and they don't always go along together, so they quarreled and they, both of them decided to publish separately Yiddish translations of the Bible. And the result is that in the same year, uh, 1679, two editions of Yiddish Bible appeared uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, actually, it was, it was uh, addressed to Polish Jews. Why? To not let you have a nice schlafstunde, let me ask you why Polish Jews printed their Bibles and their books in Amsterdam in the 17th century. Any ideas? Now I'm asking questions, this is really nice. <laughs> Next you will be able to ask me questions, but for a moment, let me ask you. Uh, in Poland, it was forbidden to print Hebrew books at the time. Why? Who forbade? Another question. Don't be shy. Later you will take a revenge and ask me questions. Uh, it was forbidden by Vat Arba Ratzot, the Jewish authorities, because they were afraid of a sabbatical, of a sabbat, sabbatian uh, heresy. So they didn't want, uh, after, Initially, they decided that every Hebrew book should have a haskama, the rabbinic approval, but then the Jewish printing houses in Poland didn't actually get approvals for the books, so they realized that the only way to stop the Sabbatean ideas is to forbid every, any Hebrew print in Poland. So, Polish Jews printed books in Amsterdam, and this was a Bible translation uh, destined, or whatever, to, the, to Polish Jews. And as I said, there were two publications at the same time of, of, of Yiddish Bible translation. And also, they had enormous um, production runs, about 6,000 copies each, which is incredible. And this appeared to be a very, very bad decision because no Polish Jews or no Ashkenazi Jews wanted to have a Bible in Yiddish because they read Hebrew. And the Jewish good Ashkenazi women had their Tzene Urene, which is much better for women because it does not contain all the problematic descriptions that you have plenty of them in the scripture of violence and whatever, sex, etc. So, uh, so it was a disaster. And as a result of this disaster, uh, Uri Tzvi uh, Feibusch collapsed, I mean his printing house collapsed and he moved to Poland, Polish king invited him to Żukiew and he started printing books in Poland, which is actually good. And the other um, guy, Joseph Atias, if I may use colloquial speech, um, just survived, his printing house survived, and after a number of years, about 10, his son, Emmanuel, uh, tried to resell these copies. And now, can I have it? 
And uh, the first page of both editions seems pretty uh, identical. The only difference is that you have a different chronogram where you have the date of publication. But actually, the chronogram is the same quotation from Deuteronomy, uh, but different letters are marked. So on the left, you have the original edition from 6079, and on the right side, you have a second edition by son uh, of Atias, Emmanuel Atias, from 6087. Um, yeah, if you wish to see the chronogram, this is the chronogram, and you may see this is the same uh, passage from Deuteronomy. Tavota le Rosh Yosef, just different letters are marked to indicate the date. And until now, uh, there are plenty of a second edition copies in the world, but until now, uh, only one copy of the first original edition has been known until we found in our collection uh, an, another copy of this first original edition, of this collapsed edition, of this problematic edition of this book. So this is uh, the second treasure and the second story. And the third story, uh, it's related to a number of great figures in Jewish history. And this is actually a manuscript with some addition of old prints, so it's again this combination, and we move to the 18th century. Uh, antif century Galicia. This is the edition of a 12th century treatise, uh, Sefer Kuzari, or more exactly Kitab Arad, which is an Arabic title of Yehuda Halevi um, Opus Magnum, uh, translated in the same century, 12th century, into Hebrew by Ibn Tibon, and in this way it functioned in, in Jewish world for centuries. And it was translated into non-Jewish uh, language for the first time, yes, this is, uh, for the first time in the 17th century by Buxtov the Younger. So he published his translation together with the original, which you, you have here. Yeah, the, the, um, it's not original, it's a Ibn Tibon translation of Sefer Kuzari with uh, Buxtov translation into Latin. And in our collection, we have a precious uh, manuscript, which includes not only this old print of Buxdorf uh, translation to Latin, but also handwritten commentaries, which are the commentaries uh, from the 18th century Israel of Zamosht, who gave lectures on the subjects and on the subject, and these lectures were written down by Moses Mendelssohn. So actually, in this manuscript, we have Yehuda Halevi. Ibn Tibon, Buxdorf, um, uh, Moses Mendelssohn, and Israel of Zamosht, all in one um, manuscript, which is a wonder, wonderful piece. Um, this, this is part one. The book of the Kuzari, as you may know, have five parts, and also this book was printed and commented in five different parts. So this is the first part. Now, this first part belonged to Sigmund Seligman, and he made a note on this manuscript, and this note we transcribed for you, uh, where he states that these uh, commentaries on the, on the margins were written by Moses Mendelssohn uh, himself, yeah? eigenhändig, yeah? geschrieben. He himself wrote these commentaries. And the owner of this first part also says that he does not know where the other, that he saw also the fifth part of the Kuzari somewhere in Berlin, and he does not know that where are the three remaining parts. So we have the first and the fifth part, we don't have a second, third, and fourth. So we know where is the second at least. Uh, I don't know about two other missings, because the second is also in our collection, and this is this one that you may see. So this was the third story and the first source. Now, if time permits, but I think I should not. Okay, two, three minutes. So I just wanted to say, to, to close our, um, our stories, I just wanted to tell you that we sometimes we have exhibitions which uh, try to show, show or demonstrate our treasures to the larger publics. And so far we had two exhibitions of old prints. Uh, in 2011 and 2016, and both exhibitions, from both exhibitions, uh, 
we have uh, two serious publications describing every piece uh, showed at the exhibition with all the stories, uh, sometimes fascinating stories of, of the old prints and occasionally manuscripts uh, presented at these exhibitions. Uh, and I think that's all, unless you would like to know some numbers about how many copies of manuscripts, old prints or other books we have in our possession. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course, the women first. Uh, the second will be Alicia Mroczkowska, who will speak about heritage documentation department and the other treasures of our archives. That is, that is correct. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the possibility to present uh, our department today. The Heritage Documentation Department is rather a new addition to the Jewish Historical Institute as it was established at the beginning of the 1990s. And uh, the idea behind it was to create a place where all the photographs scattered um, within the Institute um, of different provenance uh, would be gathered and worked on. However, there is a twist, of course, in the name, as you can imagine, for a photographic archive to be called Heritage Documentation. Well, this goes with the idea that uh, it was not supposed to be a historical archive that just closes the dates uh, on the day that the archive is created. It was supposed to keep on documenting Jewish heritage in Poland. And this, docu and this heritage was perceived as a process. And this process is the revival of Jewish life in Poland at that time. This is Polish-Jewish relations. This is anti-Semitism that uh, went on, any manifestations of it, and of course, documenting Jewish tangible heritage in Poland. Um, with these two ideas, we can imagine that the collections are quite diverse. So foremost, it is most important to present the documents and the photographs from the Shoah as they are, um, they come from the, simply from the Central Jewish Historical Commission, which of course the, um, this institute is the continuing the mission of. So from this collection, from this gathering of all these photos, we have incredible and very, very um, little known pictures that present ghettos from all over Poland, small ghettos even sometimes, and we can see in these photographs resettlement actions, uh, oppression, um, executions, uh, deportations, and something that is quite moving to us researchers, the Jews themselves who actually experienced all of this. This is very rare. Another very rare thing to see in these photographs is actually the spaces of the ghettos, as we do not have any other documentation, and this is an incredible source for study. A very large collection of uh, photographs from the time of the Shoah is from Łódź. This is over... Um, a thousand, even more, they are uh, now scanned and we are hoping that the whole process of digitization will be completed soon and we will share this with everyone. Of course, there are many from Krakow and to us uh, the dearest, as we have many specialists um, working in this area, is those of Warsaw. They are very diverse as uh, most of them are through the lens of the Nazi German soldiers and photographers, and they are simply propaganda photographs. They are those of the American Joint Distribution Committee, and as a part of the Ringelblum archive kept in the safe, there is a small part also of this through the lens of the Jews themselves, and, uh, and uh, they, are, they are a part of the most, of course, significant collection of our institute. These photographs are now by our colleague being studied um, also uh, to actually analyze all of these perspectives. So we are very anxious to see what will come out of these studies. Um, surprisingly, uh, we, surprisingly to those who turn to us, the smaller part of our collections is this one of pre-war. 
um, where it is not actually an orga unorganized picture um, presenting all of Poland, rather ch chosen chapters of a little bit of social life of Warsaw, religious life in different uh, smaller communities. Also, we do have um, little um, organizations in some towns, political parties. Also, um, an interesting collection here that goes beyond uh, the Second World War is those of portraits and images of prominent persons, uh, those who contributed to Polish and Jewish uh, life. And also, we do have some examples of religious life uh, from before the war. And now, the most grand part of our resources, this is, of course, the post-war Poland and photographs from that time. And this is divided into many, many categories. The one uh, research also at this moment is the post-war social life. And this is the attempts of rebuilding Jewish life in Poland. Um, some in organized albums, some uh, in individual photographs from Warsaw, from Lower Silesian region, showing uh, those who survived creating um, educational uh, institutions, political parties, uh, religious uh, holidays are being presented there. Uh, also um, orphans, um, also political uh, life, and this is the Jewish Labour Bund, which is both from pre-war and post-war uh, also being digitized and some of these collections are available already online. But a very interesting chapter is in, in, in this social life is the public events, commemorations and gatherings. The first gatherings commemorating the victims of the Shoah, the first commemorations from the um, Warsaw um, ghetto uprising. Also so showing us uh, post-war space uh, that we can see. Uh, also, this is the time uh, when a very good photographer, Julia Piro, uh, was active and she took very tragic um, pictures of uh, the victims of Kielce Pogrom, which we hold in our collections. And uh, as this social um, organizational life uh, deems uh, in the f upcoming decades uh, until the 1950s, 1960s, there is a kind of a shift in our collections as well, as even our institute initiated at the end of the 1950s, 1960s, um, transforming a little bit the definition of the monument into w what is a historical Jewish monument into a wider definition of Jewish heritage because of the Shoah, that anything that remains uh, is considered heritage. This is a, a, a quite uh, new for this time. And so they send out uh, very good photographers uh, out into Poland uh, to document cemeteries, synagogues, Jewish spaces, also a very interesting uh, collection of 5,000 photographs circa because they are very well done. These are good photographers. And this is the time when Poland was not reconstructed as such, especially the villages and small towns. So we can see just a little bit of the pre-war, what we can imagine looked like. And also we can see the first transformations, devastations of all of these uh, sites and places. This takes us into the actual documenting of the Jewish heritage. We have documented um, over 600 cemeteries, around 300 synagogues, date by date, la laid out in chronological order, so we can see the transformation of the change uh, that took place. We also have social life, any building that could be found. And uh, this was possible, first of all, due to, as I said, the field research, but also the field research of our team from the Institute, but uh, what happened in the 1990s, creating a whole networking collaboration with local activists and with uh, just people who were very much interested in Jewish culture and then actually went on to be excellent uh, scholars in Jewish studies. 
and they all contributed to creating practically a database of these places and uh, uh, also, for example, um, landmark preservation offices, but I think that the hats off mainly are to the local activists who send in their work, their inventory, throughout the years uh, showing us the change, which is now archived uh, in our room. Complementing this is uh, is a collection of documents. These documents are organized town by town. Um, they, they were uh, started to be collected, I would say, in the 1980s until, let's say, 2000, maybe 14, 15, when internet databases completely take over um, and also online resources are just year by year more and more available. But in each of these folders, there is a very interesting correspondence between, let's say, local activists or descendants of Jews from Poland to embassies, to um, ministries, to our institutes saying, what can we do? It's basically any kind of um, Jewish activism in a different town that could be documented, gathered, collected, um, cutouts from local newspapers, invitations to ceremonies, anything connected to, to this topic, some, some maps, not many, um, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, um, projects of commemorations. And uh, within all of this documenting, uh, it is very much worth mentioning three smaller projects this is uh, uh, this is uh, these are projects which are connected with creating a kind of a narrative, and one of them is treating uh, by us as researchers uh, the Matzeva, the Jewish tombstone, as a historical document. If the cemeteries and these uh, tangible heritage was destroyed, then of course uh, the photograph becomes that historical document, the photograph of a tombstone that is no longer standing. This is incredibly valuable because a tombstone has so much of the details about a person who is buried in a different uh, place. So recreating and transcribing and translating this data from the, these photographs, which are no longer st standing, is a very important so source these days for genealogy studies. Another one, another of these projects was initiated by late Jan Jagielski, the initiator of this uh, department as whole. And this is, um, as I would uh, call it, a project focusing on memory culture. This was an attempt to create a database of how memorials, monuments, commemorations changed over time. Uh, in Poland after the war, during communism, during the transformation and today. And this has been analyzed through, of course, the photographs and then closely with a magnifying glass uh, to the inscriptions written on, the, on these monuments and how the actually discourse and the narrative about talking and commemorating the victims of Shoah uh, has unfolded. Another um, project which was supposed to create a narrative of a changing urban space is that one of streets of Warsaw. Our department was on one of the first places that people came to, brought in pictures and analyzed how uh, Warsaw lands can be changed before the war, during, and then uh, some of you might know publications of contemporary photographs being uh, put on top of the old ones to actually see what what has changed. Uh, within this uh, small collection, we do have uh, even sometimes um, photocopies, anything that just could be an image of these, uh, these spaces. And uh, completing all of this and closing um, these puzzles are family collections. People have sent in their family photographs to the Jewish Historical Institute since uh, after the war, and I can gladly say uh, that even this is happening until today, that they share whole family histories with us. They were sent in either anonymously or um, uh, with whole family histories and testimonies of what happened, 
we are also um, making and creating an inventory of all of these uh, photographs and trying to recognize them because in quite a few cases they complete these stories of the local spaces where we only deal with the tangible heritage. So this is uh, some, something that is very interesting to us. This has also been done with the help of the genealogy department. And then the last but not least, even quite the opposite, is the category of unrecognized photographs. In the last decade or two, or even as the department was established, many of these photographs were unrecognized. They had signatures in Yiddish, Russian, and in many other languages that had to be translated, but also simply figure out history. It is different to read about it, but then to actually see this person on a photograph and to figure out who this person is, what, it, what is happening in this photograph, what are the places and spaces and sites that we can, uh, that we can see in the photograph. This is something that our team is working on right now and we hope to complete it sooner than later. Um, and hopefully we will then be able to say and invite you already to a complete collection of over 100,000 photographs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now is the time for the first Michał. We have a small problem to Michał's. Dwa Michały. Michał Czajka will uh, speak about our archive. Good afternoon, everybody. I work in the archive of the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, and I prepared a short speech about the archive, unfortunately without pictures. The Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw it continues the works of the Central Jewish Historical Commission, created in 1944 in Lublin as a department of the Central Committee of the Jews in Poland. The Historical Commission was very soon transferred to Łódź, and in 1947, it was reorganized and renamed as Institute. In the same time, it was transferred to Warsaw to the building of the pre-war main Judaic library where it finds itself to this day. The most important record group stored in the archive of the Jewish Historical Institute became the collection found in the ruins of Warsaw, a clandestine Warsaw ghetto archive known as Ringelblum Archive. In 1940, Emanuel Ringelblum, historian, activist of the left-wing Zionist movement, initiated collecting of documents in Warsaw Ghetto. He managed to gather the group of about 50 persons belonging to various currents of Jewish political and social life. They formed the clandestine group known as Onek Shabbat. The purpose of Onek Shabbat was to gather the documents and the individual testimonies about the life in the Warsaw Ghetto as well as in other parts of occupied Poland, in ghettos and labor camps. The members of Onek Shabbat recorded information they received from refugees and persons transferred from other localities to Warsaw Ghetto. The Ringelblum collection contains also documents of Warsaw Judenrat, issues of the official and underground press, German posters, poetry, photographs, postcards, ration cards, and other documents of daily life. The main purpose of collecting the documents was to provide sources for the study of Jewish society in Warsaw, ghetto, by contemporary and future historians. The parallel purpose of the collection was to gather evidence about the German crimes for future prosecution. The first part of the ghetto archive, put into 10 iron boxes, was hidden beneath the basement of the school at Novolipki Street during the Great Deportation in September 1942. The second part, in the same place, in two large milk containers in February 1943. The people responsible for hiding the documents were the teacher Israel Lichtenstein and his students Nahum Grzywacz and David Gruber. They perished and the only person knowing the localization of the archive became the member of Onek Shabbat, Hans Hirschwasser. 
The first part of the archive was unearthed in September 1946. The boxes turned out to be leaky, some documents soaked up with water and required careful maintenance. We do not know why the second part of the archive, buried in the same basement, was not unearthed at that time. It was not until December 1950, when the construction of the new district on the ghetto ruins began, that the milk cans were discovered by the excavator. It was known that some documents were buried in April 43 at Shentoyerska Street. These documents were sometimes referred to as the third part of the Ringelblum archive, but were never found. The last effort was undertaken 20 years ago by Israeli researcher Uli Minsker, who obtained permission to dig up the garden of the China embassy at Shentoyerska Street, but to no avail. Not always the documents found underground were hidden deliberately. The collection of death certificates from Warsaw Ghetto was found in the ruins of Warsaw City Hall. The original death certificates issued by the doctors in Warsaw Ghetto were destroyed in 1943 together with all the archive of Warsaw Judenrat. However, Judenrat was obliged to send a copy of each document to the Warsaw City Hall to the Office of Common Records, and this office also was burned down during the Warsaw Uprising in 1944. So about 90% of death certificates from Warsaw was destroyed. About 10,000 cards were saved. From the very beginning, the Historical Commission made efforts to gather all available documents concerning the history of Jews in Poland, especially their last tragic period. The Commission's employees transferred to Warsaw from Kraków the files of the Kraków pre-war Jewish community and wartime Judenrat. From Kraków, they brought also the documentation of social organization operating during the occupation in the, the Jewish self-help and joint. The self-help operated in all the ghettos of the general government and its documents give us an insight into the situation in about 500 localities. We do not know under which circumstances the Central Jewish Historical Commission selected the documents of German authorities in Krakow, namely the German mayor of the city, Stadthauptmann, concerning the Jewish population, excluded it from the state archive and transferred to Warsaw. In Lower Silesia, Jewish documents confiscated by the Germans and later abandoned by them were found. In the Jewish cemetery in Wroclaw, there were found the files of Jewish communities of Wroclaw, of Silesia, known as Province Schlesien, and Greater Poland, known as Province Posen. And in, at the railway station in Kłodzko, there were found the fragments of documentation of Jewish communities of Berlin, Vienna, and Prague. Another important record group concerning the Second World War is the collection of 7,196 testimonies. The Jewish Historical Commission began to write down the testimonies of survivors immediately after the creation in 1944 in Lublin. The authors of the testimonies the monies were telling about their personal experiences in ghettos, in hiding, and in labor camps. Other testimonies contained surveys of events in various localities during the war. The official name of the record group is Holocaust Survivors Testimonies, and it was intended to contain the Jewish testimonies, but later part of the collection consists in large extent of the testimonies deposed by Poles who were giving help to the Jews during the Nazi occupation. Such stories are usually certified by Jewish survivors. The next record group is the collection of memoirs. This record group consists of one of 347 items. Major part of the collection consists of Polish texts 
but we have also 74 Yiddish memoirs and 26 in other languages. 39 memoirs are handwritten originals made in ghettos or in hiding. Further 50 wartime men memoirs are stored in our archive as typewritten copies. The rest of the record group consists of the memoirs written after the war. In 1950, the Central Committee of Polish Jews was dissolved. The documentation of the committee was deposed in the Institute, as well as documentation of joint, Hayas, Ort, Jewish political parties and youth organizations, and other Jewish institutions which ceased their activity in Poland. As you see, the major part of the archive collections was assembled here till 1950. From then on, the main task of the Institute's archivists consisted in organizing these documents and drawing up inventories. The Institute still collected the testimonies till 1995 and memoirs. It collected also personal papers of various Jewish personalities. The most important of them are the collections of former directors of the Institute, historians, Bermark and Shimon Datner. The Institute received also some documents of the Jewish community in Warsaw and of the Jewish Social and Cultural Society. Documents of the Jewish Historical Institute itself are the important and still growing collection. The collections of our Institute are used for scientific research, but also in various types of legal proceedings. We were asked to check information about various people in order to confirm the right to inheritance, to compensation for people persecuted by the Nazis, or to Polish citizenship. The register of the Holocaust survivors, prepared after the war by the Central Committee of Jews in Poland, is particularly useful for documentation purposes. From 1946, the Jewish survivors registered themselves in local Jewish committees, and from there, lists of people were sent to Warsaw and included into the central file. Registration was voluntary. In addition, only persons staying in Poland were in principle registered. Thus, the lack of a person on the survivor list doesn't not mean that the person did not survive the war. The main catalog has more than 200,000 cards with the proviso that many people have registered several times in different committees moving from town to town, so there are more cards than people. At the end, a few words about the availability of materials in our archive. In general, all wartime documents are digitized and accessible on our computers. Some of the documents are also available online on the websites belonging to our institute, which are called Centralna Biblioteka Judaistyczna, Central Judaic Library, on, in short, CBJ, and the second website named DELET. The digitization is ongoing and the Sebeyot content is constantly growing. Currently, the Sebeyot houses the entire Ringelblum archive, documents of the Jewish community in Wrocław, death cards from the Warsaw Ghetto, as well as a number of smaller record groups. The Delet website contains chosen documents from Ringelblum archive, and part of the testimonies collection. Thank you. So, that's all for today. Thank you. If you have any questions, I can answer them later after this part of the Thank you, Michal. Uh, last but not least, of course, Michal Krasicki will talk about uh, art department. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Well, for me, it's a newly debut uh, public, so um, I hope it will 
be okay. Yes, uh, I will show you uh, a kind of a teaser. Uh, it's, it's a presentation that shows some of the works that you can find uh, in our collections, uh, in our museum collection. And uh, it will just go. Uh, I won't speak, uh, it won't be synchronized, okay. I think it should work. Yes, it, it works. So uh, uh, I'm the head of the art department and the curator, and in our department works for other people. Uh, we, all, we all are, except me, art historians and uh, curators. So uh, it's a very um, a special place and stuff because uh, we, at the same time, uh, take care of, uh, of the collections, which I will be speaking about in a minute, and we organize exhibitions. You can see the, uh, you, perhaps you have seen the permanent exhibition on the first floor, there's also a small exhibition showing the Judaica as, as a kind of a synagogue exhibition, and now we are preparing uh, the, ex uh, the exhibitions, uh, the exhibition, temporary exhibition about Mitzvah Weyman, which will be open tomorrow in the evening. And uh, we open about two, now two uh, temporary exhibitions a year, uh, mostly. Uh, we are trying to, to divide it uh, and to make an art um, exhibitions and historical exhibitions at the same time. I mean, at, the, at one year. Uh, we are now the art department. Uh, but uh, mm, it was time when, uh, when it was a museum here in the Jewish Historical Institute and um, it was opened in 1948 uh, but the collections were gathered since 1944 by a Jewish Historical Committee and uh, uh, Central Committee of Jews in Poland. Uh, both institutions were I mean, the Central Committee of Jews, of Polish Jews, uh, were created in 1944, and the, commit, uh, the commission was part of it. And um, except the uh, historical commission, there was also uh, the institution, a smaller institution inside the Central Committee called. Uh, uh, it's always. Uh, I, I remember it's a Jewish association of for the promotion of uh, fine arts, and it was a revival of the institution that that uh, has been um, active before the war. And this uh, this uh, sec third uh, organization is important because uh, the head, the chair of this association, was Yusuf Sandel who was the main initiate, uh, how to say it, uh, someone who initiated the, um, the effort to collect uh, the artworks from before the war and also from the time of war, which was much more difficult, of course. And uh, he, it's him, really, who created the core of our art uh, collection. And... Uh, mm, Maybe I will say something about the, the whole collections. They are um, it, they consist of about fifty thousand objects, and they are um, divided in four groups. We can say it's uh, first it's uh, work art, works of art, then it's historical objects, memorabilia, Judaica, and uh, the fourth is Berliner collection. You won't see anything in the presentation uh, because. It's not there. Uh, so I will speak a bit about all of these um, uh, groups, uh, collections, but it will be only a, a frame, yes? So if you, very simple. If So if you have any questions, uh, you're welcome to ask me them later. Uh, what is important, uh, mm, the whole collection is the most important Jewish uh, public collection, collection in Poland and uh, not only because of its value but also of its diversity. 
uh, as um, as for the works of art, the art collection is considered to be the second most important collection of modern art by Polish Jews in the world, next to the Israeli Museum of Art in Ein Harod. Uh, it contains a rich variety of works uh, by more than 230 artists, mostly of Jewish but also Polish origin, born, educated or working uh, in Poland, Germany and Austria uh, since, I would say, um, um, second half of the 19th century. Um, it includes, of course, all kinds of paintings, drawings, graphics and sculptures. Uh, this presentation doesn't uh, really show the uh, the richness of the collection, of the art collection, uh, it's only, there are some, uh, some bits of, only of it. Um, mm, so what we have in the art collection, uh, we hold rare artifacts from the time of war, from the ghettos, of course, uh, but also from the so-called Aryan side, uh, mainly in Warsaw, Łódź, Białystok, Kraków and Vilna. Uh, maybe it's not too much because we have, I, I don't know, uh, maybe uh, 20 uh, names of artists, but still this is, uh, this is something very unique. You won't find it anywhere in, in Poland or, or even outside, uh, outside the Poland. Um, this is, of course, because of the ghettos were destroyed, yes. The, the very good um, example is the Warsaw uh, ghetto. Uh, we have drawings of Vito Levinson, for example, from inside. Uh, he, he didn't survive. Uh, but they are, you can see, see them here, but they are about 20, 25 uh, small drawings on a very, um, very badly preserved paper, uh, so there are very rare, rare things. Uh, the, the, the biggest collection inside this uh, um, wartime collection, uh, these are the works from the Łódź ghetto. And the Łódź ghetto is, is the, how to say it, uh, uh, it was the place where the um, historical committee, uh, commission was working for, for several years, since 1945, I think, to 1947, uh, before it was uh, it was uh, changed into the Jewish Historical Institute. So they 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 did collected a lot of things that left in the ghetto, uh, which ghetto was not destroyed. And uh, we have, for example, drawings and even paintings by, um, by Israel Lazerowicz, Juliusz Podeszwa, uh, Mark Schwartz, Szymon Sherman. There is a lot of names uh, of artists which are now not very well known or, or unknown at all. Uh, we have also in, uh, in our memorabilia collection uh, the albums made in the uh, Wuj Ghetto workshops, where uh, inside you, you can find uh, drawings and, uh, and uh, watercolors by Jewish artists, not only from Poland. Uh, mm, but coming back to the, work, to the, mm, to the art collection, uh, apart from that, uh, the, the core of the uh, collection is the interwar art, and we have lots, lots and lots of art of the time, uh, mainly, uh, mainly uh, different kind of paintings, oil paintings, uh, aquarels, pastels, and, um, and graphics, of course. Some of them also rare and, uh, and beautiful. You, you know, there are many artists in this collection that are not known or known but only by specialists. And sometimes we have only three works of, of, of that person or, 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 or other. And uh, for us it's, it's something very, uh, very moving and uh, special 
to to have this conscience in mind that maybe uh, some artists exist only in our collection. Um, You had here, uh, for, from this interwar period, some, you see here some uh, examples, Glitzenstein, Bruno Schulz, we have six drawings of the very well-known uh, writer, Polish. Uh, Menasch and Efrain Zeidenbeutel, we have, I think, more than a dozen of oils by them, Adolf Messer. Artur Markowicz is a huge collection of uh, pastels and drawings. Maurice Drembach, quite, uh, quite a big collection also. Samuel Hirschenberg, this is 19th century. Because from the 19th century, uh, we have also very small bits, uh, but very important, like Maurice Gottlieb uh, and his uh, brother Marcin and Leopold, which were, he was younger, but... Uh, in this in this very in this uh, 19th century collection, you can find also uh, Leopold Pilichowski, for example, uh, who's there. There is also Leopold Horowitz, Zygmunt Nadel. So that and this is also very very important part of uh, uh, of what we can show and what we mm, uh, we are ready to uh, also to research of. Um, a part of that also there is a early Jewish post-war art and some pieces of the contemporary art. Uh, not only Jewish but also Polish artists uh, trying to visualize their attitudes and their, um, their thoughts and visual imagination about the Holocaust. And, uh, the th uh, second and third, uh, I have a tendency to do um, to the digressions, so I will stick to the plan. Historical mem memorabilia. The second, uh, the second collection uh, is, as I told you before, it's uh, mainly focused on the Wood Ghetto. Uh, we have a lot of discriminatory armbands and badges of the Jewish police service. We have handmade albums, uh, which. I have told about. Uh, we have all kinds of souvenirs made by superiors, including uh, Mordechai Romkowski, of course. Uh, official stamps, badges, plaques uh, from Jewish offices and in institutions in the ghetto. Uh, okay. Objects, which is very interesting, objects made from Torah scroll uh, uh, parchment. And uh, we have, of course, ration cards, Jewish coins and banknotes, uh, uh, sometimes very, very unusual things. Uh, uh, apart from which ghetto, uh, you will find also the different discriminatory armbands and badge, uh, badges from other ghettos and concentration camps, and some m many also... Uh, objects uh, found uh, in that area in, in different in different towns that are completely destroyed or taken out of the uh, of the ground they are not always they, they don't always have the um, the archaeological status because they were uh, they were not even well uh, examined when they were t given to us. So we have, for example, a, a, ho a huge amount of objects which maybe are from Majdanek or maybe are from Belzec. If we, if we have uh, some notes or anything that, that is uh, attached to, to these objects, so we can sometimes say that maybe this is from there. Um, it is also a very moving part of of the of the collection, which was really nearly abandoned. Yes, and, um, I mean forgotten, and uh, everybody thought about you know the paintings and the Judaica and and so on, which are which were more important in some way. Um, Mm, from the Warsaw Ghetto, we of course have two milk cans and uh, three uh, metal box from the Ringelbaum archive, I mean, in which the documents and other things were hidden. 
and uh, uh, which is maybe also interesting. We have ar archaeological ex excavations from the from the Warsaw Ghetto terrain, from the uh, area of Chinese embassy, which Michał told about it, and also from the site where the Ringelboom Archive Memorial stands today at Novolipki Street. Uh, so um, it's also a part of, uh, of things that we do. Uh, Judaica. Um, this collection uh, contains the objects, I mean, you have seen here, it's, it's, it's I mean, I can say about uh, 500 objects. It's hard to say, really. Uh, um, from, of course, most of them are from the synagogues and uh, Jewish homes, but we very often don't know uh, where they belonged at the beginning, to whom, uh, which synagogue, uh, sometimes, if there is a trans, uh, um, inscription in Hebrew, uh, we we know that this was, for example, in this city or in that city, uh, made or uh, or uh, used or donated. Uh, but very often, we we are not sure. Yes, we know that, for example, a Torah scroll and the Torah shield was made by a Berliner. Um, uh, goldsmith, yes, but we don't know which synagogue it was kept and uh, used. Uh, so this is also why uh, Institute has uh, prepared the, this so-called synagogue exhibition, which shows different objects from the synagogue and uh, trying to, to find a new place, a new home for the objects that s s existed uh, once in in a, in in its uh, environment, natural ritual, and uh, and now they are in a way abandoned. So we wanted to to give them another life, to 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 say it, uh, to say the least. And uh, uh, they are from from the second half of the 18th century uh, to the end of the 20th century. So we have some very good fine pieces of uh, Torah um, shields, for example, from 18th century, uh, two parrots from 18th century, very, very rare and beautiful. And uh, we have also Torah scrolls. We have, uh, I think, eight Esther scrolls that are illustrated. Uh, some, one of them might be even from the 17th century. We are not uh, sure of that. Uh, but they are quite, um, they're quite beautiful, but sometimes a bit damaged. Um, of course, you will find here also Torah pointers, uh, Torah mantles, of course, uh, German Torah binders, uh, spice containers, etro containers, yurtzeit objects. Uh, we have a fine collection of yurtzeit uh, objects. Uh, in a shape of uh, Matseva, uh, which is now available on the website that Michal told you, the Central Judaic Library. Um, we have, of course, Otalits, Ataras, and many other things. Uh, the, the, the interesting thing might be also this, that we have a, a Sephardic collection, small, in our institute, and uh, these are the objects that were left by uh, Greek Jews uh, deported to Poland uh, by Germans and killed in the death camps. Auschwitz, uh, uh, Treblinka and Majdanek. We don't know which one, uh, where, where they died really. But this is also something quite uh, moving. Uh, the last uh, part of the collection is the Berliner collection. Uh, it is estimated at ex approximately 6,000 objects. It is an icono iconographic resource of the pre-war Jewish Museum in Berlin. It's, it is something rare. Uh, um, the objects, w the collection was transferred by Germans during the war to Kwatsko region. It's in Silesia. The they, uh, Germans had their uh, its uh, storehouse where they kept it, and after the war, it became uh, uh, a storehouse by uh, run by Polish government, 
and uh, um, yeah, uh, the the efforts from uh, they were made efforts from uh, our institute in the 50s, uh, early 50s, to to get everything that was possible from there to our institute, and this is why some of these things survived. Um, mm, the collection consists of a rich photographic documentation of Judaica, uh, Jewish artworks and architecture, mostly from the interwar period, engraving, engravings concerning Jewish ritual, rituals and uh, life from 16th to 20th century. So they are, some of them are very uh, old. Um, we have also some original drawings of different Jewish artists, mainly from the German-speaking region. Um, and also many other prints and illustrations from books. Most, most of them are fixed to the cardboards. So it's, we call it a kind of a documentation of the museum uh, in Berlin. But we have originals there, of course. And, um, and uh, we, we have a uh, couple of thousands also negatives. Uh, um, they are made in glass, yes. So maybe it will be enough for now. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. It, it gets very late. So if you have some few questions, please ask. Please. One moment, micro, because it's by YouTube. It's going by YouTube. So. OK. Thank you. I'll try not to make it long. Uh, there, I, I want to uh, just raise a comment to the department, uh, the library department. As I recall, there are hundreds of manuscripts from the 10th century to the 20th century that are missing, that disappeared. Now, they're all, many of them are listed. I was looking several weeks ago for a manuscript, a book which was written in the 12th century, and I posed the, this question to the library because there are only two manuscripts in the world, one in the Vatican, which has 60%, and a complete, complete one which is listed in the National Library of Israel that is under the Zhich and has a number. Library of Emmanuel Riggenblum, G Jewish Historical Institute, Warsaw, Manuscript 282. Now, it's not the first time I ask this, but I usually get this response. I get, I'm sorry to inform you that this particular document is no longer in our possession. Unfortunately, some of the manuscripts initially held by the Zhich Library had been missing for our collections for years, particularly as a result of the 1968 events. I think, I, I, my question is, do you have a list of the missing uh, manuscripts? And I believe that if not, looking at the National Library, and they have microfilms of everything, although the resolution is not a good one, that's why I, I, I wanted a good resolution, we can create a list like that. I think it will be important to start tracking and adding a couple of detective, I would say, uh, details, because I'm sure if the National Library got it before 68 or 40s or 50s, you never know where it disappeared, then Jih had it. And I'm sure somewhere here in the archive, there should be the letter, there was no email, a letter from the National Library. When did they come and do all those scans? And then if we have a list, we can start uh, dedicating, we're talking about hundreds of important manuscripts that some of them have no copy and were here and disappeared. So that's one uh, comment, is there a list like that? And if not, you think it, I hope it's not in private hands, but is there a chance finding those manuscripts? Now to the art uh, department, uh, we're, we're, we were on the building, uh, on just sitting this blue building on the great synagogue, which was blown. Up. Now, not many people know, and this can be good for uh, maybe, I mean, for building, a, a, for, the for the art collection here, I mean, for an exhibition, Judaic art exhibition, there were two menorahs, you've seen the picture, outside of the synagogue, and inside the synagogue there were two big Hanukkiot, I mean, a meter and a half, with the Polish eagle. Now, people usually think they disappeared. 
Now they did not disappear. We hold them in Herzl College in Jerusalem in a Hechal Shlomo Museum and we'll be very happy to lend them to one of the exhibition and bring them back to Zich. You know, for exactly as Zich lended one of the milk, uh, uh, what is it called, pots uh, to, 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 the, to the museum in Washington DC, we, 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 we lent one to Museum Beta Tfutzot, which changed his name now to Anu, but they exist and maybe bring them here can be also a moving uh, experience. Yeah, it's a very good, you touch a very good, a very interesting question, but it's very complicated. Maybe you, you could say something they about put that. Put the microphone love. back. Toda <laughs> Rabah. I will answer only shortly. We have, a, we don't have a real list. I have a list because I was checking what is there, what is not there, but we don't have a formal list just a handwritten you know, notes. But in a way you have a list because when you check the catalog online, you just don't have these numbers that are no longer in our possession. So if you checked our catalog and not the Jewish National Library, you will, you will know what is no longer here. And as to the story, you know, the history of this collection is very stormy. Sometimes it was used for political purposes. Sometimes Polish government was inviting political friends and letting them in the uh, magazines and letting them take what they wished. So it's very, you know, it's very difficult to track these texts. But somehow many of them that were scanned uh, disappeared. I don't want to say that there is a connection, but maybe it's just people realize that there are such a precious things to take from here. And I think some just disappeared after 68 when people were leaving Poland and they thought there would be no longer Jewish life in Poland, so they thought it was, it was the best way to preserve these treasures, but what happened with these manuscripts later on, I don't know. But a funny thing is that there is a um, paper from the, um, I don't want to, uh, 60s or 70s, I don't want to give an exact date, uh, about the most precious uh, manuscripts in our collection. And most of these precious possessions are no longer in our possession because probably someone with this paper came to the magazine and just took this precious text. Okay, uh, there, was, uh, there was a second part to your question? No. No, okay, thank you. Thank you. Maybe uh, someone would uh, ask. Uh, maybe Michael. Uh, it would be nice to show the Hanukkah. Uh, yeah. Hanukkah. No, that's uh, Hanukkah Menorah. Uh, in our uh, museum or exhibition, but it's al always a question of uh, what kind of exhibition <laughs> would it um, uh, would it? Yeah, we we are in, we are interested in all, all Judaica that comes from the synagogue because we have very we have only some some small things from the synagogue at all. We have one, uh, how to say it? From the cloakroom, you know, the number, yes, a small metal piece of, uh, of it. And we have two fragments of columns, which really, it's a, it's a piece of, of stone. It, you don't see really the art in it. So, uh, and, and some, some paper bits from the, uh, from the library uh, that was first in the synagogue and then transferred to the institute. So uh, it would be, for me, it would be really something to see them uh, in nature, even. Thank you. Someone else, or could I? Thanks, uh, thank you very much, my dear friends and I give uh, to Glenn the micro I think to invite our keynote or to uh, uh, we, we can ask two minutes break and we go to to keynote uh, speak thank you very much once more
Chyba można dać znać, żebyśmy zaczęli transmisję. Jak również byśmy poprosili, żeby tutaj na ekranie już powoli się też mogła pojawić prezentacja. Dziękujemy. Okay, they, they have it on, on, on the big screen here behind you. So just you know, you can look here and then. But I yeah, but just a second. Okay, so. Um, welcome again, uh, all our conference participants and also a few hundred people that are watching this conference online. So, hello world. <laughs> so we are happy to, uh, to, to welcome in Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, uh, Professor uh, Naomi Zeidman, who came specially to address the conference today from Toronto long way and thank you very much for coming it's a great privilege and honor and we are very moved by your scholarship your work uh, your heritage <laughs> thank you very much and i will ask also professor glenn diner whom i always pronounce dinner yes. because it's like coming from dinów in poland <laughs> Uh, and who uh, who will introduce um, our speaker. Thanks so much. Uh, it's such an honor to uh, be introducing Professor Naomi Seidman, the Jackman Professor, University of Toronto. Um, I first encountered Professor Seidman, I think as a, as a theorist of language, really wrote a revolutionary, groundbreaking work on the politics of Hebrew and Yiddish. I remember reading way back as a graduate student and being so inspired. And I think it's possible to say that, um, that uh, Professor Seidman's work has, has an interesting trajectory that has led us pretty much to this very spot. Um, as a Beis Yaakov student, uh, Naomi Seidman's really important work, um, Revolution Within Tradition, on the Beis Yaakov movement was um, in a sense, a homecoming, but there's even more to it because uh, Professor Seidman's father is a female, uh, famous uh, uh, Hillel Seidman, who wrote a very important um, diary memoir account of the Warsaw Ghetto. And uh, Professor Seidman tells me that it was always his dream to really create an archive uh, to Polish Jewry, which is pretty much what we have today. and. Uh, practically where we're, where we're sitting right now. So um, it's a real honor. Now, we wanted especially to have Professor Seidman kind of model for us a way of doing history that we've emphasized throughout this conference, which has been this bridging of divides um, and this Beis Yaakov movement that Professor Seidman has not only written a monograph about, but uh, organized all kinds of research through website and, and students and researchers and conferences really models for us that, that transcending the before, during, and after of the Holocaust and really the, the full trajectory of Polish Jewish life and its aftermath and other centers. So without further ado, it is my great honor to introduce Professor Naomi Seidman. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you so much to Glenn. And I just wish I could have been here for the whole conference. And I, I was getting little updates by it's WhatsApp. All, all recorded. It's all recorded. It's oh. Well, thank you for sticking around for this. And also, I just, is Ula here? Ula Made Krupitsky. So I just want to thank Ula for, she was my first uh, research assistant back when I was just starting the book. Um, about Beis Yaakov, and also Dikla Yogev, who is the project manager of the Beis Yaakov project, now that it, I'm in Canada and we have all kinds of funds. And it is really moving for me to be here in, in Warsaw, and I learned so much about my father and really about myself from um, Anya Chabovich, so I want to remember her. I, I guess she's busy, but I hope I'll get to see her. She's watching us. Oh. Well, lots of love to Anya. And she invited me to, to Poland for the first time um, and showed me around 
um, Warsaw and all the places that were part of my father's life. And she told me that the Radisson Hotel that we're all staying at was actually my father's address when he was a student at Warsaw uh, University. So I, I'm still learning so much from um, all of you. And it's, it's just such a privilege to be here at the GIC, which I know was so important to my father and many of his friends. So I'm just, I, this is just uh, another, one of the things that, that I do is try to uh, create um, an archive with, with Dikla's help and the help of many other people. And where's Tsipora? Tsipora's featured on the archive too. And uh, oh, there you are. Uh, you're all in silhouette. And one of the things that we do is, I'm sure you do it too, at the, you, you, you take one object and you just really look at it as closely as you poss possibly can. And that's what I did with this. I, I heard the title and the themes of the conference and I just tried to think about one of the documents that we have on the Besiako Project website in, through the lens of this question of continuity and rupture. So that's what I'm going to talk about today is this one object, which is um, a letter that was published in, uh, I know there's an earlier version, but I couldn't manage to get it in time for this conference. But So the one I looked at was a version published on August 9th, 1945. It's, is this better the way I just, yeah, okay. So. It's a letter that was published in an Aguda newspaper, and actually a newspaper of the Poale Agudas Yisrael in Palestine, um, which was a, tr a Hebrew translation of an original Yiddish letter that was published a little earlier in a London-based weekly of the Aguda. The first weekly is called, what's it called? Sha'arim. And the second one is Yiddish Wochenzeit. And it's by a Beis Yaakov teacher named Rivka Horowitz, who had studied at the Krakow Teacher Seminary and taught at a Beis Yaakov in Krakow, I guess I should pronounce it that way, and survived Auschwitz along with a group of mostly other Beis Yaakov teachers. And the letter, um, which you can see in, on our website, and it's also translated completely there, um, it's addressed to the Aguda office in London, and I'm just going to read m my English translation in part. Um, Dear friends, may you be well. I am writing to you from a desolate town in Germany where we all ended up having wandered by various routes from harsh labor camps. There is much that should be said about this experience, but I, I will leave that for another opportunity. You do not know me and I do not know you, but that does not prevent me from turning to you for help. There is no time now for me to tell you everything we went through and more particularly what a hell it was for an observant Jew. But I want to stress one fact. The truth of our faith stood out absolutely clearly, particularly in these experiences and tortures. Most importantly, religious people did not lose their moral compass. Tragically, only a few such people managed to survive. The greatest and best of these went the fiery way of the ovens. A few survivors dispersed to various refugee camps. Some of these survivors are in Bergen-Belsen, a group of members of the Aguda, including a few women. The most serious of these women are Beis Yaakov teachers and Benos members from Sanz, Krakow, Sanok, and elsewhere. When we were liberated from the camp and first tasted the taste of freedom, we began to search for the world we had, f we had faith that we would find after everything that had happened. We had not expected or believed that the war, war would end the way it did. Was it for this that Polish Orthodoxy had been destroyed, drowned in an ocean of blood, for things to remain exactly the same as before? I hope that's not my, is that my phone? Oh no, I'm so sorry, I thought I turned it off. I don't know how to use it. I'm gonna give it to, you. this is why I have Dikla, cause she knows how everything works. Could you find and figure out how to turn it off? Thank you. I, I don't know how it works. Okay, it's a new phone. I, this is the part that really gets me. So I just wanna repeat it one more time. 
Um, was it for this that Polish orthodoxy had been destroyed, drowned in an ocean of blood, for things to remain exactly the same as before? Were these not the footsteps of the Messiah? It's difficult, after living the way we did, to face the ordinary world of before. It is at, at this threshold that we now stand. Unfortunately, no one among those assigned to our care can help this kind of survivor. We were supervised by an English rabbi, in quotes, a secular Zionist who, who wanted to turn our group into a secular Zionist kibbutz. You can imagine how hard that was to be in Golis by Eden, in exile among Jews. You can imagine our joy when we received greetings from you and Orthodox Jewry from Dr. Kletfish, the military chaplain of the Polish army. These greetings alleviated our loneliness and desola desolation, for surely among you must be organized groups of young religious Jews in faithful observance of what we had sacrificed the marrow of our being for. This knowledge would give us support and allow us to go on, so we decided to write you this letter, for certainly you will understand how we are feeling and be moved by our double isolation, our homelessness and the absence of an appropriate atmosphere for us, an atmosphere of moral exaltation that seeks something more, for man does not live by bread alone. We need your help. First and foremost, send us newspapers and periodicals and news of our movement. We are living here as if on a desert island. We lack an environment, food, clothing. There's not a single Jewish book here. Please send us a Bible with rabbinic commentaries and a Hebrew dictionary. Also, ethics of the father with commentaries, ethical literature, Jewish history, etc. We think that in the course of time, there will be some who find value in these sacred books. As of now, there are only a few young yeshiva, yeshiva boys here who need them, and we ourselves will learn from them and then go on to teach. But as you know, we're helpless to do anything here, and we look to you for anything you can do for us. We do not participate in the life here because we want to carve out our own corner, more beautiful and substantial, and we long for the moment when we can begin our work again. Do you know anything about our friends in other camps? Please send them our regards. That will give us great joy. We will not be left with a connection only to you and with the longing and anticipation of a better and finer life. We hope for your immediate assistance in any form whatsoever, for everything has been withheld from us. We do not ask for your pity, but rather call on you to fulfill the debt of friendship. With blessings, Rifka Horowitz. I actually meant to abbreviate that, and somehow I forgot. So that's actually, I'm pretty sure, the entire letter. So sorry, I know that was a really long quote. So this letter was written a, a few short months after the April 15th, 1945 liberation of Bergen-Belsen, and it speaks directly and dramatically to the theme of this conference, continuity and rupture in Jewish experience. The writer is acutely aware that she is on the far side of a rupture of immense scope and unspeakable character, and she's aware as well of what it will take for her to begin to rebuild her life as an orthodox young woman. She describes herself, it might be worth noticing, first of all, as part of a group of young orthodox men and women. Perhaps in this moment of rupture, sexual segregation was part of what fell by the wayside. Only secondarily does she describe herself and a few others, the most serious of the group, more specifically as Beis Yaakov teachers, which is to say, not only seriously orthodox young women, but also women who constituted a recognizable feature of interwar orthodox life, the elite cadre of seminarians and young teachers who traveled Eastern Europe to found schools, attend conferences, and meet with their peers in summer camps and professionalization programs. These adolescents were connected not only through immediate contacts, but also as members of, I was going to say, what Dikla Yogev calls a network, but what Benedict Anderson called, because I was trained in a different kind of methodology, what Benedict Anderson called, in a different context, an imagined community, connected not only by the symbolic ties of Beis Yaakov affiliation, but also by the periodicals, which kept them apprised of the doings throughout the movement and the network. 
It's no accident then that Horowitz writes, send us new newspapers and periodicals so we can begin to see the contours of the world we once inhabited and hope to continue to inhabit. As when the Besiaco Journal united the movement, but in more radical fashion, these newspapers would help them locate surviving peers, not only to start to rebuild orthodox society, but also to place themselves within a world that had some meaning for them. It's also striking that Horowitz makes it clear that sacred books, forum, are a secondary priority since there are only a few yeshiva students interested in them. She goes on to say that they will eventually be needed once schools can get off the ground. And here too, the bookshelf Horowitz hopes to assemble seems to be shared by the young men along with the young women as if the sexually segregated curriculum was irrelevant in a world without form and meaning or meaning. Horowitz mentions food and appropriate clothing as well, ending by saying that she and her group need simply everything. But her most persistent requests, demands really, are for reading material. It's tempting to link this request with the discovery of the Torah scrolls among the exiles returning to Jerusalem in the biblical period, a familiar trope in a Jewish consciousness that's trying to find its feet um, through its textual tradition. And yet this world making begins with the modern genre of the periodical, appropriately for a letter that goes out to such a wide range of readers in multiple languages. Moreover, Chaim Soloveitchik reminds us in his famous essay on rupture and reconstruction, he should have been the keynote here, well, or one of the keynotes, <laughs> Next time, that Jewish textual culture in the Orthodox world today, the post-Shoah Orthodoxy, whose origins we might be tracing with Rivka Horowitz, is a displacement of what he views as the organic, mimetic modes of transmission that taught young women how to keep a kosher house, not through reading halachic guides, but through imitating their mothers. If so, the textual revolution he dates to the post-Shoah world, in fact, began earlier, if not in the D DP camps, then maybe with Sarah Schneer's textbook, Yahadus, it was called, a novelty in so many ways, right? A textbook written by a woman, what's a textbook? Whoever heard of a textbook? Called Judaism, also, what's Judaism? Um, a, no a novelty in so many ways that nevertheless aimed to convey what she called ancient ideals, not in the kitchen, but in the classroom, and not from mother to daughter, but rather from symbolic mother to symbolic daughters. The book, even when it strives to perpetuate tradition, or in the case of Bergen Belsen, build it up from scratch, may be the very sign of disruption. As a letter written to the Aguda office in London and then published in two languages in two newspapers that span the globe, Rivka Horowitz's letter performed a complicated set of ideological functions beyond its own stated purpose of securing help. Whether the Aguda could help her, and there were lots of complaints about the Aguda's really their weakness at this moment of trying to help um, religiously observant survivors in the DP camps. Um, so whether the Aguda could help her, she certainly helped them by asserting that orthodoxy had survived the horrors, even if the community was decimated, and that religious beliefs, values, and dignity had also survived, been tested, and emerged intact. As a, as a young woman, Rivka Horowitz is certainly no match for the Aguda functionary she addresses, but as a member of the Sheris Hapleta, as a Beis Yaakov teacher, as someone who feels herself to have been abandoned by the Orthodox world, she speaks not as a supplicant, but as an equal, demanding her rights through a rhetoric of friendship rather than submission. Whether or not her call was heeded, and in what ways, I'd love to know, and I'm sure there's a lot more research that can be done. I know uh, Rivka Horowitz's name has surfaced repeatedly in De Klaas network research. Um, but in whatever the case is, Rivka Horowitz 
this is easy enough to ascertain. She ended up with a quite extraordinary career in the reconstruction of Besiako in the immediate aftermath of the Holocaust. Under her leadership, Bergen-Belsen was soon to house two Besiako schools, one serving survivors from Poland and the other survivors from Hungary and Transylvania. And it became somewhat of a de facto center for the displaced population of Orthodox young women. Um, and Bergen-Belsen, I should just say, was far from an isolated case. Um, there were approximately of, let's call it, the rapid reconstruction of Beis Yaakov after the war. Um, there were approximately 150 Beis Yaakov and Benos groups in deep pea camps and other areas of survivor settlements like Cyprus, Sweden, Czestochowa, Budapest, and Paris, where my parents met. Um, and most were founded immediately after the war, but some sprang up earlier. Actually, I was going to go through a whole bunch of photos. So um, this is Beis Yaakov in Ferenwald. Ferenwald was the largest DP camp. And my mother helped run the Beis Yaakov there. She's, um, should I point her out? Is there any point to that? There she is. Um, she's kind of lit up in some, and, and my mother's turning 100 this summer. Kanaina Hara, two, two, two. It's very nerve wracking after Betty White. I feel like, be careful, Ma. Um, this is Beis Yaakov in um, uh, Bad Godstein. Um, and, you know, notice the sort of social networks. Um, there are almost no adult, I mean, there are, there are no older women in these photographs. Um, there are some married women, you can see who they are. Um, this photo, I always point out these two really beautiful women here. Um, are This is Itka As. Has anyone heard that name? She was one of the Bielski brothers. Uh, she was uh, with the Bielski group. And there were five pistols, apparently, in that group. And she got to handle one. And she, her nickname in, the, in that group of... Um, partisans was the Tzedekis, because she w kept kosher, apparently, in the woods. Um, anyway, this is, uh, this is something known as the kibbutz. It's interesting, because if you'll remember, Rivka Harwitz said they tried to make us form a kibbutz. But they did form a kibbutz. They weren't so far off. This is, um, I can't remember. I think this, no, that might be Bergen-Belsen. This is um, uh, Shanghai. This is one of the, the refugee base Yaakov in Shanghai. Um, OK. And these, at uh, Shanghai, Sapporo can tell you all about that population. That's the group, of, oh, and so can Glenn, because you did that amazing research at the JDC archives. Wow. That, would, that blew my mind, that particular talk. OK, so after leaving Bergen, back to Rivka Horowitz. Um, after leaving Bergen-Belsen, Rivka Horowitz, and by now she's married. And I love that in Beis Yaakov memoirs, even Orthodox women get to keep their maiden names for all eternity, like Sarah Schneerer. So now she's known as Horowitz Pinkosevich. She married uh, another survivor named Labes Pinkosevich. She went on to revive the Beis Yaakov in Antwerp. Um, which was a school that was founded in 1934. It was actually added on to an already existing school named Yesode HaTorah, which was founded in the 1890s. So I think that the Beis Yaakov of Antwerp, along with possibly Beis Yaakov of Vienna, is actually the longest, almost continually running Beis Yaakov in the world. Um, and yet these schools, like so many other features of post-Holocaust life, are simultaneously sites of remembrance and forgetting. Um, I talked about the two Beis Yaakovs for the Transylvanian Hungarian Beis Yaakov and the Polish Beis Yaakov. They're, in some ways, they're like the Hasidic Stiblach that reconstituted Eastern European life on the streets of Bar Park. I know Ellie Moseson was my neighbor growing up, where you have Chernobyl, the Chernobyler Stiebel, rubbing shoulders with Bubov, the Bubover Stiebel, and Stolen. Um, and these monuments to continuity can hardly avoid also being engines for the occlusion of history, geography, demographies, just as Beis Yaakov 
has managed to evade so many features of its own past through its monumentalizing projects. Horowitz was certainly not as alone as she felt in Gullus by Eden, um, a quote from a, a book by, uh, the title of a book by Nossen Birnbaum. Um, although historians agree that only a minority of or the Orthodox population that survived remained religiously observant after the Chorban. Her letter represents an extraordinarily early representation of Orthodox Holocaust discourse before any kind of Holocaust discourse, religious or secular, had begun, had begun to congeal and outside the community of interpretations of interpretation that would help consolidate such a discourse. Some of what she says and what, the, what she doesn't say still echo in Orthodox Holocaust discourse, um, which is that to tell the details of what happened is less important than to assert the more important thing, that the camps were a test that religious Jews passed with dignity and courage, even as the best of them. It was only much later with the publication of Pearl Banish's To Vanquish the Dragon that Rivka Horowitz became a character in Orthodox Holocaust history as a member of what's called the Tzenerschaft, Tzenerschaft, the minion of young women, although of course they didn't use that term, who lived through three camps together, keeping their faith and supporting each other. Um, they weren't all Orthodox, interestingly. As you can see, Michal Govrin, the writer Michal Govrin's very secular mother was among this 10. So even the way in which we describe this Yaakov, uh, this idea that there are connections between these Orthodox groups and others is very interesting and appears here too. Despite her insistence that 10 women retain something of their pre-Holocaust piety, Horowitz does not use the familiar and comforting language of continuity or reconstruction. These are the words I myself used I think unconsciously before I started thinking about the theme of this conference, um, and they're staples of the, historiograph the historiography of this period in which the decimation of Orthodox Jewry is noted alongside the evident fact that it was reconstructed and is presently flourishing. The term Besyakov teacher, so prominent, it appears in the newspaper article's title, and so prominent in my own retelling of the story on my website and my thinking about it myself, doesn't or barely registers in Rivka Horowitz's own words. Nowhere does she, she say that what she wants to do is build another Besyakov school of the long lines of the one she ran in Krakow or elsewhere. The most striking aspect of her letter to my ears is the deep dismay that she expresses that the world is apparently continuing as if as before, as if nothing world altering had happened. She's shocked that the Messiah didn't arrive with the war's end, but she intends to continue to live with that ex expectation. Rivka Horowitz's story invites us to move beyond the temporal structure of continuity and rupture, at the very least, because every fiber of her being she perceives as a continuity too easily achieved, too settled, too built on entropy and acceptance. It might be wrong to associate orthodoxy more generally with continuity or with the project of reconstruction after historical rupture. After all, Beis Yaakov itself was also part of a rupture, emerging as the most novel feature of the new forms of political and cultural organization of interwar orthodoxy. Whatever continuity might be traced in the history of Beis Yaakov as a movement that managed to rebuild so quickly after the almost complete destruction of its homeland and base, itself derived from this continuity. Beis Yaakov teachers found each other in DP camps and across the network of refugee centers in part because they had already experienced a kind of displacement in a movement that removed young women from their homes. She also never mentions her parents. This orphan generation had already constructed symbolic families in the failure of traditional kinship networks to appeal to young women. 
And these networks of young women were already versed in the art of constructed family. Horowitz scorned the rabbi who tried to organize them into a secular kibbutz, but they were a kibbutz, and they called themselves that in some DP camps. The most daring projects of these young women, I would say the most daring project is the mission of rescuing, I don't know if people know about this, of quote unquote rescuing Jewish children in hiding with non-Jewish families or from monasteries, sometimes kidnapping them in the middle of the night, were both responses to the extraordinary circumstances in which they found themselves and responses to the mission they had been training for for years. What counts as continuity and what counts as rupture can hardly be distinguished in these circumstances. But Beis Yaakov is hardly unique in this regard, thoroughly immersed as it was in interwar Polish Jewish youth culture. And I mean, I, I specifically didn't caption these photos because cause I think it's not, well, I guess you could see that if there's boys in it, then it's probably not Beis Yaakov. But otherwise, some of these are from secular youth movements and some are from Beis Yaakov. And, um, one of the women in, in that photo of, of women threshing in a field, and they're not threshing because they're trying to get themselves dinner. This is, you know, urban girls doing this as a kind of exercise in like the farm we have in Berkeley. We, we have a Jewish farm in Berkeley. Um, one of those women is, is uh, Sarah Cutler, the daughter of Ravaran Cutler, the founder of um, the Lakewood Yeshiva. That's just a parenthesis for those of you who are in this talk because you're interested in, in gossip. Um, so orthodox young women were not exempt from the broader conditions that encouraged a focus on youth. Orthodox Jews too were delaying marriage and they too were subject to economic and political pressures during this period. It was an almost unspoken, unspoken assumption that youth or adolescence has no place in traditional Jewish life which more evidently privileges and grants authority to age, Jewish life, more generally, has sometimes been described as inhospitable to youth, as if the difficulties of life in Poland and an orientation to its own history had combined to deny young Jews the very capacity for youth. Um, as I think that illustration on the cover of one of the youth autobiographies shows, um, Youth was understood as native to more carefree cultures. Jews couldn't afford the luxury of youth. Um, something my father used to say about the memories of the Warsaw Ghetto is that he would say, um, No Jewish children in the ghetto just small Jews, Jews of smaller and larger sizes. But the conditions of modern political culture conspired to market youth to the young, to create a youth culture that could be shaped in the ideological forms taken by Polish Jewish life. Within this context, youth was praised even within Orthodox circles. Sarah Schneerer, the founder of Beis Yaakov, in one speech to the, the Benos youth movement exhorted the girls, Youth means happiness, courage, optimism, and faith in ancient ideals. Pessimism, doubt, sadness is anti-youth. Youth means enthusiasm, living and striving. Our youth movement must have life. As Sarah Schneerer saw it, youth and faith in ancient ideals could and must coexist. And in this brave new world, the old contradictions contradictions between Jewishness and youth could be laid to rest. But this was only the flip side of the recognition, even in Orthodox circles, that adolescents and Jewish adolescents in particular were fundamentally new and somewhat foreign phenomena. And I think Ulla writes about this. Max Weinreich working on Der Weg zu unserer Jugend during the same years Sarah Schneer was praising teenage girls kicks off his, story, his study of Jewish adolescence by suggesting that although a generation gap has always everywhere separated young people from their elders, nowhere is this abyss more pronounced than among 
the Jews of his period, who experienced modernization at a far more rapid pace than other societies. The result is an unusually deep chasm between the generations. Why teach young people to save when inflation robs savings of their work? And this is actually on the first page of Der Weg zu unser Jugend, the following quotation. Wherever you look, Weinreich writes, there are conflicts. If the parents are conservative and anxious doubts, if the parents want to act in the spirit of the times, the old objective rules no longer hold. Once people knew that masturbation is a shameful act and parents strove to root out the sin in, in their children, whether it worked or not is a different question. But now children know that all children, I'm sorry, now parents know, that's interesting, that all children, whenever you talk about sex, the Freudian slips just. <laughs> But now parents know that all children suffer from this disease and the best approach is to look the other way. But if parents are confused, young people are equally in the dark, torn between crushing self-doubt about their own futures in Poland and grandiosity, a feeling instilled in them by the worldwide fascination with and romanticization of adolescence that was characteristic of this period. The generational split that separated the generations and which cast the very transmission of Jewish culture in, in doubt was thus reproduced internally and existentially for each adolescent in the disconnection between where she came from, who she was, and what future she might imagine. But let's go back to Rivka Horowitz's letter, a young woman who had been so decisively shaped in Orthodox youth culture. On the one hand, she hardly seems like the stereotypical adolescent rebel, having apparently fully and completely assimilated the religious values she was taught early in her life, keeping her faith not only in the face of Nazi persecution, but also in the absence of guiding figures, movement functionaries, and even parents. But this absence, read alternatively, this independence and self-assuredness, might also be part of the Beis Yaakov youth culture from which she emerged. One of the autobiographies submitted to Weinreich's uh, contest that he used to do research on his book um, is by a woman named Esther, a pseudonym, in which she describes Benos, the youth movement associated with Beis Yaakov, as ostensibly democratic and youth-oriented, in which all viewpoints were, could be heard and adults were expected not to speak at meetings. But as Esther says, such freedom was implicitly limited. You could only go so far. An implicit limitation she compares to the also ostensibly free Talmudic disputation. What Beis Yaakov and Benos strived for in a movement that relied on the labor and initiative of young women was for these adolescents to internalize the dictates of the Aguda establishment, even when its authority figures were absent. Were absent. And if I didn't know that Rivka Horowitz was a, a historical figure, I might suspect the Aguda establishment of actually coming up with such a demonstration of the power of their teaching. What could be seen as the abnormal features of camp life in which these young people, orphaned and displaced, were thrown on their own devices, could draw in certain cases on these prior conditions. And one thing signaled by the title of the article, chosen no doubt by the Agudas newspaper editors for Horowitz's letter, is that they were able to recognize the Beis Yaakov girl when they saw or read one. My point is not only that continuity and rupture coexist in a more complicated dialectic than is sometimes acknowledged. Co uh, continuity and rupture are not only raw features of history in its unfolding or of a human life in its temporal dimensions, they're also second order conceptions, rhetorical and narrative strategies in the stories people tell about their own lives and the stories told by historians, perhaps Jewish historians in particular. What is Jewish history if not this very yoking of disparate times and places 
individuals and events under a Jewish banner. What counts as continuity and what counts as rupture doesn't inhere in events themselves. It's produced by the retelling. Even the greatest apparent rupture we know might be understood in this light. I think we all know that the Holocaust in some Haredi interpretations is a continuation of the eternal hatred um, of Esau, of Isaac by Esau, another chapter in a long history of Jewish suffering, a turn in the screw of divine punishment. For these hires, the traditional Cal I'm sorry, for these horrors, the traditional calendar has preordained a time of mourning. But Horowitz's letter reminds us that these Haredi readings were not born of whole cloth, nor is this discourse ideologically monolithic. Haredim, viewed so often as those who attempted to rebuild the world that had been destroyed, might also take a different, equally religious tack Every fiber of Rivka Horowitz's being rebels against the view that life must continue, a view kept open and alive by a messianism that is both traditional and not, in what can only be called its profoundly countercultural dimension. After what happened, and she prefers to postpone the telling of what happened, the attempt to go on living ordinary lives and maybe even ordinary religious lives is an obscenity. What Rivka Horowitz hopes for is not to rebuild Eastern Orthodoxy in B'nai Barak or Borough Park, but rather to establish something new and entirely different. What I'm tempted to call, if it doesn't sound so Christian, the kingdom of heaven, in which the unjustly murdered would arise from their graves in the air, in which she would rub history against the grain, in August of 1945, that messianic hope was also able to take practical forms. She imagined assembling a Jewish library that would appeal first to a few yeshiva boys and later become the colonel of a school. But her messianic further, fervor was hardly exhausted by these steps. Continuity and discontinuity and rupture may be the two indispensable tools in the historiographical toolkit, working dialectically to demonstrate continuities that undergird even the widest historical ruptures and contrary wise, demonstrating that what seems like a rupture might conceal a hidden continuity. And I think Jacob Katz is the genius of both those particular moves. But surely it isn't only historians that lean on that particular game. Even an individual name is a string to keep the beads of a life from being scattered in the wind. Bergen Belsen is itself such a fiction, a location that is double the concentration camp and the DP camp, and they're at some distance from each other on the map. And the DPs themselves insisted that the name be retained. The past keeps changing, even if we imagine that names, Poland, Ukraine, Rivka Horowitz, the Jews, the Holocaust, can stabilize, can stabilize it enough for us to catch a good look at what it has to offer, what we ourselves are or imagine ourselves to be. Rivka Horowitz, as a signature, and in the title of Beis Yaakov teacher she was given, is a function of the entropy that is language and representation. And maybe it is just this entropy that we're talking about the same person, the same place, the same events, the entropy that is history in at least one of its modes, whether it's playing the game of continuity and rupture, a rupture in continuity that Rivka Horowitz was so repelled by, the entropy that dictates that life goes on as it was before. In this sense, I'd like to suggest that Horowitz had something in common with Walter Benjamin, who was the major figure of the conference I was just at, um, which was about Jonathan Boyarin's storm from paradise. So I had Walter Benjamin's, you know, basically stuffed into my head for two days before coming here. Um, so maybe she was something like Walter Benjamin, who similarly rejected histories that could not awaken the dead, that accepted the logic of what he called empty homogeneous time. Horowitz, like Benjamin, 
like Paul Clay's Angelus Novus that he describes, was caught in the storm called progress, wings frozen in the, by the storm, with the wreckage piling up before her. As Benjamin writes in his theses on the philosophy of history, we know that the Jews were prohibited from investigating the future. The Torah and the prayers instruct them in remembrance. This does not imply, however, that for the Jews, the future was homogeneous, empty time. For every second of time was the straight gate through which the Messiah might enter. The gates of the concentration camp that summer of 1945 were finally open. But for Horowitz or anyone else, the Messiah did not enter. But she knew he might. She knew he might. Thank you.